Welcome to the additional public hearing for the inquiry into budget estimates 2021 for the Families and Communities and Disabilities Services Cluster. Before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people who are the traditional custodians of this land and pay our collective respects to those elders past, present and emerging and extend those respects to those First Nations peoples present. Um, I also welcome Minister Natasha McLaren-Jones and accompanying officials to this hearing. Today, the committee will examine the proposed expenditure for the portfolios of families and communities and disability services. Mm. I'd like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. Today's proceedings have been broadcast live from Parliament's website and a transcript will be placed on the committee's website as soon as it is available. In accordance with broadcasting guidelines, I remind media representatives to take responsibility for what they publish about today's proceedings. All witnesses in budget estimates have a right to procedural fairness according to the resolution of the House adopted in 2018. There may be some questions that a witness can only answer if they have more time or with certain documents to hand, in which case you are entitled to take a question on notice and provide that written answer within 21 days. If witnesses wish to hand up documents, please do so through the committee staff. Minister, I remind you and the officers accompanying you that you're free to pass notes between you and you, you are entitled to refer directly to your advisers seated at the table behind you if needed. Finally, could I ask everybody to put their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the hearing? <coughs> Uh, um, all witnesses will be sworn prior to giving evidence. Minister McLaren-Jones, I remind you, you do not need to be sworn as you already have taken an oath in your office as a Member of Parliament. And I note that the following witnesses have been sworn in an earlier iteration of this hearing. Ms Check, Mr Vivas, Ms Campbell, Mr O'Reilly and Mr Thomas. Um, which leaves you, Mr Tipple. So if you could please state your full name, your position, title and your agency, and then take either the oath or the affirmation, which is in front of Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Tidball. I'm the Secretary of the Department of Communities and Justice. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thanks, Mr Tidball. And maybe if I could remind everybody when they're speaking to bring the microphone closer um, and, um, and speak directly into this microphone. Today's hearing will be conducted from 9.30 to 12.45pm with a 15 minute break at 11am. We're joined by the Minister in the morning and in the afternoon we'll hear from departmental witnesses and that hearing will proceed from 2pm to 5.15pm, again with a 15 minute break at 3.30pm. During these sessions there'll be questions from the opposition and crossbench members and if required an additional 15 minutes is allocated at the end of each session for government questionings. Um, Thank you all for your attendance today. I'm grateful we all made it, um, uh, given the weather. Um, and given there's no space for an opening statement, I'll hand over to my colleagues in the opposition to commence questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Welcome, Minister. Congratulations on your appointment. Thank you very much. Um, on the last occasion, there was some discussion about the number of children seen each year by the department, and it turned out that of the 114,000 um, children who had been notified as it being at risk of serious harm reports, 72% of those were not seen by anyone in the department. That's about 90,000 children. And there were some questions put on notice, but the previous minister said, and this is very important, this is page 24 of the transcript, that the, the, the term not seen is misleading because they're seen by somebody. If it's not DCJ, they're seen by non-government organisations. Now, on notice, um, that was very carefully worded by the department that only some of the 90,000 children not seen by your department were in fact seen by anyone. How many children are not seen by any agency, public or private? Uh, thank you for your question. As it uh, relates to uh, correspondence and uh, information provided by the uh, department and also under the previous minister, I actually asked the department to clarify uh, the statement they provided. Sure. I'm happy, Minister, to answer that question. Um, the number of children at risk of significant harm has continued to increase over the last few years. and. Most recently, at 30th of June 2021, that number was up to 126,000. Of that 126,000, we've responded to 36,500 children. So a caseworker 
completing a safety and risk assessment in respect of those children. A further 16,000 children have been in receipt of what we call a family preservation program. That's one of the funded programs that the, the department funds and delivers, or delivers, uh, sorry, NGOs deliver on the department's behalf. So 16,000 there. What we are unable to quantify, and it's, it's somewhat challenging, although we are working on a number, <coughs> is actually families that might be in receipt of support services, for example, from a family support service from another government department, including Department of Health or Health New South Wales, Department of Education, but unfortunately we can't currently quantify that number, but we do know that some children of that remainder are actually seen and supported by, like I said, both other government agencies and other support services in the community. And indeed family, um, in, a, in a lot of cases, um, wraparound supports around a child. OK, just so I'm understanding. So we know that there are these children who are notified of being at risk of serious harm. You know how many the department sees each year. You've quantified both in the previous hearing and on notice. And for your interest, it's pages 22 and 23 of the answers given on notice. So you know that 90,000 children are not seen by your department. The previous minister said categorically, again, page 24 of the transcript, that all of those were seen by someone. But on notice, it says some are seen by other agencies. Now, do the NGOs just simply not report back to you as to who they see? No, well, NGOs, as mandatory reporters, will make a report to the Child Protection Helpline if they are concerned about a child um, that they're, they're supporting in the community. And, in fact, non-government organisations, they're our second highest uh, reported into the Child Protection Health Helpline after uh, education... Um, Reports, so they are they are they are reporting. What we encourage is that support services continue where a service might be involved, particularly a non-government service might be involved with a family. Just because they report to the Child Protection Helpline should not mean they cease providing support on an ongoing basis to those children. No, but I'm just struggling. You know who these children are. They've been notified as being at risk. You know your agency minister hasn't seen them. Presumably, your agency farms those names out to NGOs to look after. Does no one in your department do a reconciliation to try and see who is simply not seen? I mean, it seems quite extraordinary. You know that 72% of people aren't seen by your department. Uh, you know that some may be seen by someone else. That's 90,000 kids. <coughs> That's really just not good enough. So what are you doing to try and work out how many are seen during the course of year and how many are just falling through the cracks. Do you want to comment further? So we have a range of initiatives and pieces of work underway to increase the number of children that are seen at risk of significant harm. Last year, we conducted what we, we called a caseworker study, and that was a time in motion study where 700 caseworkers completed um, their daily timesheet, if you like, um, very activity, uh, line by line driven to understand where their time goes. And what that's enabled us to do is identify a number of areas where we can seek some, consist um, some efficiencies and increase productivity over time. So that work is in train. I'll also just, just back to the question, uh, refer, and we have mentioned it in previous committees, the collaborative support pathways program that operates in southwestern Sydney district. And that does give us the ability to quantify <coughs> the number of children that are seen not only by the funded non-government sector but by other support services in that district. We are in the process of expanding that project into central Sydney and looking for other opportunities, particularly in western New South <coughs> Wales, which is a collaborative approach to making sure children have supports, but we can also uh, monitor the number of supports and who's providing that support. But as I said earlier, it is certainly a work in progress. OK, well, Minister, my, my very clear question to you is what steps are you and your agency going to take to at least identify how many of those 90,000 children are simply not being seen by anyone? These are some of the most vulnerable people in our society and it seems not nearly good enough that your department 
and the government is simply apparently wiping its hands of any responsibility here. Um, thank you very much for your, for your question, Mr Searle. First and foremost, um, I want to ensure that every child has a safe and stable home. Um, the priority is uh, to keep the child in their home wherever possible, where it's safe to do so. Uh, I also have concerns where you raised that uh, ensuring that every child uh, is seen. Um, I actually met last week, or yesterday, I went and saw a number of caseworkers uh, in uh, Redfern just to see how they're going, particularly in the last two, two years with uh, COVID. Um, and I do want to acknowledge and thank uh, all the DCJ caseworkers across New South Wales for the tremendous job they do. Um, but I've actually asked the department to, to look at this and have this particular area as an area of focus and report back to me uh, in where things can improve and what more can be done. Well, very clearly, I'm asking you on notice of the 90,000 children not seen by the department, please tell the committee on notice at some point how many were seen by somebody and how many just missed out. I'm happy to take that on notice unless uh, Ms Dittable had anything further to say. Uh, thank you. It's probably um, appropriate for me, as I'm new to my position, to receive that, that question and um, acknowledge that... Uh, notwithstanding the challenges of uh, increased numbers of uh, reports which we are receiving uh, and the increased number of children being seen by caseworkers, that there is uh, an ongoing challenge in ensuring that we uh, see as many children, that as many children as possible receive that casework attention, but in doing so that there is rigorous work done around uh, risk assessment and uh, case planning, uh, I accept that um, this is uh, an enormous challenge. I accept that uh, the importance of data as to way, the way we are responding and uh, I'm looking forward to working with the senior team to uh, ensure that our work uh, continues to improve in this area. Well, well sorry, Minister and, and Secretary. The most obvious question that you would get asked today was what about the 250 children every day who are reported as at potentially risk of serious harm, but which nothing is done? And the answer is simply, we'll get an answer on notice, I don't think is adequate. I expect the opposition would... would I, I believe the opposition are entitled to an answer to this before the end of the day. 250 kids a day reported at risk of serious harm and you can't say a single thing about what happens to them, apart from a pilot project. I would hope that we get a proper answer before this hearing concludes today. I'll hand back to the opposition. Moving on to a slightly different topic, uh, alternative care arrangements. During the last set of hearings, we learnt of one child who'd been in alternative care arrangements for more than 300 days, and there was also a child who'd been in a hotel for 833 days. <coughs> At what point, you know, in your sort of department's reckoning, does this accommodation cease to be short-term emergency arrangements and when do they sort of become indefinite? What is your time frame? Uh, first of all, can I say that the alternative care arrangement is actually the last resort uh, and is not ideal for uh, uh, any child in out-of-home care. Uh, the number of children in out-of-home care has actually uh, dropped by 31%. Uh, it's down from 102 uh, as of the 31st of September 2021, uh, recorded at 70 uh, in, as of 31st of December <coughs> 2021. Uh, there's also, um, as you said, there's the short-term uh, emergency placement models. But what I will say, um, particularly in relation to uh, identifying uh, placements for, for children, but is the amount of uh, support that is provided to these uh, children whilst in uh, this care, which is uh, quite therapeutic. Um, their cases are quite complex, um, but everything is, is done to ensure that uh, these children are placed in permanent, stable accommodation. Right, OK. Well, last year uh, we heard about a short-term emergency placement model. Uh, how is that diff has that been implemented in your agency? My understanding is yes, and I'll ask uh, uh, Ms Campbell to comment further. Uh, and when she does, um, perhaps you could tell us how that's different to what, replace what came before. OK. Um, so STEP, which is the short-term emergency placement model, is an emergency placement model designed to meet the high and complex needs of children and young people in out-of-home care 
who are currently placed in or at risk of imminent entry into an alternative care agreement or an individual arrangement. Um, so it's obviously designed for children and young people who cannot be placed in a residential type accommodation due to their high and complex needs. We went out for <coughs> procurement last year and we finalised the new providers in December. To date, seven children have moved into those models, so we've got up to 50 placements across the state. Um, it, what's different, I guess, about this is it isn't, it isn't a hotel type arrangement. It's, it's actually, a, yeah, that's right, it's head leasing in the community, um, appropriate residential accommodation for children and young people. So we've got, I think it's about nine or ten providers who have been engaged to, to do that. In terms of being able to step it up, there have been some issues because of COVID and staff being furloughed and recruitment, but that's now back on track. So we're hoping that shortly we'll have, um, it's actually 15 providers um, in place pretty soon. Okay. And is that the key difference? It's not in a hotel, it's in proper accommodation? Accommodation. It also has, you know, therapeutic sorts of interventions for children and young people so that they can be stabilised and we can then look at permanency options, whether that's restoration, which is obviously preferred, back home, or um, in the event that they require guardianship, um, we would go down that path to ensure kids have a stable life. Okay. And this is, are you transitioning to this new model? Um, at the moment then, how many children are currently in alternative care arrangements? That is the pre-existing situation. Uh, as a minister said, 70. 70. 70. And okay. if I may add, Chair, um, Please. in response to Mr Sell's question, um, the distinguish, distinguishing feature is also that the care is provided by um, accredited providers, um, which is a, a key difference. Okay. All righty. Um, uh, Minister, you're aware that there's, um, there's been a review of the taxi industry licensing uh, scheme and uh, uh, one of the proposals is that at the moment wheelchair access taxi, taxi licences are given for free whereas conventional taxis have to pay for their licences and under a possible new scheme all licences will be free and the review found that the government would have to create additional incentives for wheelchair uh, accessible taxis if they want them to be available. I think the report actually said, and I quote, the recommendation to remove supply caps on taxi licences will have the effect of undermining the value of the current incentive of uh, wheelchair accessible taxi licences being free of charge. So what steps will you take to make sure that wheelchair accessible taxis are still available to persons with disabilities? Um, my priority is ensuring that every person with a disability in New South Wales uh, has uh, access to the services and the resources that they need. Uh, in relation to the taxi industry and, and other forms of transport, their uh, questions should be directed specifically to our ministers responsible. Sure, but your own report has said there's a real risk that these services won't be provided under the new possible new licensing regime, what concrete policies will you as Minister put forward or will the government do to make sure that uh, people with disabilities who need wheelchair uh, accessible taxis can get them? I work with uh, all uh, departments across the, the, the government um, to ensure that we're implementing the Disability, Disability Inclusion Action Plan. Uh, as I said, anything specifically relating to a particular department is a responsibility of that Minister. Okay. Well. Can you give us an idea of the sort of things that the government is going to do to make sure that people with disabilities can still get taxis? I'm as just I, not hearing an answer here, Minister. As I said, I uh, work with uh, other uh, representatives from other departments. Uh, there is a, uh, a council meeting that's, that's held on a regular basis to look at uh, implementation of the action plan, but if it's relating to a particular department, it is a responsibility of another minister. Okay. Well, have you had discussions or meetings with the Minister for Transport, Mr Elliott, about this issue? I have had uh, raised uh, briefly with the, the Minister for Transport about uh, the need to ensure that uh, all transport uh, is uh, accessible for people with disability, but nothing formally has been written. Okay. Can you give us uh, an estimated time frame within which you might hope to resolve this outstanding issue? Uh, as I said, it's uh, all... All implementation of the uh, Disability Action Plan is a whole-of-government approach. So there is a number of items that are placed on the agenda. I couldn't give you a specific time frame, uh, but more than happy to come back with more details. 
Okay. Another aspect of the uh, government's reform proposals is to remove operating boundaries for regional taxis so they can operate anywhere. So, for example, a taxi in Coffs Harbour could just simply decamp to Tamworth during the country music festival where they might get some more fares. Um, what will you do to ensure that wheelchair accessible taxis will remain available in regional towns so that you don't have this great sort of loss of service? As I've said before, uh, I have regular contact with um, all departments uh, to ensure that there is a uh, we're implementing the Disability Action Plan to ensure that all people with disability in New South Wales not only have access to trans, but also the services and resources they need. All right. Well, we don't seem to be getting very far on that issue. We'll switch to another one. Um, the out-of-home care insurance market failure. Um, can you tell us about the government's short-term indemnity scheme for out-of-home care providers? Uh, how long will the government be providing that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Searle. I'm aware that uh, that uh, many of the out-of-home care and youth homelessness service providers are no longer able to obtain insurance cover for physical and sexual abuse claims. Uh, the government has taken action on this critical issue to support the viability of out-of-home care and youth homelessness providers across New South Wales. Uh, to address the immediate risk uh, to essential service delivery for vulnerable children and young people, uh, the government established the NGO short-term indemnity scheme to provide cover to out-of-home care and youth homelessness providers who are unable to obtain the physical and sexual abuse came insurance cover uh, in the commercial market. Now, I understand that this is a temporary measure uh, and it is also a, an issue that is affecting all jurisdictions. Um, so New South Wales is leading, along with uh, uh, Tasmania, mm. uh, which is an inter additional uh, committee to look at uh, the long-term uh, solution and understand, uh, or, or I'm advised, um, that uh, a solution will be available by the end of this year. Okay. Uh, why has the government, uh, in, in the government provided you know, emergency scheme, why is cover provided only for events post 30 June 2017? Why what was that date picked up? Is there a certain modelling you've got? Does it has been chosen to minimise government liability? As uh, the decision was made before I became Minister, I actually might ask the Department if you're happy to elaborate in more detail. OK, yeah. thanks, Minister. So I think you're talking about the 30th of June 2017 date, which is retroactive, a retroactive date, which enables the indemnity to be provided via current contractual arrangements that we have with the Permanency Support Program in place between DCJ and providers and minimises sort of administrative complexity of the scheme. The issue of potential exposure which has been raised by the sector to uninsured historical abuse claims is obviously of great concern to service providers, particularly those with a long history. Um, so currently as part of the work being done for uh, that uh, Tasmania and New South Wales are leading, we are considering um, those issues being considered as part of the work going forward, as the Minister indicated, that we're hopeful to have resolved by the end of this year. Why that date, though? Why 30 June 2017? When the contract started. OK. <coughs> uh, Ms Campbell, you'd be aware of the average time, the average delay between when abuse happened in care and when a claim is made. Are you aware of that? Yes, I am. Do you want to tell me what the time is? I think it's 20 years sometimes. It could be longer. Well, um, because of reforms we've made, it's now 12 and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, Minister, the average delay between abuse occurring and claims being made is 12 and a half years. Your, indemnity, your, your government's indemnity cover goes back five years. How do you square those two facts? As I said, this is a, an issue that is affecting all jurisdictions. So there is a, a working uh, committee to examine the long-term solution. So what has been provided is, is short-term, um, but we're looking to uh, address the issue by the end of the year. Minister, what has been provided is no solution at all. If you're providing insurance cover that goes back for claims to five years and you know that the medium time for delay for claims is 12 and a half years, you haven't provided a solution, have you? Well, as I said, and it's been explained that that date was selected, uh, it is a short-term measure, as I, as I said to you, um, and we're looking at the long-term solution, and uh, Minister, which will be decided by the end of the year. Minister, it's not a solution. You've got NGOs out there who have the care of children, who have zero insurance protection for the most likely claims that are going to come in against them um, for abuse of children in care. You, you know that, don't you? 
I've asked the department to give me regular updates in relation to this. There is a working uh, group to find a long-term solution uh, to, this, uh, to this matter. Uh, and furthermore, I've also asked the department uh, to prioritise uh, any uh, businesses uh, that uh, may be affected to work with the, those providers. You, you, you know what today's date is? It, it's the 2nd of March. We're, we're just barely two months into the year. And all you can say is you hope to have a solution in 10 months' time. That, that's your answer to the committee, isn't it? You hope to have something in 10 months' time. Is, is that seriously what you're saying to all of the NGOs out there caring for tens of thousands of kids who have no insurance cover? We may have something in 10 months' time. Is that your answer? No, my answer is that we will. there's a working group that's working to finalise this uh, by the end of the year. Um, Secretary, what are you going to do when the first NGO comes to you and says, we've now had three claims, we haven't got insurance cover, we've looked at the numbers, we're likely to be insolvent. Well, what's your response going to be to that NGO in the next 10 months? Mr Shoebridge, I will acknowledge that those NGOs struggle for viability, that their funding bases are tight and they act in the interests <coughs> of children. I will be engaging with those NGOs uh, and seeking to strike a solution which looks to the cover, deals with the, um, the, the timing issue that you have identified and advising the committee uh, of the outcome. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that answer. What are you going to do when the first NGO comes to you in the next 10 months and says we've been hit with three, four of these claims, our insurers tell us it could be eight to $10 million, and we're likely to go insolvent. We can no longer care for the kids in, in our, that, that you asked us to care for. What are you going to say to that NGO? And what are you going to say to the kids? We are and will work with the NGOs to, to strike the best solution that we can in terms of cover to give them the certainty that, that they are seeking. That, that's plainly wrong. All you've offered them so far is partial cover going back five years and if, you'd, if your department had been properly advising you, you would have known that the median delay is 12 and a half years and the insurance cover you've offered is not going to protect them for the most likely claims that will keep coming this year. Do, do you understand the problem about what the limits and the, the appalling limits on the indemnity you've offered? Mr Shoebridge. Mr Tibble, do no, you understand I, the problem? Mr Shoebridge, I accept, I accept that that is uh, a challenge for us, yes. What about the kids who potentially have all of their arrangements being upended because the NGO that's dealing with their out-of-home care has gone insolvent? Is it a problem for them too? Of course it is, and uh, if that uh, arises, and that is why we need to work in lockstep with, with the sector which we will be seeking to do. But the sector put you on notice about this, put the department on notice about this in correspondence in June of last year. This isn't the first time it's been raised with you. We're now on the 2nd of March, and all you've done to date is produce a woefully inadequate Band-Aid, at best. You, you know you've been on notice since June of last year? <coughs> I am well aware that this is a matter of... Uh, concern to the sector uh, and to organisations such as uh, Aqua, and that working through uh, the best scheme that we can um, develop is going to be crucial. Well, after you put up the what's it called NGO short term indemnity scheme, the non indemnity scheme, Aqua wrote to you again on the 16th of December last year, you and the Treasurer, and said it doesn't work, it's not protecting our members. Have you, has the government responded in writing to the peak body's concerns since they raised this in December of last year? Uh, these are, I was, uh, uh, that correspondence was sent uh, prior to me becoming a minister, so we'd need to take it on notice. If Ms Campbell, I, I assume you've been dealing with this in some detail. You seem to be the person who, who, who has some detail about this. Is that right? Yes. You're aware of the correspondence that Aqua sent in December. Yes. Have you responded 
Uh, we have been talking with ACWA in terms of this issue and we've certainly fed it into the work that we're doing with other Commonwealth um, and state agencies. But I should just note that not all agencies need the cover. Only some have signed up to the scheme and some, even if they no longer currently have cover, are, are historically covered for the period pre-2017. I just thought that was important. To date, we've had 31 NGOs that have applied to the scheme. Um, seven have signed the indemnity clause and seven are awaiting um, provider signatories and the remaining are currently being processed. And certainly no NGO has flagged with me a concern in terms of the historical abuse at this point. But certainly, as the Minister and the Secretary have said, we don't want um, a provider to become insolvent. They're looking after children in out-of-home care and we would do whatever we need to do to prevent that occurrence happening. Well, you know that a some of the biggest providers of out-of-home care have what are called claims-made policies. Mm -hmm. You're aware of they? Yes. And, and, and those providers um, have zero historical cover, don't they? Unless the indemnity is extended. I'd probably need to take that on notice. Well, I mean, this is a pretty fundamental thing, Ms Campbell. If you're responsible for dealing with this issue and you don't know the difference between a claims-made policy and, a, and an annual policy that covers um, the, the events in a year then we've got a problem. You, you know that a series of very large providers have claims made policies, don't you? Um, I would need to take that on notice. Mr Tipple, do you understand the difference? I, I do understand the difference, yep. Chair. Um, have you been briefed and you're aware that a whole series of the providers have claims made policies? I um, have been briefed on this issue. I've been in the Chair for a month. I totally own the fact that the, the buck stops with me in terms of uh, dealing with this issue. What I will do is um, meet with the sector as the first step <coughs> to hear more about um, the issues that you have raised. Ms Campbell, how is it that of the 31 NGOs that have reached out for cover, even for the partial cover that's been offered, only seven of them have actually had it finalised? When did this start? Uh, it started in December, and this is as of the 21st of February, and so it's a relatively short time frame, but I'm happy to take on notice um, and get a further update. Are you telling me that two or more months is a reasonable time frame to have the sector heading on without any insurance cover for historical sexual and physical child abuse claims? Are you saying two months is fine, it's perfectly acceptable? No, I'm saying that the um, NGOs who have reached out to apply for this scheme, and there's 31 of them as of the 21st of February, um, and we're still awaiting some of the signatories on those. No, you told me seven have signed. Yep. You told me another seven are in the process, are being processed. Or you, and, and another. you told me 17 are still being assessed. Correct. That sounds like the delays at your end. I'd if it's assessed, to take Ms. Take on notice and check, Mr. Shoebridge. What did you mean by assessed? It uh, means they're going through the assessment process to see if they're eligible. So that delays at your end, Mr. Tipple. Are you satisfied with this? The sector puts you on notice they had no, no insurance cover in June. We're now on the second of March the following year, and you've so far managed to protect seven of the NGOs. Are you satisfied with that that performance to date? I acknowledge that there is a priority to ensuring that, to ensuring that um, there is the appropriate insurance in place and I will certainly uh, meet with the sector and uh, seek to ensure that the number in process, that, that uh, we work through that, but that a um, long-term solution to this is resolved. Um, in consultation with the sector and reported back to this committee. How many NGOs have advised you that they don't have adequate insurance protection because they can't obtain it in the private market? In the time I've been in this role, none have advised me of that. Um, and I should just say, in terms of the process, the, the insurance of some of those that have put in applications, their insurance ends at different timeframes, um, and they also have to provide all their current claims, not just a specific claim, so that there's evidence, so, so that there's evidence um, and it's then assessed. Are, are, you, are you seriously telling me that not a single NGO has advised you 
that they haven't got adequate insurance cover and they don't have insurance cover for historic claims. Is, no. that, is that your evidence, Ms Campbell? I haven't received any uh, letter or phone call or correspondence directly to me in relation to a specific NGO not feeling that they're adequately um, able to meet the costs. Um, Mr Tib Tibble, given the correspondence that's come from the peaks, um, co-signed by, I can't tell you how many, different NGOs, um, are you satisfied mm -hmm. with where the department is at the moment, saying they're not aware of a single NGO that doesn't have insurance cover? I mean, can, can you... I, I personally can't believe that evidence. I don't know what, how you respond as Secretary. I respond as uh, Secretary saying I am clearly owning that there is a high degree of concern uh, and anxiety in the sector and that we need to engage with this, uh, which the department has been doing. I accept that the sector uh, is not satisfied with the response and I will seek to um, progress the matter. All right. You see, Ms Campbell, I have correspondence that's co-signed by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Um, over 40 NGOs um, saying that they, in June of last year, that they're not going to get insurance cover. It's notorious and publicly reported that the insurance sector has pulled away all cover, um, apart from the Catholic insurance from the sector, and you're telling me today that you don't have a sufficiently mature relationship with any NGO that they've told you about their absence of insurance cover, and you're the person responsible for it. Uh, how, how do you square that, Ms Campbell? That's not Mr. her evidence, David. Mr Shoebridge, so uh, just to clarify, um, uh, what Ms Campbell was saying is that no in a specific in NGO has come forward. Uh, obviously, you have correspondence uh, from NGOs you have expressing too, if you concerned, look. Uh, but this is... Uh, in relation to specific cases. And as I said before, um, I'm committed to ensuring and supporting uh, all children, particularly those in out-of-home care, and the department will be looking at case-by-case -case matters and working with NGOs should the matter arise. How many children, Minister, are currently in the care of NGOs um, um, that have your um, NGO short-term indemnity scheme applying? I'll have to ask Ms Campbell or take that on notice. I don't have that figure in front of me. Um, and how many children are there with NGOs who <coughs> don't have insurance cover at all, as at today? Um, Ms Campbell, do you have that figure? Take I'll that take it on, on notice. notice. And I suggest you talk to some NGOs, Minister, and you get your department to talk directly to NGOs because this sort of hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil and pretend there's not a major crisis here. If the sector is watching this, I imagine there'll be a collective groan of disappointment with how your department has responded. Will you undertake to speak directly to the NGOs? Uh, the two questions in that. First of all, I want to say that the, uh, the department do speak to, to NGOs. And as I said before, if any in NGO comes forward with a specific concern, uh, that will be dealt with case by case. But in relation to me uh, meeting with uh, NGOs, I'm more than happy to meet with NGOs and, and also moving forward, um, uh, uh, endeavour to, to visit um, and also meet with, with uh, uh, our caseworkers and, and children as well. Minister, it is good news that there are there were, as at the 31st of December, um, less children in alternative care, some 70. Do you have a more current figure than 31 December? The previous ministers got weekly updates on this matter. I'll uh, actually ask the department if they have a cl more update date um, figure. The numbers fluctuate week on week, sometimes on a day by day day basis and we need to apply some ageing and checking of data. So the 31st of December is the most recent data that um, we have the utmost confidence in um, providing to this committee. But like I said, the numbers do, do well, fluctuate. Yep. I, I just like the data you have, the most recent data. So, so the most recent data the... is the 70, which is, uh, as the Minister mentioned earlier, at 31st of December 2021. I, I know that Prime Minister's required a weekly update on the number of children in alternate care. Has that practice now ceased since we have the new minister? Ms Check. 
I might let the Minister answer that. Um, I am able to ask for any updates, and if you'd like an up-to-date figure as of today, I can take that on notice and come back to you. Well, no, no, Minister. The answer is yes. This matter was, was of such concern to not just previous Ministers, but people in New South Wales who see kids in long-term so-called care being housed and warehoused in motels, the previous Ministers got weekly updates on the numbers. Are you sitting there telling me now that you're no longer doing that? I'm updated on a range of, of uh, matters, but as I said, there's work being undertaken uh, to uh, ensure that um, children that are in alternative care accommodation, and as I said to you, it is a, it's the um, last resort for placement, uh, but uh, the department works uh, tirelessly to ensure that uh, these children are placed in uh, permanent stable accommodation. You, you, you say the department works tirelessly. When did you become minister? Uh, December last year. What date in December? Uh, 23rd. And um, since that time, you got one, you've got one data point on the 31st of December for a week after you entered, uh, became minister, but then you haven't got a single update on alternate care arrangements in the two months that followed. As Mr. How, how, how do you know, if you don't get an update on it, how do you know the, gov the, the department's doing its utmost? How, you say it, but how do you know it if you don't ask? Uh, as Ms Chek said, it's, uh, the, the actual daily figures do fluctuate, and I'm happy for her to explain in more detail why that is the case. Well, no, how do you know the daily figures Hang fluctuate on, if you don't ask, Minister? You say that, but the only, the only figure you've got is from seven days after you became Minister. In the last two months, you haven't asked, it appears. Is it true you haven't asked in the last two months? One thing that I can say, uh, Mr Shoebridge, is that I have asked the Department to continue with the strict approvals of alternative care arrangement, and that is initially for only two weeks, and then for 28 days at a time with regular monitoring of exit plans uh, at the most senior operational levels. Uh, and this is also monitored by the Children's Guardian. Um, what is the longest that a child in alternate care, who's there now today, what is the longest that a child has been in alternate care? I will ask Ms Chek to respond on that. So the child or young person who is the longest stay in an alternate care arrangement currently is a young woman who is 17 years of age, she's non-Aboriginal. Uh, we are trying to locate her a housing property to move into semi-independent living in preparation for leaving care later this year. One of the challenges, and I will get to the number of days, one of the challenges has been the housing market in her particular location. And I'm, I'm not going to say where she is because I don't want to breach her her privacy, but she's been in well, that I'm sure you can say the region without breaching her privacy. Oh, oh, Southern New South Wales. Um, she's been in that arrangement for just over 300 days. So there's... A young woman who was probably 16, young, 17. Went, oh, was probably 16, 16 when she went, in. when yeah, she went into, um, being housed in motels? Well, she, she's in a service department. In service department on the south coast somewhere. And 300 days later, you haven't been able to find her a home and you're blaming the housing market. Is that I, it, Ms. No, I'm not, I'm not blaming the housing market at all. The team that's involved with her have um, been working tirelessly to locate suitable accommodation what for her. Is, what is the average time and the median time for children in alternate care? So the median length of stay is 32 days. And again, these figures are at 31st of December 21. That is a decrease from the quarter before, so the 30, uh, end of September quarter, which was 42 days. Um, in terms of other lengths of stay, 75.9% uh, of children exit within three months, 15.5% exit within three to six months, 8.3% exit within six to 12 months, and 0.2% uh, more than 12 months. And um, I do have the number of children in each of those categories. Well, could you table those sure. that documents? Yeah, absolutely. Check. Minister, what do you say to that? 17-year-old young woman on the south coast who's in your care and for the last 300 days has been warehoused in a service department because you've been unable, as we understand it, you tell us, you've been unable to find her a home. What do you say to her? 
Alternative care arrangement is um, the last resort, as I said. Everything is being done to ensure every child that is in that situation is found in, or housed in a safe and stable environment. Good morning, Minister. Good morning. Um, congratulations. I know you've been congratulated this morning, but uh, congratulations on your promotion. This Thank is a you. really serious area uh, of government. It and is. I wish you some success in uh, doing better with it. It's really important. Um, I'm going to focus today on some questions about uh, youth justice, juvenile justice. Um, first thing I want to ask about, um, and sensitively, of course, um, a youth justice officer, uh, Brad uh, Turney, um, I think was his name. Um, First of all, condolences to his friends and family, but he died um, on the job a couple of weeks ago. Can you give us some information on the circumstances around that? Uh, I will actually uh, ask the department to go into specific details in relation to the... Because, uh, uh, obviously, it's, uh, uh, there's several parts to it. One is in relation to uh, the support that's given to uh, to staff and, and the work that's done in the, the, the centres, but also the uh, investigation that's going on. Yes, thank you. Sure. Shall I? Yeah, you start. So, yeah, Mr, Mr. Turney uh, tragically died at work a couple of week, a few weeks ago. Um, he was an assistant manager at the centre and was supporting the team responding to an incident in one of the units in the centre. Um, all of the information arising from that incident and following the incident has been provided to the police who are preparing a report for the coroner and has been provided to Safe Work New South Wales. We will begin our investigation once those processes are complete in consultation with those agencies. Um, but that's all we can say in terms of what happened because we need to wait for those investigations to run their course. Right, so you haven't started investigating yet? You're waiting for the police? Uh, police and Safe Work. So those, those two authorities really need to do their work and there is a, always a risk that if they are involved in an investigation, if we undertake investigation activities, that could really damage their investigation. Um, can you, uh, and I accept that that's um, the situation, can you give us some information around the incident that occurred um, that led to uh, his death? I, I, um, I don't want to mislead the committee and I've seen the video, I, I'm aware of the incident. But again, that is central to the information provided to the authorities for the investigation. Making a public comment about that now, I think, would be irresponsible and risky for me to do that. But it was a use of force in response to um, some young people who were not following an instruction. And um, the use of force was carried out in accordance with the policy. So that's the incident, but I don't want to describe it any further than that because, again, it would undermine the work being done by other authorities at the moment. It will all become very clear in the fullness of time, but not today, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, look, I accept that, that these processes um, have to take place. <coughs> um, but in terms... So, I mean, was there... F I'll ask this, I'm not sure whether you'll be able to answer it, but was there force used uh, against the officer or was it the officer and others <coughs> using it to uh, break up the incident? I, um, I understand why you're asking, but again... That information has gone to the authorities who have to ask that exact same question in their investigation. And they have to they have to work that through. So I think it would it would be inappropriate for me to give you that information. Is today. there a time? Do you have a timeline for uh, where the police are at or where Safe Work are at? Um, no, we, we with the police um, they are working with the coroner, and their primary responsibility is to deal with the family and provide information to the family, and then to us. So we are behind the family in the order of priority there and they are working as fast as they can, but I don't have a date from them. Um, we have our, our own work health and safety staff in our department who are liaising with safe work, and we don't know, have a timeline for that one yet either. And so I accept that these investigations are happening, but um, and I, I note the uh, comments that you've given in terms of waiting for those to happen before um, your uh, organisation investigates this. I understand that. Um, but... Uh, can you at least give us some information to reassure staff and the community that something like this can't happen again while we're waiting for these investigations to take place? Yeah, I, I can't say that something won't happen again if the police and the coroner haven't determined the cause of, of the incident. So I, I understand the desperate need people have for assurance and I, I have the same feeling. I would lo love that assurance too, but again, and it is tempting to provide that assurance as soon as possible, but... I don't think I can without the right information. So I can't give people an assurance that things won't happen again. We really have to wait until 
the cause of the incident is established by the authorities, and, and that's the only process in front of us. But does that mean staff are at risk now? Uh, I, I don't think that there's any change to the level of risk to staff before and after that incident. I don't think there's any evidence that is available to us that says the risk profile has changed for staff. Now, the inquiry might, the investigations, the findings of those authorities might give us information that changes that, but at the moment there's nothing to say the risk profile has changed for anybody. Um, Ms Murray, I may interrupt just to say that uh, when this incident did occur, I, I spoke directly with um, uh, Mr O'Reilly, um, who was also speaking directly with um, the staff at the, the centre as well. And he, if possible, you may want to outline some of um, the work that's been done um, with the staff at the centre, just for, to give you reassurance that there has been direct engagement. Sure. Um, we, we have um, a whole range of support services in place for staff. Uh, on the night of the incident, um, our psychological services team uh, were on site at nine o'clock that night supporting staff. Uh, as is often the case in a crisis like that, um, staff need that support at different stages following the event. So that's been, there's been follow-up visits um, from psychologists, psychologists to support staff. Staff were supported to attend the funeral if they wish to do so. Um, staff have been given leave if they need leave. Uh, and the leadership team at the centre have done an outstanding job just being around and being available and making sure that everybody involved uh, in that incident or anybody who knew Mr Turney, and I knew him myself, um, uh, had the support they needed. And we absolutely accept that this is a long-term process for everybody and um, our job in supporting people will go on for some time. Yeah, and uh, so I recognise that that uh, um, emotional and psychological support will be provided. That's great. Obviously, my uh, original and immediate questions are for physical safety of Oops. officers. Um, how many other incidents like this, obviously not as extreme as resulting in someone's death, but uh, assaults on officers, um, how many other incidents like this that have uh, resulted in injuries to officers have happened, um, say, in the last six months? Um, well, I don't... I wouldn't characterise this incident as an assault on an officer. We have to wait for the yeah, investigation sorry, to I, run I'm not its either, course. But, yep. um, but certainly assaults uh, are a lot, a lot lower than they used to be. And if you're bearing with me, I can give you some, some numbers on staff assaults. Um, staff assaults over the last three years uh, have changed significantly. Uh, across all of our centres uh, in 2018-19, we had 189 staff assaults recorded in our system. <clears throat> uh, in the year following that, 2019-20, we had 105, so that's a significant drop from 189 to 105. And the most recent financial year, 2021, 113, which is um, fairly stable following that second change. So the trend for assaults uh, has reduced and also the severity of assaults has reduced. The, the, uh, the volume of injury claims has reduced. The cost of injury claims has reduced. People are returning to work faster. So um, in mid-December, roughly, um, your predecessor, the previous minister, actually announced a $8 million boost in security Mm -hmm. uh, to protect staff. Literally, the press release says that staff need to be protected, um, better protected, uh, and so the $8 million was for a program of works to protect staff and enhance rehabilitation efforts. Um, where is that at? It was supposed to be, it's supposed to be finishing in a couple of months, that work. Uh, where are we up to with that? Uh, what I can say is um, there have been a number of uh, controls and safeguards put across um, youth justice uh, to support the safety and security of our frontline um, uh, staff, including uh, screening of young people on emissions uh, and also the classification of their, their risk level, uh, which then uh, allows for further um, uh, tailored um, uh, support or um, uh, assistance if required. Uh, in addition to that, uh, enhanced CCTV surveillance and also the introduction of uh, body-worn cameras uh, for incident response teams. Um, in addition to that, there's also $3 million <coughs> that's being uh, spent on staff training and wellness initiatives. So... So that's eight million plus three million, or the three million is part of the eight million that was announced in I December. Will, I'll get the department to clarify. Yeah, they're, they're separate. So the eight million dollars that was announced is part of our ongoing maintenance program, focused specifically on security and safety. Since late 2019, there has been much more than that spent on safety and security, uh, along with our policy changes in the way we deal with <coughs> high-risk young people in custody to reduce violence. So all of those things come together, and the eight million dollars announced in December is the current raft of. Uh, infrastructure upgrades to make the place safer. That includes things like um, changes to fencing, 
uh, changes to window frames and door frames to make them more robust. Sometimes it's in relation to security access, the way we control, the way young people move through a centre. Uh, all of those things require changes. The Shearer report from 2019 made a heap of recommendations, which are almost complete, but we had to prioritise those, and the latest round is finishing off a lot of that work. Um, and so it's supposed to be finished in a couple of months. Will it be completed? About $8 million will be finished by the end of June because it was for this financial year. It also, um, the, the release from the government and the minister at the time referred to this money also including enhancing rehabilitation efforts for um, people in detention. What allocation of that money has been spent on enhancing rehabilitation efforts? Yeah, I couldn't give you the breakdown specifically right now, but certainly that, that is part of the mix because it, it is making sure that the therapeutic interventions we have for those young people uh, are always changing in response to the evidence base. And we've certainly spent a lot of money training our psychologists and justice health colleagues uh, on, on particular techniques to reduce violence and reduce self-harm. Um, thanks. Can I just turn to uh, COVID? Um, sure. Where are you guys at, first of all, in terms of vaccination rates yep. for both um, uh, detainees and also staff? Um, if you can give me a breakdown for each, sure. uh, and also boosters. Okay. Um, so for our staff, uh, it is our policy now that staff must be vaccinated, and uh, that was put in place late last year, and that process is now complete. And so uh, 18 staff out of all of our staff, which represents about 1%, did not comply with that policy, uh, and out of those 18, four resigned, and the other 14 their employment was ceased. Um, the rest of the staff are fully vaccinated and compliant with Including the booster shots? Booster shots are underway, but they're compliant with the, the regulation, which is in relation to two shots. Um, so the staff are vaccinated and safe. Uh, and in custody, Justice Health leads our vaccination program, and they've been working hard since the vaccination was approved uh, and vaccinating young people as they come into custody. Um, the data from Justice Health yesterday um, tells us that 79% of young people in custody have one dose, 68% have two doses, and 30% have three doses. I mean, that's, those figures actually aren't great compared to the rest of the community. Why is it so low? Well, there's a really good reason for that, and I provided some evidence at the last hearing along those lines, but um, I don't expect that we will ever have the same rate as the community because our, cust our custody population changes so dramatically every day. Mm. So we will have... That figure of yesterday of 79% varies day to day <coughs> between, say, 75 and 90. It varies day to day. We might have 10 people come in and 15 people leave. We might have 15 people who are fully vaccinated and then they get bail, they're gone. The 10 people who come in, half will be vaccinated, half won't. And when your population in custody is at record lows, when our population is record lows, those changes really skew the percentages. Because of those changes in population, and because we don't know where people are coming from or when they're coming, and we have no control over their health status when they arrive, um, the most important thing to do is to have a really effective quarantine system and an early health assessment from Justice Health. Sure. And how many? So, how many COVID cases um, have there been uh, to date? Yeah, in custody since our first one on the fifth of August last year, we've had 85 young people in custody with COVID-19. Today there are zero, but over that period there have been 85. Can I just amplify, yes. if I may, um, Chair, and say that um, the crucial point um, about the churn, which <coughs> I think Mr O'Reilly is making, is that the um, number of controlled orders is at a very low level, but the number on remand proportionately is far greater than those uh, who are on control orders, which means that the churn, therefore, is, is quite rapid. Oh, yeah, uh, look, I accept that, I understand that, but that's the same in yep. the prison system proper and they didn't have control of it, so, you know, we will need to keep an eye on this yeah. with vulnerable people uh, in custody. Um, so, in terms of um, any arrangements that would have been place, in place uh, in terms of uh, protecting uh, those people in custody, um, is everything back to normal or are things still uh, in a variation of, of lockdown <coughs> or all the programs close. in operation? We're close to normal. Um, we reopened visits again in early December, but they closed again around Christmas. But we plan to open visits again on the 7th of March, um, which will be fantastic for some of those families who, are, who want to do that. But that control has been really important uh, in terms of reducing the impact of the Omicron variant, 
and I applaud our frontline staff for managing that because we have, we have no kids in custody with COVID today. That could change this afternoon, of course, but I think it demonstrates the value of those temporary restrictions. School is running as normal. Um, the programs are generally running as normal. There will be moments where programs are challenging if the program provider doesn't want to come into the centre because of their views on COVID risk. Uh, but generally speaking, we've managed to keep program providers coming into the centres. And visits, so visits um, being closed from pre-Christmas until the 7th of March. I'm glad to hear they're reopening, but what arrangements have been in place so that um, yeah. some of these young people, all of these young people can see their families? Yeah, we've had, um, well, the access to phone calls... Or whoever they want to see if the phone calls every over. day has never changed. And the, the provision of video visits has just increased as more tablets became available. Uh, and that's been running for two years now, the, the tablets. Um, how many, uh, as of, I assume you've got this, but as of today, how many young people are in uh, custody or detention? 176. 176. And have you got a breakdown of the ages? I have some. I have some breakdown of the ages. <coughs> uh, of that 176, um, we have two who are under 14. We have none under 12. We have 41 who are 18 and over. Um, that's the age breakdown. Would you like further breakdown? Um, no, or oh, just give me a gender breakdown, actually. Sure. Um, the gender breakdown is we have eight girls in custody out of 176. Thanks. And so um, the, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the numbers are down from last year, but did COVID have any impact on um, keeping uh, young people out of detention? Were other arrangements put in place so that they weren't necessarily coming into facilities? Uh, one thing I will say is that the, um, there are a number of initiatives and programs that are uh, implemented to um, divert uh, any child away from um, detention centres. Uh, and part of that is also through um, uh, the Youth on Track, the um, uh, a place, um, I think it's called, a place to go, but also the um, uh, Youth Justice Conferencing and also the Bail Assistance Line, which um, helps there with their accommodation. So. Um, the focus has been and will continue to be um, to divert a child away from uh, uh, having, first of all, any interaction with the youth justice system, but more importantly, going into detention. And was there a particular focus put on that to avoid them uh, being in detention during uh, this COVID period of the last two years? It's been a focus of the government to, uh, for a, a, a long time to ensure that um, children are diverted away from going into, into custody. Um, but I can ask the department to comment further in relation to, to, to COVID. Sure. Um, the, the risk of contracting COVID in custody uh, in the youth justice system was not particularly high because it's a very small system with space. Um, young people have their own room, their own bathroom, so uh, it's, it's a little different. And obviously we don't control the decisions about who comes into custody, but we did notice an increase in remand, even though there was a drop in the overall numbers. And, and I think the drop in overall numbers was just a continuation of the trend of the reduction in youth custody prior to COVID. The trend just continued naturally. I don't think there was a change in trajectory in the overall numbers because of COVID. Yeah, I mean, I, I, look, I accept that you guys don't make decisions about who's in custody, but I am interested in that trend because we want I, I would want that to be maintained Absolutely. after this period. So if things were happening during this COVID period that yeah. kept people out of detention, I'm, I'm asking because I want to know if yeah. there's going to be focus put on that going forward. The focus is to, as I said, to... Um, limit a child having uh, interaction uh, with youth justice. Um, and if we can work particularly through um, conferencing um, to have a, as many uh, or means of early intervention to prevent that, but more importantly, other programs where you're working with the child or the family um, to, to keep them out of the, the system and keep them out of detention. That is that is my, one of my priorities and, and, and something I'm working towards. Thanks. So um, I know that you said there were two people under the age of 14 um, who are currently uh, in detention or in custody. Um, I accept that this is the work of the Attorney General, but is there any work being done uh, by you, Minister, or the Department in relation to uh, the age of criminal responsibility? As you said, it is um, uh, uh, specifically the responsibility of the Attorney General, but as I said to you, that um, some of the key things, particularly um, the youth conferencing where a, a child is identified um, <coughs> uh, as a, a I suppose you could say at risk of, of um, or having interaction with the police. They're working with the community, um, with the family, um, to put in place the the, the support um, to ensure that we can limit and and prevent them going into the system. Because evidence does show once a, a, a person goes into the system, their their life trajectory is impacted. So anything we can be doing to prevent that now um, must be done. Sorry, can I just ask? Uh, are the 
are those two young people on remand or are they serving remand. sentences? They're on remand. And was the reason that they were that they are in youth justice on remand because they were unable to access bail because they had no fixed address or more than one fixed address? Was that the reason that, no. that they are in no, youth justice no, on remand? No, the, the Section 28 bail, which is um, mostly about not having accommodation, is fairly rare. 3.8% of admissions are for Section 28. And in custody now, there is nobody on Section 28. But again, the total the totals are down, so... We still have um, a bit of opposition time. Uh, so can I just ask then mm. about the Shearer report? So mm -hmm. there are, I, I know a number of recommendations have been um, uh, fulfilled, completed, but uh, there are some that have not. Um, where are we up to with implementing the recommendations of the Shearer report? I believe we're at 97%, but I'll, I'll just clarify. Sure. Yep. There, there are four recommendations we're still working on out of the 63. Um, recommendation 32, which is... Um, about focusing on um, developing minimum standards for our daily programming. Um, that work is underway, but not complete. Um, we've done some piloting at the Riverina Centre. Um, recommendation 33 is focusing on the same issue, but with an extra additional focus on cultural awareness. That work is underway, but not complete. Recommendation 37 made a suggestion that, or a proposal that WHNS reporting should be paperless and completely online. We're working towards that. Um, that is a big process. Uh, the new safety suite system that DCJ uses for WHNS is very helpful, but we have to connect that to our own case management system, which is at work underway. And the final one, not yet complete, is recommendation 41, which is the review of Aboriginal programs to assess their effectiveness to evaluate those programs. That work is underway, but not complete. Thanks. What about recommendation 12? This is about changing the funding model. Um, to recognise extra staff, et cetera. That wasn't done last time we asked about this, mm. but it, has that been yes, dealt we, with? Yes, we, so one of the most important um, elements of the Shear Report's recommendations was changing the model for managing high-risk young people. And so we've implemented two high-risk units and an enhanced support unit with different staffing ratios. So instead of having a unit with 15 young people and two staff, those units have a cap of six young people and four staff and the funding model has been permanently changed to accommodate that. Ms Moriarty, noting Mr Shoebridge is overrun, did you have one last question? Just tell me how many staff you've got. Sure, we have 1,700 staff across our custody and community area. And how many of them are directly um, uh, front-facing officers? Is that um, out of the that? 1,700? Notice, yeah. 1,400. 1,400, right. yeah. Thank and you. And that's, again, across community and custody. Right. Thank you. We now move back to crossbench questions. Ms Boyd. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm shocked to hear that Mr Shoebridge ran over in the last uh, I mean, round. It's never happened before. Right? No, I imagine it hasn't. It <laughs> um, good morning, uh, good morning. Chief Minister, and congratulations Thank again you very much. for your, um, your promotion, and good morning to all the rest of you as well. Um, I'm going to start off by asking about some questions um, in relation to people with disability. Um, as you know, people with disability are often... Unfortunately, a group of people that are considered um, at the last minute in a lot of circumstances by all levels of government. Um, we are seeing now during the floods up north that there are a number of um, people with disability who are doing it incredibly tough um, and they've not really been considered in a lot of the disaster planning so far. The Physical Disability Council of New South Wales is calling for urgent funding to allow advocacy organisations to locate people with a disability and also to then help um, rehouse them and, and get equipment back for them. Um, will you be heeding those calls? A uh, couple of things. One is uh, there's two parts to the um, response in relation to the floods. And first of all, I'd like to um, <coughs> extend... Um, uh, uh, my uh, heartfelt sympathy to those particularly impacted uh, in the north um, and also acknowledge um, the numerous number of volunteers who are out there on the ground um, and also um, uh, the work of uh, the department in relation to that. First part is our initial um, uh, engagement, uh, which is actually under um, the responsibility of Minister Cook. However, in relation to um, housing and long-term, that does come under to my area. But I will actually ask uh, Mr Vivas to comment because he has been uh, instrumental um, from the very beginning um, and will be carrying it through. So he might be able to comment further in relation to, to that, the rapport that as you raised. That is good. I will just clarify 
before we do that, that there's, I, I guess I'm going to be asking two questions. The first one is in relation to this emergency funding right now. Um, and if that's not um, within your responsibilities, if you will be advocating for it um, with uh, Minister Cook. And then the second one is around what we do with the clean up and, and rehousing. Uh, in relation to uh, funding, definitely you'll need to, to speak to, um, I'll raise that with Minister Cook. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to talk to her as well. Thank you. As I say, it's often the forgotten group of people, unfortunately. Um, Mr Fevers. Um, firstly, in relation to <coughs> evacuation centres, uh, we have progressively, outside of emergencies, uh, been working with local em emergency management committees to make sure that evacuation centres are accessible for people with physical disabilities. Um, so that's work in progress, and I think that is the case um, there are 24 evacuation centres currently running in northern New South Wales. I think that is the case, certainly, for all of the bigger ones. Mm. Uh, clearly, there is going to be a big need for follow-up for people with housing. And so, in the last 24 hours, uh, I've started to set up an arrangement that we did following the bushfires, where we had a housing response team, and we will set up a dedicated team uh, of housing staff to work with anybody who's displaced, not just public housing tenants, but anybody who is, uh, in fact, homeless as a result of those floods. Uh, we will, in the short term, make sure that they have some temporary accommodation, less than desirable and less than perfect, um, while we look at longer term solutions for them. I'm not going to minimise the challenges. The private rental market in those areas was already under extreme pressure before this happened. It'll be under even more pressure there now. Um, but we absolutely will give individual case management to people who are vulnerable. So a number of um, people within the disability community will suffer disproportionately, I guess, because of the reduced number of accessible um, homes and, and flats and things that they can, they can rent afterwards. But also there is um, a considerable number of homes that have... Um, had modifications and improvements, um, you know, hoists and beds and other sort of mobility devices that will have been destroyed. Um, we know from ex from past experience in disasters that the NDIS can take quite a long time to reassess and re-provide um, equipment of that kind. Will the New South Wales government be stepping in to make sure that that sort of... Um, I guess the immediate funding is provided to allow those people to get that mobility equipment back as soon as possible. I think the way that we best step in is to try to make sure that the NDIS does respond quickly. Uh, it, it, it's not going to work for us to try and set up a whole structure that actually sits with the NDIS. And absolutely, uh, we will be doing that. And then also... Uh, we do have programs within social housing, ourselves and community housing providers, uh, where in the last 12 months, I think in, in recognition that our own response has often been too slow for people with disabilities, uh, I set up a task force and we've made a number of changes to seek to improve particularly the timeliness of our response. And in a very practical sense, we've taken on um, occupational therapist right across the state because so many of our uh, tenants and applicants were waiting months to get an occupational therapy assessment uh, and, and that has helped speed up the process greater. We've got a long way to go. It's, it's a challenge for us uh, but I think we've, we've had a renewed recognition that we need to act quicker in, mm. in a more timely way. Um, Minister, will you be making representations to your federal counterpart to try and get that funding as quickly as possible? We have um, a uh, ministerial council which is made up of all um, uh, ministers from uh, each state and territory uh, that does meet on a regular basis and we cover a range of, of, um, of issues and topics and, and we have the ability to put things on the agenda as well. But one of the key things I, I would say is um, I will always be a strong advocate um, to ensure that New South Wales gets our fair share uh, and that the people with disability in New South Wales um, are well supported. Will you be raising, though, as a matter of urgency, the need for a quicker assessment process and additional funding to go to people in the northern rivers, oh, sorry, in northern New South Wales in particular, who have been impacted by the floods? Uh, as I said, we, uh, 
what is raised at those those meetings um, uh, and what I will continue to do is advocate across the board for um, people with disability to ensure that they get the services and support that they need. Thank you. But that's... And I do understand that process and it's, I understand it's quite worked quite well in, in the past. Um, it's one of the um, sort of cross-state uh, and federal... Um, uh, groups that has worked quite well, I think, in relation to disability. Um, but this is clearly an, uh, an unusual circumstance, kind of falls outside of the ordinary cycle of those meetings. Will you be calling on the federal minister to do what they can to plug the hole here before people with a disability suffer in northern New South Wales? And I think you touched on it. It's, it's, um, this is a... Uh a, a, a huge disaster in the area, and it's not, um, which is quite broad, which means it is more of a whole of government approach uh, in addressing, um, providing support, whether it's for people with disability, whether it's housing, whether it's um, clearance. So it's, it is a broader approach than just one minister. Understood, but people with disability are facing particular challenges. Um, we know from experience that that funding doesn't get to where it's needed in time. Are we going to do things differently this time? I, um, I do have a meeting coming up for, uh, with the uh, disability um, ministers um, and I'm more than happy to, to, to raise it as an, as an agenda item. Um, thank you. What will you do to ensure that people with a disability are included in, in future disaster planning? Uh, well, obviously, we have the New South Wales um, Disability Inclusion Plan, and um, uh, like with uh, all plans um, and action plans, there's opportunities to, to review things. So I'm more than happy to, uh, to, to look at that further um, and take it on notice to see where uh, there are opportunities for us to uh, expand and provide more, more support. Thank you. Um, that would be very useful. Um, in Mr Viva's answer, um, in response to my earlier question, the, you know, the the talk of lack of general housing um, and the, the issues that we have with, with housing stock, particularly in northern New South Wales, um, but obviously in other areas. Um, again, this is particularly acute for people with a disability who are looking for particular um, you know, accessible housing. Um, doesn't this uh, highlight again the need for New South Wales to sign up to the minimum accessibility standards that most of the rest of the country has? Uh, in relation to the standard, is a question uh, best directed to the Minister for uh, Fair Trading. Okay. Will you be advocating for the Minister for Fair Trading to uh, change position in relation to the minimum accessibility what standards? I, what I can say is currently uh, all new um, housing that is built is at a, a, a high standard, but in relation to a, the um, minimum standard, it's a matter that you'll need to raise with um, Minister Pedernos. Okay. I will. Um, <laughs> I look forward to that. Um, under the former um, Minister Ward, so the two disability ministers ago, um, the department was undertaking a consultation process into a bill in relation to restrictive practices. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that was at quite a, an advanced stage. There had been consultation um, already, um, but to the best of my knowledge, there have been no sort of public announcements in relation to that since. Mm -hmm. um, can you provide an update on where that's at and will you be carrying it forward? Um, Mr. Um, will comment. Yeah, Thank if, you. if I can say, we did undertake a very extensive uh, consultation process and we did actually get a great deal of feedback. Uh, I actually chaired a, a meeting with probably, I think, about 50 uh, organisations, and I it, it was quite clear that there was a not a not a consensus of mm -hmm. views. So uh, where we are at now is we actually went back and have redrafted the exposure bill, mm -hmm. uh, and we we think we have addressed the main concerns. The main concerns are around um, the selection of the trusted person. Uh, which was part of the first bill. We mm. think that we have addressed that, but um, we need to have a further consultation with those groups on a revised bill. I'm afraid there has been something of a delay during COVID, um, but we're not far away from a revised exposure bill and we will consult again. We really don't want to progress with this till we've got a greater sense that um, people with disabilities and their representative organisations have confidence in the way that we're approaching it. Yep, and I, I appreciate that 
uh, and commended. Um, I just also want to make sure that it's it's still progressing in some form. Yeah, totally. Um, totally. And I, I'd share the frustration of the time uh, that this is taking. Okay. Um, perhaps we can turn to um, the definition of older people um, and how it is used within, um, particularly around uh, in homelessness. Um, and so we have, for example... Um, in the homelessness strategy, we define um, older women as women over 55 years. In the Social and Affordable Housing Fund, we define um, it as over 55 for older women, but then over 45 years for people who identify as First Nations. Um, and then in um, Aging Well in New South Wales 2031, that strategy doesn't define the cohort at all. Um, do we have some... Um, consensus or some uh, intention perhaps to have a more um, uh, clear, I guess, a clearer definition of what constitutes an older person for the purposes of, of your department? Uh, I think the the Minister for Seniors probably is best to to raise uh, specifically about having a, a broader definition, although I do understand that um, a lot of this is also directed um, from uh, definitions in, uh, set by the federal government. Thank you. It, it does get very confusing because when we talk just within your department, there's examples I gave there. The Housing 2041 strategy talks about people aged 65. Um, it gets incredibly confusing. Um, in previous budget estimates, um, the government indicated that you don't use a single definition um, because age-related needs manifest in different ways. Um, but then the seniors card is available for residents over 60. Um, is there a need for standardisation? I might ask the department to, to comment further in relation to the varying I, I think we can probably, between us, uh, you. Uh, address some of that. Uh, so the, the, there are, of course, some planning regulations which define... Um, an age threshold. Uh, so seniors housing, for example, has mm. those thresholds set in the state environment planning um, in instruments <coughs> to which we, we also are subject. Um, within public housing, uh, the the th there is a threshold at 80 years old, mm. uh, which gives people greater priority. But I, I'm not sure how much we would ever be helped by having a single threshold because our aim is to do an individual assessment of someone's needs, which we do for people who are eligible for priority housing. And so whatever their age, um, we want to look at their individual needs and seek, you know, within the resources that we've got to provide for those um, as, as best we can. Um, and so I, I'm not convinced that a single mm -hmm. threshold for all services would actually go with a, with a process of trying to individualise the response. But Anne, maybe. no, I think you've covered yeah. it. And I think I think I agree with you. So long as there is actual evidence and science behind the age that we've chosen for certain things, um, doesn't appear to me. For example, the seniors card seems to just be sort of plucked out of the air at sixty. Um, is there is there evidence and science behind the way that each of these definitions is made, or is it just a product of kind of history? Um, if I'm being honest, I suspect it is a product of of, of history to some degree. Mm. Um, but I think also, you know, there are links between. Uh, um, Federal government benefits, for example, and the ages that are set there. So, I, uh, but but there, there undoubtedly is a historical element there, and I think the best thing that we can do, as I say, is to try and individualise our assessments. Now, you, you can't do that for a seniors card. It's it's a you know it's obviously not practical, but for people with more complex needs, I think that's where we should go. Mm. Did you want to add anything, Ms. No, Kim? I mean, I think in terms of... Um, you talked about the homelessness services and the mm. social and affordable housing. They do have the same criteria in terms of for Aboriginal um, people accessing those services. It's 45, and that's based on because of some of the health issues that um, that cohort has. So yep. it is consistent within DCJ across those two programs. 
Okay, how many minutes do I have left? Three and a half. Three and a half minutes, that's plenty. Um, <laughs> if we could just talk a little bit about the, um, the crisis support um, for domestic violence um, victim survivors in rural areas. Um, what crisis support options are available for women and children fleeing domestic violence in rural areas when the local shelters are at capacity and, as we know, they often are? Um, do you have some sort of update on that that you can give us? These are actually mm. questions for um, the Minister Ward. Um, however, um, mm. if Ms Gamble would like to comment... Um Further, I'm if with you. and just on that because I, I know that we got bounced around um, when we first had the machinery of government <laughs> changes, and um, we were told that anything that was housing related would be in this portfolio, um, whereas and especially crisis accommodation, whereas anything in the domestic and family violence um, portfolio was mainly legislative. Has that changed, or can we just have some clarification on that? That's, yeah, that's so about I know right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, in terms of in regional areas, if there isn't social housing available, there's obviously Start Safely in terms of women and children escaping domestic and family violence. Mm -hmm. So, that's a, um, a rental product which subsidises women and children for up to three years with wraparound supports. In addition, um, we have a thing called the Community Housing Industry fund which um, we've just done a procurement last year and that's about creating additional social and affordable housing and some of that is in regional areas so mm -hmm. that's in the pipeline. Um, in terms of, I'm just trying to think, the social and affordable housing fund you talked about, 30% mm -hmm. um, of those new homes are for older people and I think there's mm -hmm. about, I haven't got the stats quite in front of me, but some there's a percentage of those for older women, particularly over 55 in, in those locations. So it's particularly, look, we know that the um, lack of crisis accommodation for domestic family violence is, is widespread um, across the state. And that's one of the reasons that, that we have the, um, the commitment to increase that with the call and cluster, and that's great. Um, but rural areas in particular face you know, and women um, in particular in rural areas face very um, significant um, challenges when it comes to fleeing um, domestic and family violence. Do you have um, any, any figures, I guess, around what the capacity is within particular areas and where the hotspots are? Yeah, we do have that data, so I'm happy to take that on notice and provide that. That would be very useful. Mm -hmm. And just in relation to the core and cluster, um, obviously uh, those decisions will be made based on, on need, but there will also be um, focus on rural and regional as well as metropolitan. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, one final question then in this um, round. Um, we heard yesterday um, when I asked this question of Minister Ward, I think that was yesterday, this week's getting very long, um, we were talking about the funding for... Um, the sort of sexual assault um, helpline um, that's currently run by Full Stop Australia. Um, and we were told that all of that was funded by health and not through DCJ. Are there any sexual assault sort of counselling or any, any of those sorts of services provided through DCJ or is it all entirely health? Again, they're, they're questions for Minister Ward, but I might ask uh, Ms Campbell to comment Thank you. just to facilitate. Yeah, most of the funding does go to New South Wales Health. Obviously, in terms of some of our specialist homelessness services who might be working with women um, or children or anyone who's sexually assaulted, there would be a referral. So they would make an assessment depending on what the disclosure was to them and ensure there are good linkages to those sexual assault services. Thank you. Alrighty. Well, I note the time. Uh, we have a short break. Uh, if everyone could be back at their places by 11.15, that would be appreciated. Thank you very much.
of budget estimates into family and community services and disability services will resume. With questions uh, from the excuse me, Chair, could I just make a clarifying uh, comment in relation to a question I was asked uh, by Mr. Shoebridge in relation to alternative care accommodation? Yes. Uh, just to advise that um, I've spoken to my uh, my office and my a uh, member of my staff is actually given uh, weekly updates in relation to numbers, uh, and because as um, uh, Ms. Chair said before, the, the numbers do fluctuate, um, but. It, if those numbers vary uh, significantly, then I would expect a full brief in relation to it. OK. All right. Thank you, Minister. We'll now proceed to questions from the opposition. Ms Jackson. Thank you. Thanks, Minister. Welcome. Um, I just wanted to quickly follow up um, on a comment that Mr Vivas made in response um, to questions from Ms Boyd about um, the emergency accommodation arrangements for the floods. I just quickly wanted to follow up. I mean, her questions were important, but I'm interested more broadly about the preparatory work that has occurred for the fact that there are now thousands of people who are homeless to the extent that they cannot live in their inundated homes. Um, and that is a region in which there are not thousands of spare accommodation premises. So what is the planning that DCJ is doing to ensure those people have somewhere to stay? Uh, before I ask uh, Mr Vivas to comment further, I just wanted to say uh, that uh, a lot of work has been occurring the last few days um, and I've been in contact um, particularly um, with uh, the local members and, and uh, as of Monday night with uh, Tamara Smith, where uh, she reached out. Um, there were a number of uh, Aboriginal families that had been displaced from the Cabbage Tree Island. Um, they were in an evacuation centre. Um, I spoke to uh, Mr Vivas in relation to finding uh, crisis accommodation for them. Uh, we were able to partner with a, uh, a, a uh, organisation there that runs a youth camp, or a campsite, I should say, that has um, accommodation. And, and that evening, um, transfer, um, uh, I think it was around 70 um, uh, individuals with, with children into uh, accommodation, which, as I said, it is crisis accommodation and it is about the long-term uh, sustainability and ensuring that um, uh, uh, people are housed uh, moving forward. And I'll ask uh, Mr Vivas to outline the process in relation to uh, what is done in relation to these disasters. Uh, so the, there's uh, several kind of arms of the strategy that we have in place. Firstly, I should say that the vast majority of people who are flood affected will have insurance which provides for temporary accommodation while their accommodation is unusable. That does not address the question of, well, then where do they go to? Um, and in many cases, the only solution for them uh, will be short term accommodation like a, a, a service departments or holiday apartments. Um, it's a coincidence, but fortunately we're over the peak tourist period in, in that region. Uh, it's, it's not great for many of those families, but I think it is the only alternative to, to be close, and most people want to be close. Um, then there will be people who are not insured, and Resilience New South Wales has programs of assistance uh, for people who are not insured. And at this stage, I don't know what the clean-up arrangements will be, but when this happened before, Public Works uh, actually, uh, and after the fires, undertook clean-ups. Now, I can't speak for them now. Uh, but then we will have um, a group of people who really, really struggled to get housing. We certainly had that after the bushfires. Our immediate response will be temporary accommodation and I've already got a team of people seeking to look at what service departments we can get for those people because I'm anticipating it will be weeks, probably quite a few weeks, while we then look to resolve their need. We learned from the last set of floods um, in, in that region that we have to encourage people to look further afield <coughs> than that immediate region and I, I, I say that You mean in the, in the short term or in the longer term? Uh, I think prob uh, probably not in the short term, no uh, because I'm hoping that we will be mm. able to get some short term accommodation but if they need private rental or social housing there are so few options in that region and, and I <coughs> totally do not mean to sound unsensitive to the fact that some of those people may have lived a long time in that region. So we will work with people, but we did find before that to get long-term accommodation, we had to look at um, further inland to places like Casino, uh, and in some cases further south, even down as far south as Newcastle. Um, 
it's it's not ideal, but the private rental market gives us very few options there. I mean, can you point. understand how heartbreaking that is, Minister? I mean, Mr Vivas mentioned the private men rental market, but he also mentioned the limited availability of social housing, that there are people who have now <coughs> been through 2017 floods, these floods, and the department's response to them is, you have to move away from the place that you've called home, where you have friends, family potentially, employment, kids go to school, you have to move to Casino or Lismore if you want to find long-term housing. Do you understand how heartbreaking that would be for people? This is a devastating uh, situation that is occurring and my heart goes out to uh, every family and individual that is affected. Uh, as the situation is still un unfolding, uh, I think it's difficult to uh, outline uh, particularly the number of uh, properties that would be available, but I'm happy to take on notice and come back to the committee uh, once we know a little bit more information in the coming days and weeks. Yep. We might follow up this afternoon, Mr Beavers, on some detail. I just wanted to ask... M may oh, I just apologies. Add, I didn't I'm, realize I'm you sorry, I should have added. Um, w after the bushfires, we set up a dedicated team of housing <coughs> staff who actually kind of case-managed everybody, and they were based down south. Um, I am in, literally yesterday and today in the process of establishing a team which will be a flood recovery housing team who will be based up north. And, and they'll be offering the individual case management yes. that you mentioned earlier? Yes. That is good. Thank you, Mr Beavers. Um, I wanted to ask about Together Home Minister. Um, how many packages are currently available? Um. The exact number of packages um, I'll have to take on number. What I can say that um, through the $122 million investment of the Together Home program, over 1,000 people have been uh, supported who have been sleeping rough. Um, can, can I say there are, um, there are over 1,000 places and um, 649 households which would probably equate to that, similar to that number of people, have taken up those places. So we still have um, a considerable number of places available under that program. And as people come into temporary accommodation, so we seek to move them into that program. I mean, it's been quite a successful program, actually, Minister. Um, but as you would know, the funding runs out in September this year, that um, $122 million. So what arrangements are going to be put in place to continue that support? Uh, I will uh, always, uh, Devon, it's important that you look at all programs, uh, whether it's this program or any other program, evaluate um, and ensure that um, uh, it is breaching the target. Uh, as you said, it's been a very successful program. Um, it is one of a number of programs that we have to uh, support people uh, sleeping at rough and, and transitioning into um, a permanent stable housing. And the commitment I make that is that uh, I will always ensure that we have uh, that support there to ensure ensure people are, are able to transition into to safe housing. I mean, that commitment hasn't always been there, and we can get into some of the details, but specifically on this program, the funding is running out in mere months. I mean, is there any plan to have an additional tranche or to continue the program in any way, or is it... I mean, the ERC process is on foot at the moment, isn't it? I mean, what is going to happen with Together Home? And as you know, as, uh, with all uh, budget submissions to uh, the ERC process, I can't preempt empt um, uh, the specifics of us or, or make any announcements in relation to, to budget process. And if I can just add to the Minister's comment, we've been working with the community housing providers who have been providing the head leasing and obviously the specialist homelessness services, uh, and particularly for the first tranche, because that program, as you know, was announced in different stages. But there is a cohort shortly um, that will, as you indicated, that we need to make sure they've got long-term um, accommodation. So we're working with the community housing providers to look at vacancies that come up. Uh, and some of the issues particularly obviously are in some of the regional areas. So we are working really closely to ensure that no person who's in the Together Home program returns to homelessness. I mean, Minister, it's good that that work is <clears throat> happening, but 
we know that there is incredible pressure on the availability of community housing and social other social and public housing. So if the plan is to transition those people who are currently being supported by Together Home into accommodation when that becomes available, what's that going to mean for other people on the priority social housing waiting list who maybe don't have Together Home packages, they haven't been rough sleepers, but they're in desperate need of social housing through community housing or through other social housing? I mean, it, they're just going to have to wait longer. One thing I will say in relation to um, particular waiting lists that we've actually got a, a, uh, a had a, quite a good record, particularly over the last 12 months. We've seen uh, the register fallen. Um, so we currently have 14, around 49,928 um, applicants on the register, and that's fallen from 51,395 uh, 12 months ago. Um, and in the last 12 months, 9,354 households um, have been uh, moved from the waiting list, which is actually the 8.3% drop uh, from uh, previous years, which is actually the, our best result in relation to waiting times in the last decade. Mm. I mean, it was 40, closer, I think, to 46,000 the, the year before that. So, you know, yes, you've dropped from the peak, I think, was actually 53,000 in October 2021. So it's good to hear that there's been a slight drop from that, but you're still still not... <clears throat> you're still quite a bit above where you were in 2020. So, I mean, is that... Is there any plans to address that? There's still well, almost 50,000 people waiting for social housing. One thing in relation particularly to priority um, housing and wait list is the, the length of time. So um, I think it's around two months uh, for priority housing, which um, is, is substantially different to where it was 10 years ago, which was sitting around the 4.8-month uh, waiting time. So um, there's always more that can be done, but a lot has been happening. We might get back onto public housing in a minute. Uh, I just want to, so I just want to finish up, sorry, on Together Home, which is... So the plan is, in fact, to use properties that become available in community housing and, I suppose, other social housing to transition those people over um, to that accommodation. And at this stage, <coughs> there is no additional funding for the program beyond September this year. That's the reality where we stand today. I'll have Ms Campbell to comment on the Thanks, transition. Minister. The other thing that was announced um, as part of the economic stimulus last year was for this program, 35, I think, $0.5 million for new capital supply. So we're currently looking at that. Obviously, there's a bit of a lag in terms of how long it takes to create new social housing. But there was also additional um, funding. I think it was of $183 million through... Uh, stimulus economic recovery for Land and Housing Corp. So there was $50 million for redeveloping, um, I think, a number of the <coughs> housing estates, um, as well as, um, you know, spot purchasing new products. So we're working really closely with Land and Housing Corp to align the exit points of um, when people actually move out of the program technically um, in November of this year to make sure there is supply in those locations. I mean, I, I, I had assumed that I would need to ask Minister Roberts and Land and Housing about the capital build, but so I, I don't... I'm not going to ask you more detail about that or... No. Very best. To, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. fine. Um, I wanted to ask about the Productivity Commission report that was released in late January. Um, have you read that report in Government Services, Housing and Homelessness? No, I have not. It's pretty sobering reading. Um, Half of all people who seek help for, for homelessness from a specialist homelessness provider in New South Wales are unable to access it, 48.2%. Half of the people who seek assistance are unable to access it. Is that acceptable to you? No. Well, one of the reasons that that is happening, Minister, is that New South Wales spends 3696 dollars per client per day on support. In Victoria, that figure is closer to $50. <coughs> the Australian average, I think, is around $48. So it's not acceptable because your government isn't funding the services that people need. So what are you going to do about it? There's a range of um, services and support to um, help people, whether from homelessness or um, need assistance in the private market. 50% of people can't access that, though. So it's, 
and you've just accepted that that's not good enough. Uh, as I said, there, there are a range of services that are available uh, and uh, to support people, uh, whether it's uh, in relation to homelessness um, or uh, to transition to more permanent um, accommodation as well. But you understand, what's happening is, yes, there, there are some services that exist and people are then reaching out for assistance. <coughs> Even that, as you would probably be aware for some people, is a really difficult first step to take. They're actually reaching out for support for accommodation support from a specialist homelessness provider and 48.2% of those people, those people who actually reached out and sought accommodation assistance from those programs, that their needs were not met. That's 50%. Can I say, I, I actually don't think that's correct to say that their needs are not <clears throat> met. Well, I didn't say it. It's from the Productivity Commission, uh, Mr Vickers. Uh, okay. So, so well, what the Product Commission is, is saying is that they were not given a service by that specialist homelessness service, that does not take into account a very large program of temporary accommodation that we run. And I would be desperately disappointed if someone came to a homelessness service and ended up not getting accommodation because it's an absolute requirement on those homelessness services to either refer them to another homelessness service or to us so that we can provide temporary accommodation. Um, and that is a really important safeguard. Uh, and temporary accommodation, as you know, is available 24-7 uh, through our Link to Home line. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that the temporary accommodation program exists, and we can talk about that later, but the specialist homelessness services are a very important part of providing assistance, particularly to vulnerable groups. So, for example women leaving domestic violence with children who might get particular care, particular assistance at a specialist homelessness service, that temporary accommodation, which is a couple of nights in a motel, I mean, it's, it's better than sleeping on the street, obviously, but that's a, different, that's a different form of support. So do you accept that currently what is happening with the SHS programs is not is not acceptable when 50% of people who reach out to them are being turned away. What I can say is that the, the productivity report that's come out in January, we're in the process of responding to, uh, and I'd prefer to take on notice uh, specific details. Well, I'm sure of, you would, because they're not very good figures, but you have to answer <coughs> the questions here well, today. Although Mr Vivas has, has commented that he disputes some of those figures, so I think it's important that the report is looked at in detail and responded to uh, correctly. Another element in that report was the quite substantial increase in the number of people who are living in severely overcrowded dwellings. So in 2011, the rate was 14 in 100,000. That's now up over 22. So do you accept that we have an overcrowding crisis? in New South Wales. As I said, uh, the, the facts and figures that have been presented by the Productivity Commission <coughs> need to be looked at for us to allow, uh, uh, to provide a detailed response. I mean, they don't just make up those figures, Minister. You actually provide them with information, and so do all of the other states, and then they put that together on their report on government services. So it's not as though these figures are new to you. They've come from... The DCJ, they've come from the work that your government is doing. They're not new information to you. You just haven't done anything about it. Well, I'll actually ask Mr Beavers to comment in relation to those figures. Can, can I just clarify, are those figures in relation to public housing? Uh, which ones, Mr Beavers, in relation to... Crowding. Uh, no, that's in relation to homelessness generally. So it's not in relation, it's not in relation to public housing, no. So it's, it's in relation to the entire... Housing, rental housing stock. Um, I, uh, look, look at you. I, I, I don't. I don't have a knowledge of what may have caused that in in private in the private rental market. Yes, I mean, I think we we possibly could discuss what has caused that. I accept that what you're saying, which is it's not strictly your responsibility because it's not in relation to people living in public housing. Um, is that what you're saying? I, I guess any form of housing stress is something that we should be interested in and seeking to do something about, not least in a preventative way. I, I'm simply saying I'm just not familiar with those numbers. 
Minister, I wanted to ask briefly about the federal government's recent announcement that it will not be developing a national homelessness strategy, despite the <coughs> fact that that was recommended by the recent parliamentary inquiry. Was that a disappointment to you? Uh, the decision uh, by the federal government to uh, have a national housing strategy is a matter for the federal government. Yes, but, you know, presumably, I would hope, you talk to your federal counterpart. Have you made any representations, perhaps with ministers from other states in relation to the need for a national homelessness strategy? My focus is uh, in New South Wales, and we have a, uh, a strategy here in New South Wales. Um, uh, what the federal government choose to do and, and oversee <coughs> of other jurisdictions in a matter for the federal government, what I'm focused on is, is New South Wales and delivering for the people of New South Wales. Had you finished that line, Rose? Yes, that's fine. Yep. You didn't want to press on that particularly enlightening answer any further? No. No, I mean, no she hasn't no. done anything, no. and she's not going to. Oh, Rose. Did you have a question, Mr Martin? Not yet, maybe. Okay. <laughs> yep. um, Minister, you said in response, in your, in your speech in relation to the Families Culture Bill that went through the Legislative Council last week, um, you said, it's fair to say that the system needs reform. <clears throat> We cannot keep doing the same things and expecting different outcomes for Aboriginal children. But this bill is not the answer. Well, when it comes to statutory reform, what is the answer, Minister? Uh, thank you, Mr Shoebridge. As uh, I <coughs> have spoken uh, uh, previously, uh, I am uh, committed to seeing um, closing the gap, but more importantly, reform um, uh, in supporting uh, Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. There are a number of uh, recommendations um, from that report, uh, over 3,000 individual ones, and I think we're sitting at about 97% have been implemented. Uh, in relation to the legislative uh, uh, recommendations, uh, as I said in, in that speech, and I've, I've said uh, to you as well, um, my commitment is ensuring that the implementation of, of additional uh, reforms must be done in consultation uh, with the sector, with also with key stakeholders, and that includes uh, particularly the, the Children's Court, and I've raised concerns about your legislation in relation to the Children's Court. But I do have a meeting uh, scheduled with the Knowledge uh, Circle, uh, which is the, the body that was formed back in, I think it's 2019, uh, to look at those recommendations, and I'll be going through with them uh, a number of uh, potential recommendations. And as I've said to you previously, I've got a commitment to uh, of bringing something forward uh, as soon as possible. But I might ask um, Mr Thomas to comment further, uh, as he has done a lot of work in this space. Thanks, Minister. As you know, there were 25 recommendations from the FIC report that uh, have a legislative component to them. Um, either legislative or some kind of regulatory reform. The process that the Minister's talked about with the meeting um, with the Knowledge Circle later this week is to talk about um, a process for consulting on those um, recommendations with a broad range of stakeholders. Thomas, you have to speak more closely, Mike. I Pardon, can't hear you. My apologies for that. Um, it, it, the, the process the Minister spoke about with the meeting with the Knowledge Circle later this week is to finalise a process of consultation on all of those 25 legislative recommendations. And that involves detailed consultations with legal stakeholders, such as the President of the Children's Court, the ALS, the Legal Aid Commission, who do the bulk of the work in this, in this jurisdiction, as well as um, important Aboriginal um, community stakeholders, not just on those recommendations, but on the nature of kind of legislation that can be brought forward to implement um, the intent of those those recommendations, with a particular focus on looking at which of those recommendations can be brought forward the quickest, and which might then be subject to further consultation following that consultation yeah. process. So the idea is following that uh, round of consultation and report on um, immediate next steps will be brought to the Minister for her consideration. Mm -hmm. So, Mr Thomas, I, I wrote down here what you said, finalise a process of consultation on reform. That sounds to me like some of the most bureaucratic jargon I have heard, to finalise a process of consultation on reform. They, word for word what you said. It's Is that really what you're doing? No, it's a process on consulting on those 25 legislative recommendations. So, as you know, they're quite specific recommendations, ranging from changes to the care and protection legislation to recommendations around the establishment of statutory authorities, for example. The process we're finalising this week is the process to go and consult um, 
on those 25 recommendations. Were you part of producing the, um, the formal government response in November of 2020 on the Family as Culture report, Mr Thomas? I wasn't. That was completed before I commenced in the role. Well, do you know that un 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 until the Minister's response in the House and what you've just said then, the official position of the government was, and it's detailed in black and white, with heaven knows um, how many hours gone into producing it, was that reviewing the care and protection legislation, um, that view, review would commence by 2024. Has that position now been overturned? Yes, it has. Sorry, Minister. Oh, oh I was just going to say, you know, they're... they're that are, they are questions or comments for previous ministers. Um, but what I have said to you and what I'm saying to this committee is I am determined uh, to um, continue to drive down the number of, of Aboriginal children in out-of-home care, but also to look at what legislative changes can be made as soon as possible. And that requires consultation, as I said, with the, the sector as well as key stakeholders to ensure that we're putting in um, <coughs> uh, changes that um, both the community want and ask for, but also are practical. Um so up until now, it's just been rudderless, is your understanding, in terms of the statutory review. That was all, until your statements in the last week, that had all been kicked down the road to not even commence until 2024. Is that your understanding? I can't comment on uh, previous decisions of previous ministers. All I can say is what I'm committing to you. Um, well, when you came in as Minister, did you get a briefing on what had been done to implement the Family as Culture Report? I asked for one, yes, and I've and met with what had Mr been, Thomas. All right. Well, then what had been done to implement any of the statutory reforms recommended? As I said, it's, uh, uh, there was uh, the, as Ms Thomas said, there was the 25 um, that had been looked at. I understand there had been meetings with uh, the Knowledge Circle, I'm, uh, uh, not to discuss the, the actual specific recommendations, but um, I might ask Mr Thomas, who may be aware of more details about what occurred previously. Yeah, there is, there is a planned statutory review of the care and protection legislation, the entire Act, as part of its general process of And I know of this, was kicked, this was kicked down the... They kicked the can down the road for that. Yeah, That's what they did, isn't it? Uh, they kicked uh, it down the road for that. Uh, until this recent announcement, the, the review of those recommendations had been planned to be incorporated in that general legislative review that was planned for 2024, which will still occur as part of the regular process review. What the government's now determined is to bring forward specifically consultation um, on those 25 recommendations from the FIC report to expedite the implementation of those. A a Minister, the Aboriginal Knowledge Circle, the decision to establish it happened before September 2020. Do you know when it first met? I, I, it was, I was not the minister at the time, so I wouldn't be able to comment. Anybody know? What about when it last met? Uh, again, I understand it met uh, late last year, but I, because these occurred before I became minister, I, I would have to take it on notice as to the details. Well, you see, Minister, repeatedly in your contribution in the House, and then in your response to this issue, you say how you and the department want to prioritise the Aboriginal Knowledge Circle... And I'm asking you the most basic information about when it last met, and you can't tell me. I so so how do I square your statement about prioritising the Aboriginal knowledge circle with you not being able to tell me when it last met? As I said, I understand that it met last year, but I might ask Mr Thomas... But last you know, year was long. I checked. There were sorry? at least 365 days last David. year. Um, I, 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 when I, did it meet? As I just said, I understand that it met late last year. I'm just going to clarify the date if we have that at hand. I, could, I can provide you the date on notice. It did meet three times last year. There was a meeting scheduled for it in December last year. That meeting was postponed with the ministerial changes um, that occurred and the next meeting for it was set for, is for this Friday. Well, can you, yeah. as soon as you find out when it last met, can you tell us, Mr Tom? That's yes, got to be able to be found. Yeah, absolutely. I could Surely just add you... to that. It was the 21st of September last year. Minister, it, sorry, so it, five months ago was the last time it met. The last time, 21st yep. of yep. September. And has it ever been asked to um, its opinion on the government's decision up until now to not even start reviewing the legislation until 2024? Has the Aboriginal Knowledge Circle, was it ever consulted about that decision? Uh, these are 
obviously not, um, I wasn't privy as the minister at that time, it was matters for the previous minister, but I'll ask if the department have anything to comment on in relation to the agenda. Yeah, look, my, my understanding was the government's position was published prior to the establishment of the knowledge circle, so I don't believe um, the knowledge circle was asked subsequent to that on that particular can, government position. Can you provide on notice the minutes of the knowledge circle of all the meetings of the knowledge circle? I would have to take that on notice. Yes, you'll take it on notice? Uh, I'd have to... Uh I first of all, take it on notice as to whether or not uh, the minutes are actually taken and whether or not they're available. I believe that. Well, surely minutes are taken, aren't they? I mean, yeah, yes, they are. Yeah, yeah, we can take that on notice then, yep. Um, who's on the Aboriginal Knowledge Circle? Minister. Um, Mr Thomas on the full list. Yeah, the Deputy Children's Guardian is on there. John Lee Ha, the, the um, CEO of ABSEC, is on there. Dana Delaney Thiel, who's a... A community member is on there. Neri Brown, who's another community member, is a member of the Knowledge Circle. And Shane Phillips, um, who's the CEO of the Tribal Warrior Association, is a, a member of that circle. Is the Aboriginal Legal Service invited to the Knowledge Circle? They're not members of the Knowledge Circle, no. Um, don't you think that would be sensible? Uh, what I'll say is that... Um in consultation, and as I've said to you before, it's about the knowledge circle, but also uh, speaking to key stakeholders, uh, uh, and that includes um, the legal profession, particularly the children's court. I think it's very important that any decisions uh, or any legislation that we bring forward, um, whether it's government or a crossbench or, or opposition, um, is uh, uh, they are consulted. Sorry, so your primary consultation about how and, and, and when you proceed um, with legislative changes to implement the family's culture review, you've said repeatedly was the knowledge circle, and it doesn't even include the Aboriginal Legal Service. I, how, I, how, do you, how do you not have the Aboriginal Legal Service at the table? I said to you that uh, for any legislation, any changes, consult, broad consultations required, that included the knowledge circle as well as key stakeholders, and I mentioned many times the Children's Court, uh, but it is about consulting broadly to ensure that the decisions that we make uh, have uh, have been uh, thoroughly reviewed by those that will be implementing them, but also um, those in the community. Minister, will you invite the Aboriginal Legal Service to the Knowledge Circle? As I've said, the, 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 the committee membership is already established. Uh, and Not um, asking in a capacity I'm of happy to consult membership. with them more broadly, uh, but at this stage, the, the committee um, membership no, is the answer established. Is no. The answer is no. Well, okay. No, the Minister actually hasn't finished her answer. Will you, and will you invite the Aboriginal you Legal Service to the Knowledge Circle? I've already said to you that the committee membership is established, but I'm more than happy to meet with them, along with all stakeholders, to discuss uh, the recommendations. It's a simple question, Minister, and I didn't understand your answer to address the question I put to you, will you invite the Aboriginal Legal Service to be a part of the Aboriginal Knowledge Circle? I've said that I will meet with them along with all stakeholders that are interested uh, in these recommendations. I'm going to take that as a no <coughs> because it's the only way to take your answer. Why won't you invite the Aboriginal Legal as Service? As I said to, to you, the, the committee membership is already established and any stakeholder that okay. is interested Computer in this... Computer says no. There's also the Children's Court, uh, which is extremely important... Uh, Computer says no. Uh, yes. ..in relation to any legislative reform that we make. Minister, um, um, how many children are currently in out-of-home care? I think it's 15,000... Uh, 895, which is actually the lowest number in, in the, over a decade. When was that? Uh, 30th of June 2021. No, but this is March 2022. So I'm asking you now, not about what, what it was like seven months ago, I'm asking you now how many children are in out-of-home care? The figures I have in front of me are for 30th of June 2021. You seriously came to budget estimates as the minister um, responsible for out-of-home care and the data you have on out-of-home care is seven months old. Is that, is that what you're telling me, Minister? The um, uh, information provided to me, it's, it looks at it from an annual perspective, so the information I have is, as I said, June 2021. But I can ask the department if they have a more accurate figure up to uh, this month or late last month. Um, Mr Shoebridge, I'm just trying to find out the most recent um, DCJ caseworker dashboard for the September quarter. Um, 
I might need to take it on notice. I can quickly find it, just not to waste the time in the committee and provide it. But I understand it's very stable. Um, it hasn't it hasn't changed a lot from the figure the minister quoted. But I'll quickly get it for you and um, let you you're, know. You're looking for data that is now five months old. Yeah, is there, right, is, there is a that's... yeah, that's correct. There is a ageing process that goes through the data, and that's about um, entry of documentation on onto our child story system as kids enter and exit care. And we need to be really careful with the data that we're not using what you'd probably term live data because it may not be accurate. Um, and I have some reservations about well, doing what, that. What is the most recent data that you have? And by all means, read onto the record the reservations you have, Ms. Chick. What is the most recent data you have about the number of children in out of home care? And if you tell me it's September of last year or June of last year, I won't believe you. Can you give me a couple minutes to get that and, and I'll, I can. I'll let you know? And I'll just, while I'm, while I'm asking you that and when well, you're looking at data, it's obvious that I'll be asking for the breakdown between Aboriginal, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal yep. um, and, length of, and length of stay in out of home care. Sure. And we'll come back to that. Um, Minister, um, when you last provide, when when the, your department last provided answers about the proportion of child protection money allocated to child pr protection that went into family preservation programs, the answer was sixteen percent. Um, what proportion of child protection money is now being directed into family preservation programs? Um. I don't have that exact figure in front of me, but I, if the department has that at hand, otherwise we'll take it on notice. Does the department, anybody know? I can um, talk to, I haven't got the percentage, but I've got the figures, but happy to take that on notice. So in terms of... Well, if you give me the figures, I'll do the percentage. Okay. How about that? 13.4 million for family preservation services. So that includes 2.8 million for MST CAN and FFT... Uh, casework, 2.6 million for Brighter Futures, 3.3 million to Womenda South Coast Women's Health and Welfare Aboriginal Coordination for the NAVU pilot program, 129.4 million for the Permanency Support Program, and in that 14 Aboriginal community controlled organisations plus four Aboriginal partnerships. And all those organisations also deliver the PSP Family Preservation um, Packages. Uh, there's obviously 2.41 million to New South Wales Child, Family and Community Peak Aboriginal Corporation. So that's a, as of June last year. Um, is that what's budgeted for this year? I uh, need to take that on notice. Obviously, there's quite a bit of work happening, particularly in the Family Preservation Program, and we're about to do recommissioning of the Permanency Support Program. Uh, to increase the number of um, Aboriginal controlled community Ms. organisations. Ms Campbell, my question is, is that what, was it what had been spent in the 12 months up to June of last year, or is it what has been budgeted to be spent in the 12 months from the 1st of July? Spent till June 2021. Well, well, we're here for budget estimates, so I'm asking you how much money is budgeted in the current year's budget to support families in the child protection space, and you can't answer it. Is that right? No one can answer it. I can say at a minimum it's the same as last year, um, but I'm happy Ow. to take that on notice, Mr Shoebridge. But, Minister, have you read the Tune Review? Uh, not in details, no. Have you read the Families Culture Review? Uh, parts of it, yes. Are you aware that both of those reviews, one of the core critiques about your department's expenditure is that the overwhelming bulk of the expenditure is on child removal rather than on um, supporting families and preventing families from failing and, and, and therefore preventing child removal in the first place. Are you aware that that's the underpinning thrust of both the Tune Review and the Families Culture Report? 
Mr Shibridge, the priority of uh, our government and also of myself is to uh, limit the number of children that enter out of home care, and that means providing support uh, to uh, families for children to stay where it is safe to do so. Uh, as I mentioned before, I was out yesterday meeting with caseworkers at Redfern um, to talk about the work that they're actually doing, um, and their commitment is to support um, families in, in any way they possibly can. And I'm asking ensure... you about the money, and, and it seems nobody sitting around the table has the first idea about how much is budgeted this year on that which I've got to say, in a budget estimates hearing, I find extraordinary. I've never seen this before in any department to have nobody sitting around the table who can talk about the budget allocation for this year on a key program, in this case, um, protect, um, preventing families from falling into dysfunction and kids being removed. I've never seen this before. Can you explain it? As I said, the, the, it's been said that the, the 828 million that's going into the permanent support program, they'll uh, be taken on notice. Um, Ms Campbell, you told me how much was being spent on some form of family support and how much was then spent on the removals, out of home care and case workers and the removals. I'd need to take that on notice, Mr Shoebridge. So, but you had detailed numbers for the other half of it, as at 30th of June. Are you saying you don't come with any numbers on that? But what, if you could just ref, be a bit more specific about what you're after. Well, I ask you how much was spent on preserving families and trying to keep them together, and you gave me a list of programs as at 30th of June. And now I'm asking you how much is spent on removing children, on caseworkers and out-of-home care and the removals. So in 2021, it was around 800 million. I can give, give you more exact numbers. And just so as I'm comparing apples with apples, does the 800 million include the figures that you previously put? No, it's specifically for out of home care. All right. Can you give me a more precise figure? No, I'm just fine. Mr. It. Shoebridge, I've got it in front of me if it's helpful um, just to add on to Ms. Campbell's comments. So the first question about child protection that does include the um, budget for statutory child protection caseworkers, as well as some of our programs including multi-systemic therapy and other um, programs was $756.5 million. Um, your second question about out-of-home care, so the out-of-home care and permanency support uh, program, which also includes um, some leaving and aftercare budget as well, was $1.4 billion. All right. So $756.5 million on the caseworkers, $1.4 billion on the out-of-home care space and something in the order of um, $150 million on actually trying to keep families together. Is that the number? I'm saying 164.2 on the targeted early intervention. Right. Ms Jackson? Thanks. Thanks, Mr Shoebridge. Um, I wanted to ask, um, a, what is the progress on the Premier's priority in relation to homelessness? Uh, as I've said before, the, the government is committed to reducing um, homelessness and there's a number of um, uh, initiatives that we uh, implement um, from uh, early engagement, whether it's the um, outreach, outreach um, initiatives, uh, also looking at um, uh, crisis accommodation through to permanent uh, accommodation. Um, in relation to the assertive uh, outreach activities, I can say that 9,505 um, engagements have occurred, uh, which has allowed for housing of 1,280 people, and that's up until uh, from April to December last year. Um, I actually had an opportunity to go out with the outreach um, team a couple of weeks ago, um, and one of the guys who's uh, part of the, what they call the host team um, has been doing that work for over um, eight years. And one of the key things he said, uh, and one of the challenges they have in in uh, in engaging with people who are sleeping rough is uh, quite often it can take up to 90 or 100 engagements um, to then be able to encourage them into um, crisis accommodation. From there, there is a number of um, initiatives and programs that have been put in place to uh, support them to then be able to get them into to permanent accommodation. That's good. Do you, do you... I asked, though, about the Premier's priority. Do you... 
Do you know what that is? What What is the Premier's priority in relation yes, to that? Yes, uh, to reduce uh, uh, street sleeping by 50% yes. by 2025. And so, I mean, it's quite specific for a reason, which is to try and get around the kind of, you know, just gumph that can sometimes be in this space. Are we on track? What is the progress is... in relation to that specific yeah. Premier's priority? Sorry, I, sh I should have been clear. Yes, my understanding is we are on track to, um, to reach that target uh, because of the initiatives that we've been putting in place, which is the, uh, first of all, the assertive um, outreach to engage with people um, sleeping rough, uh, but also uh, to uh, then transition them into more stable and permanent housing. Is that... So, obviously, that's good. Um, is that still, though, a Premier's priority? We've obviously had a change of Premier since the Premier's priorities were released. Is, is that still... A premier's priority in relation to homelessness. Is there a new one? Has that one changed? I'm, I'm working towards that priority. Yeah. Okay. Has the premier spoken to you ever about that priority? Um, the premier talks to me about a, a range of things, but he's also been on the record uh, talking about the need to uh, reduce homelessness. So has he ever actually said, "How are you going, new minister, as the new premier, in relation to what is now?" my priority in relation to homelessness. Has that well, I, conversation ever occurred? I actually also proactively uh, engage with the Premier, updating them across a range of things in relation to portfolio. Uh, so over the coming 12 months, there'll be uh, multiple opportunities to uh, ensure that we are tracking, but also uh, across all portfolio uh, yeah. areas to raise concerns if I feel that we're not and what needs to be done. So you've raised with him the Premier's priority in relation to homelessness? Not directly, no. And because, as I said, we're tracking at this stage, so I, I see no need to, to uh, raise anything because I haven't identified any concerns. We seem to be tracking. Could I add the specifics to, the, to those numbers? So the February 2020 street count was 1314 across the state of New South Wales, and the February 2021 count was 1141, uh, which actually last year was conducted between... February and March because of um, floods and likewise this year um, we were due to do the street count in northern New South Wales last week and for obvious reasons haven't so we're just waiting for floods to subside to complete the street count for this year. So, yeah so the 13 percent reduction so yes multiply that by four would get if, if we carried on on that trajectory we would meet the Premier's priority. Oh, that's right. So you, you... depends on this year's count. Yeah. I, so uh, the grading of the priority as on track was based on the reduction between the tw February 2020 and February 2021 numbers on the street count. Is well, that that's, right? That, if I say, is the headline. Um, there are a range of specific initiatives within the Premier's priority which we... Uh, ca carry out um, and if, if I give you an example of that we identified it, it's, it's common knowledge that people who had recent contact with a correctional system are at greater risk of sleeping rough and so in six locations across the state last year we've taken on two workers in each of those six locations to work with people as they leave corrective facilities to try to prevent them sleeping rough. And these are people who um, they come from, from the um, <coughs> Community Restorative Centre. They're recruited through yep. the Community Restorative Centre. So that's an example of, of a number of initiatives where we're actually trying to get ahead uh, and trying to get into a more preventative um, space with uh, with rough sleeping, um, but most certainly from where I sit, there's a great deal of attention on this priority, and I report in very regularly uh, to the Premier's implementation unit, who oversight all of the Premier's priorities. Yeah, I, I'm, I think we'll talk about that um, program for with corrective services this afternoon. But thanks, Mr. Beavers, um, Minister. I wanted to ask um, about the. Um, supported accommodation and homeless services in Shoalhaven, Illawarra. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you had any engagement with this service. This is a service that it was publicly reported almost lost their premises late last year and 
now have only secured a 12-month extension on their lease. Are you aware of this issue? Uh, to my knowledge, they haven't written to me, but because it was a matter that did arise um, under the previous minister, I might ask if the department has anything specific they'd like to raise in relation to this <clears throat> and what happened historically. Um, I'm not exactly sure which service you're talking about, but I do understand there was a service that... Um, needed to relocate down there uh, and I think the issue was to do with Land and Housing Corp and a particular need to redevelop that particular house but I'd need to take it on notice. I think we're talking about different services. They definitely have written to you Minister although I accept you would receive a lot of correspondence. So this is a service that is in fact in the Shoalhaven the only provider of the sort of homeless hub housing support that are people who access temporary accommodation are required to access support from. So are, are you familiar with that? As I said, I haven't, I haven't seen that correspondence, but I'm happy to take it on notice and, and look into it. Yeah, I mean, it's like, as we have heard in relation to other questions, the South Coast and Southern New South Wales experience pretty serious housing stress. This is the only service that's providing temporary accommodation, housing support in the Shoalhaven. They've got a 12-month extension on their lease, although that is going to end this year. They're actually also only available four days a week. They're not even open on Monday. So, you know, do you take on to meet with them and talk to them mm. about the limited services that they're able to provide? As I said to you, I, I haven't seen that correspondence. I will look at the correspondence, take on notice, and whatever they're requesting, I will certainly look at. So if they're looking to have a meeting, I'm more than happy to do that. But as I said, I haven't seen the correspondence. If you've got a copy, I'm happy to take that now. Um, but otherwise, I assume it's uh, been emailed through to my... Yes, I, assume. I, I have a copy electronically, but I'll see if I can get that printed yeah, no. out for you. I mean, it's just there is obviously a range of... This is one example of a range of the limited, in a way, services, the more limited services that are available in regional New South Wales, where there, in, and in particular areas, we're seeing a real explosion in the number of people who need housing support. I, I'm sure you're familiar with the stories about people who have never who, who have never experienced homelessness before. These are not long-term homeless people who are now sleeping in cars, sleeping in tents, sleeping in caravans, all of which constitute forms of homelessness, even if they're not rough sleeping. Is that something that is of concern to you, what is happening in those regional areas? Uh, there is a lot of um, support that is provided uh, across the board um, to uh, help um, people who are sleeping rough. As I said, we've got the... No, I'm not um, talking about people who are sleeping rough. I'm talking about people who have jobs often, who are, are, the housing market is so stressed that they can't find private rental, they can't access social housing because the list is just phenomenally long. In an area like Coffs Harbour, it's a 10-year wait. So that's not of a lot of use to people. So they're sleeping in cars. They're sleeping in tents. I'm talking about that cohort of people. And as I was saying, there are a range of uh, services and support um, to assist people who are sleeping rough. And, and I think when, when you say people sleeping in their cars and in tents, um, I, I count that as, as sleeping rough. Uh, so through our uh, assertive outreach, which is an opportunity to engage directly with them, um, and we have, I think it's 58 um, teams across New South Wales, which cover our regional areas as well, that go out on a regular basis. And I, I want to acknowledge the great work because a lot of them are volunteers. Um, but they will engage with them, speak to them, ask them what support's needed and linking them directly to a crisis accommodation with the long-term aim of uh, ensuring that there is um, uh, stable housing. Um, and that is provided across a range of ages, whether it's um, families or people escaping violence. There is also targeted programs for, uh, for young people, for students. So it's, it is quite broad, uh, and, uh, but it starts with being able to engage, and, and that is what's being done, particularly through our, our outreach programs. Minister, I'd just like to return to the questions, or the line of questioning I was pursuing with you earlier about the proposed taxi licensing reforms. I want to be very clear about this. You, you indicated you'd had general discussions with the Transport Minister, Mr Elliott, but have you had 
specific discussions with him about the impact of these proposed licensing changes on people with disabilities? No, sorry, I should have clarified. I I'd, 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 uh, had flagged in relation to... Uh, uh, act in relation to uh, um, being able to um, uh, people with disability accessing transport. So it wasn't in relation to this uh, specific matter. Uh, prior to today, have you been briefed by your department or indeed any other agency specifically about this issue and its impact on persons with disabilities? Uh, no, I have not. OK, so before this morning, were you aware of this being an issue in your portfolio? Uh, no, I was not. OK. Uh, now that you are aware, is it something that you will be taking up with Minister Elliott and his department? As I said before, I uh, have regular meetings with um, representatives <coughs> from all the departments to ensure that we uh, focus on uh, the disability action plan, uh, and that's across a range of areas, whether it's uh, transport or, or workforce or other things. But you would be concerned as the relevant minister, wouldn't you, if the government made changes to taxi licensing and the consequence of that is that people lost access to wheelchair accessible taxis. You'd be very concerned about that. Uh, th uh, one thing I will say, I think these are probably questions more directed at the Minister for Transport, um, because they actually do have a Transport for New South Wales Disability Inclusion Action Plan. So uh, in relation to uh, the taxi service, I suggest that that is probably best directed to um, Minister Elliott. All right. Well, um, for people who have transitioned from large residential centres to non-government uh, disability support services. Uh, is the New South Wales go government keeping track of those residents and the level of care that they're now receiving? I would need to take that on notice as uh, to um, what is, is being tracked. Uh, any of the uh, departmental officials here able to shed light on that? Um, I could add to that. Ms Campbell? Yes. Um, in terms of the transition of what the government used to provide in terms of supported independent living, that um, obviously was completed in 2018, the transfer to um, the NDIS as part of the NDIS transition. Um, we, um, obviously, there is now the National Quality and Safeguards Commission that's actually responsible for uh, ensuring um, that things are operating as they should be. Within New South Wales, we also have the Ageing Disability um, Commissioner as well, where he may receive particular complaints from participants, but generally that's managed through the National Quality and Safeguarding Commission. OK, so who is specifically in New South Wales government is charged with the responsibility of monitoring the level of care and support these people are receiving? Is it the it, no New South Wales Commissioner? Uh, no, it's really the national... Within New South Wales, um, there's specific complaint functions that the Ageing and Disability Commissioner would have, but most of it's now a Commonwealth responsibility and they monitor those services through the National Quality and Safeguards Commission. OK, so the New South Wales Government has effectively Trans no, longer, no longer has any responsibilities. Yeah. We've uh, transferred, I think it's uh, um, $3.6 billion um, across to support that particular the National Disability Insurance Scheme. OK. When were the last residents moved from the Stockton Centre? Uh, this was before my time, so I will need to ask the department oh, of course, to... this is what yeah. the departmental officials are here um, to assist. Mr Vevers. But I believe it might be a matter for uh, the Minister well, for... Housing, but Approximately 18 months ago. OK. Um, in 2013, when all of this sort of reform was underway, the former minister, John Ajaka, said, and I quote, we won't simply turn our back and say it's not our responsibility anymore, unquote. He said he gave the distinct impression that the New South Wales government would continue to have a role in at least monitoring the care provided to people who were transitioning out of state agencies into the NDIS. Minister, I think from what Ms Campbell said, that's no longer the case. The New South Wales government has simply opted out of any monitoring role. Is that correct? I, I can't comment on, on what a previous minister said. Um, the, the process of transition was incredibly carefully managed, and I can say that because I did it personally uh, with a senior team of people for every single resident of, of Stockton. Um, the process of ongoing care... Uh, is the, the the oversight of that is the Quality and Safeguards Commission uh, of the NDIS. Okay. Well, what does the, uh, the 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 New South Wales Commissioner Ms Campbell mention? What does that 
person do? Around individual complaints mm -hmm. that people may have across ageing and disability. There's obviously within New South Wales, we have funded the disability advocacy program mm -hmm. to support people um, and for them to have someone to go to if they do need systemic advocacy in terms of issues. Um, we don't have access to any of the details around um, individual NDIS participants that are New South Wales participants. But um, definitely through, particularly through the pandemic, we've worked really closely at an officer level and at a minister level to ensure um, that the NDIA and the Commonwealth Department of Social Services have the right supports in place for people with disability living in those group homes, which included uh, regular fortnightly meetings, particularly during the COVID outbreak in the first round, to ensure access to vaccinations, PPE, we had issues in a number of, of the disability group homes operated by um, through the NDIA um, where uh, staff and clients became COVID positive um, and a number of staff had to be furloughed. So New South Wales Health, the local health district, stepped in and helped um, provide the support to the residents in those group homes. So it's a very cooperative relationship between the NDIA, New South Wales and the Commonwealth Government about New South Wales NDIS participants. Okay. Uh, who's responsible for the Commissioner? Is that falls within your department, Minister? Yep. Okay. And how many complaints has the Commissioner received? I'd have to take months? that on notice. Okay. And could you uh, also specify the time frame you're looking at? In the last year. In the last year. Okay. Um, Minister, the land on which the Hunter Hunter's large residential centres once operated... Uh, are they still under the control and ownership of your department? I that believe... That the Stockton Centre, Tomary Lodge and in Canangra at Morissette. Yeah, yes, yes, they are. Um, uh, s s some, some are. Um, Canangra actually belonged to New South Wales Health. Right. And has been handed back to uh, New South Wales Health. Tom Tomary... In Stockton. T yeah, Tomary in Stockton. That's vacant and maintained by JCJ. Yeah. Okay, and what's the what's the plan for these sites, the ones that you have control of? Uh, my understanding is no decision's been made about their future um, use. A decision in relation to Tomaree was made that it would be, be made available for public and community use. Um, and Stockton, um, we have uh, engaged Property New South Wales. Uh, I, I, I should actually just double check if I may that it is property New South Wales uh, to look at the future use of that site. Okay. All right. And, um, all right, Ms Jackson, back all right. to you. Sorry, Mr Shoebridge has left. I th I th and I think the crossbench are not yet here, so I think yes, it's okay. back, back, back to you to for me. now. Uh, so I wanted to ask next, Minister, about... Um, funding for frontline services. Um, obviously, as you would be aware, um, the sort of one-off COVID funding boosts are, are about to expire or, or in fact have expired. Um, in Could relation you clarify to if you're talking about housing or homelessness or... I'm talking about... My portfolio covers a range of things from youth justice through, so just to... Yeah, I mean, yeah. specifically yeah. homelessness services, although I understand other um, DCJ-funded services also received funding boosts during COVID. Um, so my understanding is that the grants were required to be expended it's sort of either by the end of last year or I think for some of the regional areas it was it's it's February this year but in any case they're about but the requirements are that the funding that was provided through the sort of COVID one-off funding grants are about to expire um, services are incredibly stressed they're incredibly stretched they've seen considerable increases um, in a number of areas, particularly regional areas, as we were discussing, in relation to presentations. You know, has there been any consideration given to continuing some of that sort of boosted funding, at least for 2022? Uh, I might ask the department to comment um, in relation to uh, the close of finishing off of the, um, uh, the funding. Okay, so, um, so so far the New South Wales government's committed more than $950 million as part of the COVID-19 response and also the economic recovery strategy. 
Uh, it was 40 million for um, private rental subsidies, and they're still continuing. Um, 64 million for temporary accommodation. Uh, the 3 million for emergency accommodation is still continuing. Um, more than 62 million as part of some of the joint Commonwealth and state funding for domestic and family violence services. Um, Mr Vivas talked about the 122.1 million, which was actually a stimulus um, response, and that operates over till uh, I think the next tranche starts this year. Um, and so that'll be over a two-year period. There's also been some brokerage dollars for the Homelessness Youth Assistance Program of about 1.45 million, and I don't think that's all expended at this point. Um, so they're the, the key things. So some of those are still operating, but I can take on notice how much is remaining this financial yeah. year. Uh, thanks, Ms Campbell. I mean, I don't like to interrupt, but uh, it actually wasn't a question about the programs that had been announced. I appreciate that there were programs announced um, as part of sort of COVID management and economic stimulus. The question is a number of them are about to or have already expired. Partnership agreements have required the expenditure of those funds by NGOs to have already have occurred. It, and there's no additional funding available for those, for a range of those organisations. Is that something that is under consideration by you and the government? The... Um as you said, and, and as has been explained, that they were uh, additional funds provided because of the unique situation of being in a COVID pandemic. Uh, across the board, there's a range of um, support measures that are put in place um, uh, that operate outside the, the pandemic period. I mean, we've, we already know, for example, though, Minister, that a number of non-government organisations, you know, homelessness services, for example, see a considerable number of additional clients than they're funded for. So homeless services, for example, report that they see over 25% more clients than they're funded for. So it's not, the funding model is not sustainable as it is. How are you going to ensure that there isn't a massive cliff in terms of what services are available from the non-government sector? They're already stretched and their COVID boost funding is about to expire or has expired? As I said, we've, we're investing significantly uh, into preventing homelessness and breaking the cycle of disadvantage, and we're investing over $1 billion towards a range of services, uh, whether it's the link to home, enhance of uh, youth refuges, and, and we've covered off domestic um, and family violence. Uh, but... Uh, what current figures actually show is that we've supported uh, over 70,000 people who have been at uh, risk of homelessness or are homeless, which has actually been an increase over the last um, five years. I mean, there has been money that has been committed, whether it's through these programs, or through Together Home. There is demand, as you've said. There's considerable demand. The problem is Together Home finishes this year a number of those programs have either already finished or about to finish, and there's no future funding commitments. So how can you have any assurance that the level of service that has been provided, and we can argue about whether that's been adequate or not, but at least the level of service that has been provided is going to continue to be able to be provided. Um, as we mentioned before, we're in the process of, of ERC, so I'm not going to announce or comment on um, budgetary process. Could I just add, Minister, oh, sorry, yes, with Ms. the Campbell. Together Home program, it doesn't finish this year. It's in tranches, so it goes <coughs> up until, from memory, June 2024. But still, I take on board the issue that you're flagging, but um, it doesn't end this year, Together Home. Yeah, I mean, the people who received packages in tranche one, Correct. their funding Correct. finishes. And I think, as we've heard, there were over 600... Anyway, we didn't 400, get the exact figures, yeah. but hundreds of people Correct. who are on supported packages mm -hmm. for whom their funding is about to expire. Yeah, in November yeah. of this year. Um, well, let's just hope. I mean, these are... I mean, back on... Like, these are people, Minister, Together Home was a program specifically tar targeting, you know, rough sleepers, people who have had a very difficult time securing housing. And there is... I would say, quite a high risk that without a lot of support, once that funding finishes, they're going to end up back on the street. I mean, what assurances can you give us that there will not be potentially hundreds of people who are now, at this point, receiving 
supported accommodation via Together Home who are just going to be left high and dry once that funding is removed later this year. As I said, our, our government is committed to breaking the cycle of, of disadvantage, but particularly um, addressing homelessness. Um, there are a number of, and I've talked about the assertive outreach, but more importantly, that is to identify people and get them into the system so they can be supported. Yes, um, you we're do not... that and then you give them support and you're literally about to take it away and sort of... And mm. it's nice that Ms Campbell and her team are trying to talk to community housing providers, that's fine, but these people have experienced long-term homelessness, you've given them a support package and then you're just going to take it away and say good luck in the CHP market? No, as, as I've said, um, I can't comment on uh, uh, ERC process or uh, what may or may not be in the budget. If I can just add oh, to yeah. that too, we certainly won't be exiting anyone who's in the Together Home program onto the streets. And, and, you know, but if additional funding is not forthcoming... We will find ways to make sure that doesn't happen. It, the government policy, no one exits a service um, into homelessness. I wanted to ask about temporary accommodation um, and, and COVID, because obviously through the 2020 lockdown and the Delta lockdown that we had last year there was hotel accommodation provided for rough sleepers. I mean, there was nothing even close to that provided for the recent outbreak, albeit we didn't officially go into lockdown, but I think we can all accept that the Omricon outbreak was pretty substantial. Was there any <coughs> consideration given to providing specific support for people over December, January? Um, as I said, we've, uh, through... As it wasn't a lockdown, we had our assertive outreach teams out on a regular basis engaging with um, uh, people sleeping rough, uh, identifying uh, and supporting those that uh, wanted to go into uh, crisis accommodation or temporary accommodation and then into to housing. So there was a specific assertive outreach program associated with no, I, I the said, outbreak or it was just the kind of general... I, as I said, it's, it was different under, under COVID when we were in lockdown, as you said. Uh, this last outbreak, uh, we weren't in lockdown, so it was effectively business as usual, but uh, Mr Vivas may like to comment further. Was there anything different to business as usual that happened in relation to this recent outbreak? Um, so, actually, since the first outbreak, we significantly ramped up our outreach, uh, which previously was done in, in three coastal areas. We, since uh, March, April 2020, we have covered the whole state or known hotspots across the state <coughs> and we've never stopped. So we're still doing that now in terms of outreach. In terms of temporary accommodation, um, the basic approach has not changed. What has changed is instead of giving people straight off one month, um, they now always, rough sleepers always get accommodated and we work with them. And if they continue to work with us, we continue to provide temporary accommodation and that, that has not changed and it remains our absolute commitment. Uh, and what do I mean by if they work with us? So if we find a place for them in a specialist homelessness service, we'd expect <coughs> them to take it. If we get a property, we'd expect them to view it. We'd expect them to go and have a medical assessment. And, and if they engage with us, we will not put them on the streets. Why would we? Because then we'll go around and pick them up again yeah, uh, yeah. Off, off the streets. So that hasn't changed. And we have actually housed a very large number of rough sleepers since COVID. There's, there's not many upsides to COVID, but that is one of them. Uh, that it has changed the mindset of some people sleeping off and, yes, given us extra resources in the form of Together Home. Um, I, I can't predict what will happen in the Sydney street count, um, but uh, we have housed a lot of people uh, who were sleeping rough, particularly in Sydney. Mm. Minister, I just want to go back to the issue of the closure of the large residential centres. And um, Mr Vivas said it was very carefully planned and the transition uh, occurred over a long period of time. Uh, but it's quite clear, I just want to be clear, that we're not monitoring the outcomes any longer. Um, that's correct, isn't it? 
that is my understanding. Okay. Well, the I'd... outcomes are being monitored. Okay, but no, not by the state government. Yeah. But the point is, I guess, that there have been a number of reports of uh, residents, former residents, dying after they've been transferred into new care, if you like, uh, and, ha and 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 uh, people who worked in the sector had reported to previous your previous <coughs> minister, Minister Ward, that a number of those residents were dying at a, a higher rate than you would normally expect. Is that something that the department has looked at on receipt of those complaints from those so workers? I, I can tell you that we have seen no evidence that mortality is higher than would have been expected. Um, the residents of, of those large residence centres are incredibly vulnerable people and that's why we were so careful in the transition process. We had every single member of staff who knew them round a table for half a day uh, to work with the new providers to make sure that medical treatment continued, that, that support continued for them. Uh, and <coughs> it is tragically true that some residents passed away after the move, but not I've seen absolutely no evidence that that was at a greater rate okay. than existed before. OK, well, I'm not reflecting on that, but uh, nurses who had worked in the sector raised these issues in late June 2019 with Minister Ward. Uh, Minister, I know it was before your time, but what investigations did your department make of those complaints to satisfy itself that the concerns were baseless. I, I know Mr Viva's evidence, but given the state government's no longer monitoring this, how can Mr Viva's or your department be so sure about... Well, about as you matters? said, this is, um, uh, goes back to the previous minister of 2019. I think it'd be best to take it on notice um, uh, to, to actually look as it's historical. OK. Uh, is anyone from the department able to shed any light on that matter? If I... If I uh, the tibble. Cecil, um, and clearly this preceded my tenure, but my understanding <coughs> is that there has been a uh, liaison with the Public Guardian and the official community visit visitors uh, regarding the transition process, both before, during and after the move. So there has been communication. What um, I'm told, briefed here, positive feedback, but um, that is all I'm able to advise. So can I say any concerns raised by nurses during the transition, uh, there was a forum for every single person that involved the very nurses right down to the care assistants who were working with that person. This, this wasn't something that happened at a management level. It happened with the carers who knew those individuals best. <coughs> And <clears throat> that was precisely the forum that we had for every single resident of, of Stockton to allow them, <clears throat> to allow those staff to raise very detailed issues right down to the level about the sort of chair that someone wanted to live in, to, to, to sit in, so that we made sure we could transfer the chair. So there was ample, ample opportunity and we wanted to hear those concerns and they had a forum and either I or the executive director chaired every one of those meetings. Sure, but we're really talking about things that happened after the transfer. So, for example, the New South Wales Ombudsman found significant problems with the care of at least two former Stockton Centre residents who died within two weeks of moving into a nearby group home. Um, is that something that you were aware of? Um, I, I, every, every death was reported to us. I, d I don't know the individual I, I guess case. given that you're not monitoring the situation, they've been now transferred out of state care, what information <coughs> is the State Department getting to have visibility of these issues, or has, has the State just washed its hands of these people? No, they haven't. As part of the transition, um, the deaths and critical incidents are reported, have to be reported to the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think, and I, we can take it on notice, as Mr Beavers said, I think that Ombudsman report happened at the time when the Ombudsman had those particular powers yes. in New South Wales, yes. and it happened before the full transition to the NDIS scheme, is mm. my understanding. And the Quality and Care Commission, uh, are you getting feedback from that body about what's happening in New South Wales so that you can at least still be appraised of 
what's um, actually happening in not practice? Not on individual things, but we'd obviously see any of the kind of reports that the NDIS Commission put out. OK. Uh, Minister, there was a Premier's priority to increase public sector employment of persons with disabilities to 5.6%. Does that remain in place? Uh, yes, I, uh, as I said previously, I, I'm, I do have a regular meeting uh, with representatives from the department to look at implementation of the disability action plans. OK. Uh, so last year when we, I asked the former minister about this, he said, quote, I have a plan in my head, it's not a written plan, unquote. Uh, is there a written plan now to tackle this issue, given that in 2014 it was 3% in the public sector it's sort of gone back to 2.5% and your target's 5.6%, but you're moving in entirely the wrong direction. So do you have a written plan? Um, I actually, as I said, I, I have a regular meeting and the last meeting was actually um, uh, raised at that, that meeting uh, and I will continue to, to, to focus in on it unless the department has something specific to comment on. Yeah, I'm happy to just comment on that. So the, obviously that priority is led by the Public Service Commission yep. and in 2017 the government launched a Jobs for People with disability, a plan for the New South Wales public sector, which as you indicated to ensure that 5.6% of govern, government sector roles are held by people with disability. Um, from April 2019 till uh, September 2020, um, the Public Service Commission led the work to deliver the Jobs for People with Disability program to meet the Premier's priority. I won't go through all those, but happy to provide more detail. Um, there's obviously the New South Wales Disability Inclusion <coughs> Act, which aims to promote independence and social and economic inclusion of people with disability. Um, and there's obviously a plan in place in, in relation to that. Uh, obviously, within the Department of Communities and Justice, we're increased, looking at the uh, employment participation for people with a disability as a priority. I could go through a list of the initiatives. No, if you could ta table those. I'm, I'm just interested as to what, Minister, you're going to do at a practical level to actually change the direction. I mean, a lot of activity has gone into this over a long period of time, but as I said, since 2014, uh, public sector employment for people with disabilities has gone into reverse, and all of this activity and all of these plans and all of these initiatives hasn't changed that momentum. What will you do that's new that will change this? Well, I'll be uh, raising it directly at the, the our next meeting. As I said, I'm, I did raise it uh, and flagged that it's an area that I want to um, uh, get regular updates on. Okay. What is the percentage of persons with disabilities working in DCJ? I'd have to take that on notice. I, I have that information available, Mr Searle. Um, so in 2021, and in 2021 is the second year, we've actually compiled workforce data, including disability, and it was 3.2% of staff had a disability. It was a 0.1% decrease from 1920. OK. So again, a decrease, but perhaps less than elsewhere. OK. <coughs> Mr Shoebridge, I think it's your time. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Sorry to interrupt, Chair, but uh, uh, Ms Chekhax actually has an update in relation to uh, the figures you asked about. Yeah. Oh, you've predicted it... my first question, Ms Chek. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Mr Shoebridge. Um, so the most recent data we have is the 31st of December 2021. On that date, there were 15,515 children in out-of-home care. Of that 15,515, there were 6,783 Aboriginal children, which equates to 44%. Uh, that is 380 less children overall as compared to the end of September 21, and they were those earlier figures um, we provided, which I think from mm -hmm. memory was 15,895. Um, and there has been a small <coughs> reduction um, in the number of Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. Um, I, I say small because it was uh, 46 children less. So in September it was 6829 and uh, at 31 December it's 6783. Yeah. You also asked a question about the length of time children are in care. Now, this is information we do um, collate annually and we collate it at the point of exit. And we can absolutely provide the committee with a full breakdown, but just briefly, um, we had in 2021, and that is the most recent annual capture, we had uh, two 557 children exit out of home care. Of that 2557, 1273, uh, so 50% had been in care for five years or more, 
and then an Aboriginal breakdown, similar, but 51%, so 1520, more than five years for Aboriginal children. But we can provide a much more oh. detailed breakdown for you, Mr Shoebridge, if that's helpful. That would be helpful. Let me just check. Do you know how many of the 2,557 who exited care aged out of care? How many um, of them My understanding is that doesn't include those children that aged out. Oh, sorry. Can I take that on notice just to double check that? All right, because of the... I was. I will in a second ask you questions about children ageing out of care yeah, and sure. a series of questions that follow from that. But I'll come back to that in a sec, Ms. Jack. Yeah, I'll clarify that point for you just to make sure. Thanks I'm not for those numbers. You I They're have. helpful, um, Mr. O'Reilly. Um, um, how many children aged ten to thirteen were held in detention last year? In twenty twenty one, there were. Um, 138 young people under 14 in custody. They're all on remand. All on remand. Yes. Um, and um, uh, and how many children aged 14 to um, 17? How many young people aged 14 to 17? Um, I don't know exactly, um, but 24% of our uh, people in custody. Uh, over 18 or 18 and over, and that's very consistent, that rate. Right. Um, well, can you provide me on notice that breakdown, if you can, by year? Yeah. For last year, you've given me the numbers for... Do you know how many children were aged 10 that were held in detention last year? Aged 10. Hmm. Zero. And... Um, oh, hang on. If I could just correct that. Um, the figure I have is uh, children aged under 12 for the whole year uh, was six. So... Six, ten, and or eleven-year-olds. Yeah. Yep. Um, um, do you know what proportion of those 138 children aged 10, 11, 12, and 13 um, in detention were Aboriginal? No. Can you provide that on notice? We can certainly provide that. Um, can you tell me what the average length of stay, well, detention, I suppose, is the proper word, what the average length of detention for those very young children were? And I'm talking the same, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah, the breakdown by each year. If 10, you could, 11, yes. Yeah, you can do that. Um, Mr O'Reilly, if not raising the age of criminal responsibility, um, how else are you going to meet the closing the gap target to reduce the number of those Aboriginal children in detention by 30%? Um, the number of children in detention overall has reduced and the number of ch Aboriginal children in detention has reduced and we are currently at the target. So the challenge is to maintain and improve further. Um, well, you only met... The, you agree, so are you saying New South Wales agreed to closing the gap targets <laughs> last year that had no stretch in them, that they'd already met them? Oh, well, it but was, for it, juvenile, for, for youth detention. It's justice. It was close. It was close, yes. But, the, but there is significant momentum amongst police, youth command, children's court, youth justice, education, uh, to prioritise this work. Yeah. Is it right? How many children are in detention from the most recent numbers? I mean, you, you probably got a, some figures as at last night or this morning. How many children are in detention? Yeah, the, the numbers last night were 176. And of those 176, how many were First Nations? 74. Did you, had you worked out the percentage? The percentage is 43, I believe, 44. Uh, are, you, are you saying that having 43, 44% of the kids in detention being First Nations meets the closing the gap targets? No. The closing the gap target is uh, a numerical target, <coughs> not a percentage target. We are completely dissatisfied with a percentage of 43-44%. Absolutely. Um, now, Ms O'Reilly, I, I want to be clear for the record. The work that's been done over the last few years, particularly on bail, um, and reducing the number of children in custody, has been very successful in New South Wales. But what hasn't been successful is the continuing rise or stubborn maintenance of the proportion of kids who are First Nations. Um, so, so what are your strategies to reduce that figure? Um, there's two parts to the strategies. 
part of it is what is the part of this work that is our mandate and our control where we had the levers, and I can talk about that at length. And then there are I'll parts. do that this afternoon. Okay. Yep. The other part is the bit that is a shared responsibility across the community and government because youth justice is a responder uh, and our mandate uh, is determined in the legislation <coughs> and our controls are determined by the decisions of police and courts. That's where our mandate lies. So inside that mandate we have a number of strategies but we need to work with those other parties. It's not, it's not adequate for us to say it's no, up to I them. Get it. We need to work with them, so we right. do. Well, we might come back this afternoon and talk about some of the programs on recidivism and the like. Um, Ms Jack, did you get those numbers? I did. So um, your question was whether the 2557 included exits from care as well as other permanency exits. Uh, Aging out of care, yep. Yeah, yeah that's right. So um, the answer is yes, they do. And so how many children aged out of care last year? Um, last year, they haven't given me those numbers, but um, we can work it out, actually, because um, it's it's around the 800 mark from memory. I can get that figure as well. well we might come back to the precise figure this afternoon. Yeah, sure, we can do that. Minister, are you aware that the previous MOU with Legal Aid, where there was the appointment of guardians ad litem, has basically been torn up and not operating for children who are exiting care since DCJ was put in place. Are you uh, aware of that? Yes, you have actually. We met um, and we spoke about that briefly. Yes, I told you. But have you um, have you um, spoken with your department about it and worked out how you're going to live up to the statutory responsible to responsibility to provide kids leaving care, young adults leaving care, with the legal support they need? So first, I, I just want to exp uh, go through the process, and this afternoon I'm sure the department will be able to elaborate further. But obviously, as soon as a, a, a child, um, uh, I think, it's reaches age 15, there's, they're looking at the exit plan. In relation to that, um, the child uh, is... Well, every child is referred um, to the legal service within the department, uh, where it is identified uh, if there are and uh, any claims that may need to be made. Um, I'm advised that last year there were 44 uh, children uh, identified as having possible claims. Uh, if there is a, a claim identified, then the child is referred uh, to the New South Wales Law Society to obtain legal advice. So every child that exits out of home care uh, is provided uh, legal support uh, by the department. All right. Well, we'll come back and ask for some more data about that. Um, but 44 <coughs> out of more than 800 kids got referred off to the Law Society once they exited care? Because they were identified they, they needed to. Otherwise, every other every child is given legal advice uh, on exiting. It's part of their plan. Uh, and then if it's required uh, to take further, it goes to the Law Society. Um, Minister, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Um, I think the, the balance of the witnesses we'll see again um, this afternoon at 2, two o'clock. Um, and have a dry lunch. Thank you. General advice to people. Or not to drive. Last one really good. The witness follows a problem. It's going to be a fun afternoon. All right. Yep. So let's get Tara down here at 2. Yes, I'll get Tara at 2. And then we've got another round. Another round. Another round. Yeah, yeah that's all yeah. good.
Welcome to the afternoon's hearing of the Budget Estimates Inquiry into the Department of Communities and Justice, Families, Communities and Disability Service Sector. To start the afternoon session, I'll hand over to the Opposition, Ms Moriarty. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I'm just going to follow up on, I think, some questions that uh, were had been begun by my colleague uh, before the lunch break, just in terms of work that's being done on the closing the gap targets. Um, you did indicate you'd expand on that. Can I invite you to do that now? What is What kind of work are you doing? Sure. Um, the work that we're doing in youth justice is focusing on um, our Aboriginal strategic plan. And one of the cornerstones of that is staffing, making sure that we have uh, Aboriginal staff who are empowered to do the work they, the way they need to do it. Last year, we undertook a casework, a review of our casework model. And that casework review um, has validated the work of Aboriginal caseworkers and given them the proper authority to do culturally led casework, which is really important in terms of preventing reoffending and making sure that young people under supervision can work through those adolescent issues around identity, get cultural support to do that, um, and then access the interventions in relation to offending in an appropriate way. Um, that's good for those young people, but it also is great for staff because those staff come to work with us because they want to work in a particular way and they need support and authority to do that. Uh, that's one of the, the key things. We also have particular programs that have been designed over the years, drawing on the evidence base that put culture at the centre of intervention. So they're used in custody and in our community setting as well. Uh, and sometimes in those programs we draw on the resources of the community as well. Um, but they are led by Aboriginal staff focused on Aboriginal young people. <coughs> and so what's working at the moment? So what, what, was the, what is the current percentage? Uh, you, think that you said this morning there were 176, if I'm mem remembering correctly. Yeah, 74 young people in custody. 74, so what, is, what percentage is that? 44%. 44%. And so um, since you've been uh, doing these programs, how has that worked or how is that dealing, how is that affecting those figures? Um, it has some impact on the figures, but one of the, one of the points I would make is that the numbers have dropped significantly to the point where the, the number of people in the system now is, very, is small and it's difficult to have ongoing big impact on those numbers in a short period of time on a percentage basis when the number is that small. Uh, so it's quite challenging. Um, the reoffending rates um, are improving gradually as well. And so that means that most of those young people won't come back to custody. <clears throat> but um, as I said before the break, um, a percentage of 40-something percent, whether it's 44 or 43, is completely unsatisfactory, um, even though the numbers are down, and that's fantastic, and that's what, exactly what we'd seek to achieve. Um, nobody in our system is happy or satisfied with those percentages. We recognise also that we need to work with other agencies who have other levers to impact on those percentages. So we work very closely with police, with the Children's Court, uh, with education, to work out where there are opportunities to change decision points <coughs> before they come to us. We are at the response end of a situation. Um, but it's not about saying that's their problem, it's really about working alongside them and working out how we can collaborate on that. One good example <coughs> would be high schools where um, schools put in place um, behaviour support plans for young people so they don't, don't get excluded from school. Um, there are some situations where we should be part of those conversations because we can provide support for those plans to make them more robust. But Mr O'Reilly, you said that there was no stretch target for reducing the number of Aboriginal kids in detention. That, that seems to me a big missing point. If you haven't that got a stretch target... That wasn't my expression, um, but, but I certainly accept that the target um, has been reached from a numerical perspective. Um, but we are absolutely committed to... The percentage of young people in custody who are Aboriginal should be reflective of the population. Yeah. That's where it should be. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we're aiming for, and everybody working in the system is aiming for that. Mr yeah. Thomas? Can I just clarify the target? Because it's, it's, um, the target was set nationally through that closing the gap process on a baseline nationally that was set from the year 2019, and it's expressed as a rate per... 10,000. So the, the closing the gap target as published as signed up by governments is a reduction um, in that rate by 30%. And so the rate um, as it equates in numbers in New South Wales is about 90 kids in detention. 
And as Paul, as Mr O'Reilly said, that number's actually lower than that now. It was higher than that when the rate was set, but it wasn't much higher than that. The progressive decline of kids in um, youth justice over the last probably seven years has seen a massive drop in both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal kids. The proportion has slightly changed. It was 51% a while ago. It's 40% now, but as Paul said, it's just way too high. <clears throat> but you've kind of got a concentrated number of more serious yeah. young people in detention that's making it harder to shift that, but we still need to throw everything but the kitchen sink at getting that number down further. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I butted in, Tara. No, no, that's fine. That's a good question. So in terms of just following up on, on um, one of those comments that you just made, what is the most common reason now or over the last 12 months that young people are in detention? Do you mean in terms of the crime that they've committed or the kind of... The... Be in general terms. Yeah. Um, the offences are... in violent crimes, robberies, like what's the... I can, I can respond to you. <clears throat> C- certainly, there are over a million teenagers in New South Wales and there are um, 176 of them in custody and only 40 or so of them are sentenced to be in custody. I think that tells us a lot about who's in custody and why they're in custody. They're in custody because of the level of seriousness of their offending and the court's view that that's where they need to be for a while. And, yeah, that's, and that's, I'm not testing that. I'm just interested to know what are the statistics, what are, what are the reasons that people are in? Yeah, it's about violent crime. It's, it's about repeated violent crime and it's about the level of complexity in addressing that. So we have significant interventions. But the other thing I would say is that the, that level of crime comes with lifelong trauma and being victims of crime as well. And it's very complex to unravel that. And I think that the, the change in the population shows that the system has become quite effective at diverting young people. I can give you some data on diversions if you like, but the diversion rate has increased dramatically so that the ones that we are left with uh, are more complex. And a graph we often use to describe this has the numbers going down and the complexity, which is measured scientifically, going up at the same time. That, yeah. that tells us who we've got. Yeah. It's not so much a single crime type, with the exception, with the exception of, say, homicide kind of offences. It's not so much the single offence that's sending kids into detention, it's the accumulation of a criminal history and kind of a longer-term involvement in all aspects of the criminal justice system. True. Yeah, which is the reason I'm asking the question, right? So uh, the, the follow-up question to that is, OK, so for young people who are under the age of 14, what, what's the reason, not specifically for the ones who are in there, but w- what would generally be a reason that people would be in detention at that point? People under 14 are generally almost almost exclusively and certainly in recent times in custody on remand. That's the first thing that I would say about people under, under 14. And they're usually in custody on remand because they've been arrested following a violent incident, quite often in the company of others. That's quite often the case. Um, the numbers are very small. To go into more detailed examples risks exposing people's identity because the numbers are very small. But that's really the nature of it. And and the courts, I think the courts and police, I can't speak for them, but my observations as a professional in this sector is that they (coughs) absolutely appreciate the impact of early contact with the justice system on the trajectory of the person, and they will do everything possible to avoid refusing bail for young people, uh, particularly that young. But there are some cases where they make a decision to refuse bail. Yeah, but, uh, but sometimes, as we've heard in other inquiries, that's because there aren't alternative places for those young... I get that the number is small, but it doesn't matter. There shouldn't be any. Um, and uh, bail is one thing. Um, the, the detail of the crime is another, but alternatives for people before that mm. age um, is a whole other. So what work is being done on yeah, There's that? a lot of work being done. Um, the, the increase in diversion rates shows that Caseworkers are able to put together case plans for most young people, especially under 14. Um, one of the bits of evidence I provided this morning was that the rate of people, the number of people who are in custody for accommodation reasons is extremely small. 3.8% of all admissions annually and zero currently. Um, I, I think it could be a distraction to, to focus on that as the reason why people under 14 are in custody. I, th- I think it's such a small number and usually zero for that particular section of the cohort. Uh, it is usually to do with the seriousness and complexity of the incident that has led to their arrest. That's the decision the court makes. Sure. Um, have you got any statistics on recidivism? Or yes. T- I'm happy for you to take that on notice if you don't have it. But yeah, what's... yeah, we've got some, absolutely. Um, the We have uh, a range of targets, I guess, around uh, 
reoffending and reduction in reoffending. If you just give me a moment, I can give you some. Um, reoffending rates for young people who have completed a youth justice conference over the last three years consistently have been reducing by 3% each year. Um, for custody, it has been similar, about 3, 3.1% each year. For community supervision, it's fairly stable, um, but we did see an increase in the last year of 2% for young people who've completed supervision, community supervision in re relation to reoffending. But the other two categories uh, are gradually decreasing. Right, um, and you mentioned, I've forgotten the numbers, I'm sorry, you can remind me, but the uh, cohort of people who are over the age of 18 who are still in your system, I don't want any specific details about the people involved, but what's the, in the 20s, I think, the percentage? 24% of people so is in that, custody. Are they uh, almost finishing their sentence? Are they on remand? Are they moving? What's the process? What's the plan for those Yeah, people? so the, the, the Children's Detention Centre Act has specific provisions for people aged over 18 on the on the belief, and the evidence base supports this, that their rehabilitation chances are much greater if they stay in the youth justice system. And so they, they are provided with that, um, and most of them exit custody before they reach 21, which is the lim upper limit for us. A very small number graduate to adult custody because they have longer sentences. Uh, and any, uh, can you give us some information on um length of stay, so particularly for remand, in, mm. you can break it down by age group if you want, but also right. sentence. Yeah. Um, there has been some shifts in the length of stay, and I can't give it to you by age, but I can give you a bit of information on trend, if you bear with me for a moment. Um, from 1920 to 2021, there was a decrease uh, in the length of stay and remand from 27 days to, uh, sorry, 27% decrease from 16 days to 12 days on the average remand stay. And for control orders, there was a 15% increase in the length of stay from 109 days to 126 days. <coughs> To 126. Um, okay, and so I touched on this earlier um, with both you and the Minister, but the last two years, mostly well, big chunks of lockdown periods, we've all been operating in different circumstances. Sure. What impact has that had separately to the programs that you're running? What, are there any things um, that have worked during that period that we've done differently, that you've done differently, that we should continue to do to keep people out of detention? Um, to keep people out of detention? Um, our community supervision work continued through the shutdown uh, and we, we used technology a lot more for our casework with young people in the community. Uh, young people cope with a shift to technology more effectively than older people, generally speaking, so it worked quite well for us. But it wasn't the perfect solution for everybody. There are some young people who really need face-to-face -face contact um, and there are some who are fine with less of that. But we certainly learned a lot about where it works really well, and we'll certainly continue to expand that in the community. Okay. Right. My turn. Your turn. Right. Thank you. Yeah, six minutes and forty-three seconds, Mr. No. Jackson. Okay. Um, sorry, I might just start off um, just again, Mr. Vivers, just to follow up, just on the. Um, provision of emergency and temporary accommodation for the flood. So I just sort of wanted to get a little bit more detail. You're working with Resilience New South Wales on that. So are they the lead agency? How's that like dynamic working? Because yes. I'm sure that you can understand we don't want people getting caught in kind of bureaucratic, <laughs> you know, processes when they just... I think I, I, I hope I can say with confidence that no individual gets caught. Uh, the, the actual arrangement is... Um, what's called the functional area, so there's like a functional area for transport, etc., etc. The functional area for disaster welfare is Resilience New South Wales, and we operate on a service level agreement, so a bit like a service provider to uh, Resilience New South Wales. But what happens in actual practice is that the local emergency services contact the local DCJ person and trigger setting up evacuation centres and trigger a direct link to our 24-7 um, accommodation line <coughs> who then source the accommodation. And I'm in touch, um, you know, from sort of 
five or six o'clock in the morning till goodness knows what time of night with resilience, making sure that we're working in sync. And the funding for for the you know actual accommodation, does that come from DCJ or is that from Resilience New South Wales? It's from Resilience and they in turn recoup that from Treasury and the Commonwealth. And just to be clear, I mean, I know you touched on this earlier, to the extent that people are either uninsured or potentially underinsured, sort of no individual will be out of pocket for accommodation while, you know, during a period in which they're unable to stay in their inundated home or how much sort of, you know, funding is available at the individual level? So the, the funding to assist people who are uninsured to get their homes back in place is a resilience budget, and, and I wouldn't yep. presume to comment on that. Um, I can't say that people wouldn't sometimes be out of pocket. They, temporary accommodation during disaster welfare is not income assessed. Yeah. It's if you need yeah. it, you'll You don't have it. anywhere else to stay. Yeah. Yes. Mm. <clears throat> um, so in that sense, people won't be out of pocket, but obviously at some stage, people have to leave a hotel uh, and there may be a point at which they leave the hotel and they have to fund accommodation while their property is being done and, up. You know, I, I know that we're in the early stages here, but you know, what kind of length of stay? I mean, when you say at some stage people wouldn't need to leave our hotel, that's presumably because, you know, DCJ and Resilience New South Wales will say, look, you know, we're not able to provide you this accommodation anymore. You need to make other arrangements. How long a period of time um, are you able to support people to stay in, you know, hotel so accommodation? It, it it does depend. The floods that took place at about this time last year, we had some people in for a month or longer, and I think the longest was probably about three months. I have to say that was a quite exceptional circumstance with a family with children with disabilities. Um, but um, it, what I'm setting up now, what we're setting up now, uh, is a case assessment process that will start from tomorrow for people who there's about 150 people currently in temporary accommodation from the floods uh, and there'll be a lot more I should think uh, in the coming days we then start to work with those people find out what exactly is your situation are you insured uninsured what options have you got can you go to family um, and we work that through and then what happened this time last year some people did go to family and the loving care of family sometimes doesn't quite extend for prolonged periods of time and so the thing falls apart and then we'll take them back again. And so just you know for example using the experience of last year as you know a sort of this is obviously a uh, you know at a different magnitude but nonetheless um, do you have any figures that you can provide on people who were exited from temporary emergency accommodation into accommodation that they were required to pay for themselves? How many people were in that category last time? Well, ultimately, everybody is, okay. in, is in that category. Uh, I should rephrase that question. Um, exited from supported temporary accommodation that sort of DCJ was pay paying for into other short-term hotel or motel accommodation that they had to pay for. I, I can only say everybody does eventually have to move to accommodation that they pay for. Uh, and, and what we do is work with them to try and find some of that accommodation. Last year, especially around um, sort of Nepean, we had a number of people who'd lived in caravan parks and those caravan parks were kind of put largely out of action. And then we'd work with them to find something similar um, which then they would pay for. Of course, they would get Commonwealth rent assistance for that. Mm. I mean, yes, but, I mean, as you know, Commonwealth rent assistance is not a substantial amount. It's not a reflection on you. It's a Commonwealth payment. Uh, um, but you sort of get... You see the point. You know, these, these communities around Lismore and Ballina are not wealthy no, communities. Not. And, yes, to the extent that people have insurance, as you say, they will be able to move into accommodation that is paid for by insurance... But I am obviously pursuing a line of questioning here that is about the people who are really going to struggle if 
they're uninsured and they're trying to get into the private rental market, for example, they cannot go back to their homes because their homes are very damaged. It, what, like, what provisions are you making to ensure that those people aren't, for example, living in sort of tents or cars for extended periods yeah, of time? Yeah, we absolutely would not want that yeah. uh, to, to, to be the case, well, un unless they chose to, but not many people choose mm. to do that. Um, so we would work with them to find accommodation. So last year we ended up with, I think, five or six people who were really, really struggling to, to find something that they wanted. Uh, and we did end up funding a relocation for some of those people to areas, or actually resilience paid for it, mm. but we funded a relocation to help them move to somewhere uh, where there was a bigger supply. Uh, That's of the sort of casino Newcastle um, it, situations it that you mentioned, yes. yeah. Yes. I think my time is up. We might come back to it. Thank you. Um. In, in terms of the 44 files of children leaving care that were referred to the Law Society because there, there had been identified a potential claim, um, are you aware that the Law Society then just farmed them out to general practitioners and they didn't go to accredited specialists? Sorry, Mr Shubridge, could you just repeat that last thing? Aware second? that the Law Society then just farmed those matters out to general practitioners... Um, and they didn't go to accredited specialists or firms that had experience in abuse and particularly child abuse matters? I, I wasn't aware of that, Mr Shoebridge, but I'm more than happy to follow that up and come back to the committee with a response. It, it, that is my understanding of what has happened. And I think you'd agree that if you're dealing with vulnerable young adults, 18, 19-year-old young adults, the idea that they would simply be referred to um, uh, generalist solicitors without expertise in abuse cases is, is letting those um, young adults down. I think we'd agree with that. I, I would certainly hope that um, those matters are considered by someone who has a level of ex experience and expertise um, in order to process those claims. I will take it on notice to um, we, clarify... Yeah. And, um, that that particular question. And and in the event you confirm the information that's been provided to my office from highly credible sources, will you undertake to revisit those matters that have gone through that process to ensure that those young people get access to specialised um, legal advice to assist them? We can certainly look at the, the options and, like I said, need to understand the current state um, of um, play in regards to that, but certainly can have a look at that. Um, could I ask you why the previous guardians, guardian, guardian ad litem structure was disassembled? I have had some discussions... Need to be closer to the mic. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Schubert. <laughs> um, Mr Schubert, we've had some discussions about this over lunch and clearly... Um, I have a lot to learn, and heavy is the head that wears the crown. I, yes. um, we need to uh, make inquiry about that. I, I, we honestly don't know um, is the answer at this point, um, but happy to take it on notice and report back. I think one of the most critical things to do initially, Ms Zibble, is to find out what's happening right now. Yep. and ensure that if there are cases being referred, they go to accredited specialists, or at least firms that have acknowledged specialty in the, in the space. Um, and I understand you'll take that issue on notice. I yeah. am able to follow that up, yes. yes. And then if you could provide on notice the number of cases that were being referred annually in the three, years, the three final years of the arrangements leading up to 2019. We can do that. And the numbers that have been referred since. Yep. Yes. Um, the, um, and, and if you could, could you also provide what the current arrangements are? Of course. Yeah. I have to say, I find it extraordinary that of some 800 to 900 children leaving care, that only 40, I think 44 matters were referred as having a potential case in relation to abuse 
those numbers don't seem to make sense, knowing the history of what's happened to children in care to me. Mr Shoebridge, could I um, just spend a, f a minute or two just explaining the process, because that 44 is one part of the process, it's not the entire process, and I think it might be helpful to the committee. By all means, Mr So um, we've got very clear policies and procedures around leaving care, including... Uh, the assessment of any criminal matters that may lead to um, a potential claim for compensation. And our caseworkers, both in DCJ and NGOs, are responsible from age 15 of referring um, children, all children, um, at that age across to our legal services team for what we call an audit. So legal services will conduct an audit of every single child that has turned 15. They also conduct audits on top of the children leaving care or, or, or at 15 on those children who have exited care for another reason, being restoration, guardianship and open adoption. So there's two, two components. Last uh, financial year, so 2021, there were 801 children who exited care because they were 17. Um, we had um, 1,089 referrals from caseworkers across to um, our legal services team. And of those 1,089 uh, referrals, as you mentioned, there were 44 children referred to the New South Wales Law Society. We've seen year on year, and we can provide these figures, a 25% increase in the number of referrals going to audit, which is positive. Um, but you raise a good question, and it was a question that I had yesterday, um, and it's whether, and I don't want to question the capability of our legal services by any stretch of the imagination, but is that figure where it needs to be, the 44 versus the 1089? So I think we've got some work to do there, and we can come back to the committee um, with a further uh, response to that question. And, and if, if you are giving those figures that for the three years before the change yeah, of course. the three years post the change, could you include the referrals or yeah, whatever the of equivalent course. of referrals is before the yeah, system? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, Ms Tibble, you'd accept that there are concerns about conflict of interest where the department's own legal team yep. basically determines whether or not a case could be made against the department or the people they contract with. Yes. And are you aware of what, if any, arrangements are in place to ensure that conflict of interest is addressed because it was previously addressed through the Guardian ad litem arrangements. I, Mr Shoebridge, acknowledge the issue uh, and I do not have the answer here now, but it is, a, it is a, a, an inquiry that I certainly will make and about which I will satisfy myself and advise the committee. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, do we know how many claims have been made against the department um, in the last, well, in the last calendar year, or if you have it by financial year, in the last financial year, in relation to um, compensation for breach of duty in care? Um, not, not numbers on claims, but we can certainly take that on notice and provide further information to the committee. What we do know for last financial year was 2.9% of children in statutory out-of-home care had a substantiation of abuse by a caregiver. Um, now, a caregiver can include a foster parent, a relative or kin carer, or a residential care worker. And each of those matters are also audited to <coughs> assess um, the um, uh, eligibility for um, a claim. All right. So I'm trying to work out how... Um, I'm trying to work out how if there are 15,500 kids in out-of-home care and 2.9% um, of the kids in care had a substantiated instance of abuse, how only 44 matters were referred to external lawyers for compensation. Because when I just did the maths... And 2.9% of 15,515 is substantially more than 44. Yes, so they'll be at varying points in the process of auditing, auditing their files and the circumstances um, regarding those allegations and subsequent substantiation. I'm happy to provide the committee with further information about the status Ms. of Ms. those. Ms Check, I assume that they're different, you know, in any given year, 
of the cohort of historical claims of abuse. Mm. They'll all be at different stages about whether they're able to be referred off. Yep. But I doubt that last year is remarkably different to previous years in terms of the substantiated um, instances of abuse. It may be slightly more, it may be slightly less. Yeah, true. But we're talking 450 kids at 2.9% and only 44 referrals. Yeah, like I said, I'd have to come 10%. back with... Yeah, certainly I'll have to come back with further detail on that 2.9% um, and happy to do that, to provide that to the committee in terms of where they're up to in, in the audit process. But then we have the same claims from last year and the same claims from the year before and the same claims... And historically, if you've got 2.9% of cases having substantiated complaints, historically, you've still only got 44 being referred out in this year, which covers those historical claims as well. So... Anyhow, you'll come back on yeah, notice about how like to square said, those it, two it's, figures. It's absolutely a reasonable question to ask and, and something, like I said, I'm, I'm worried about. So we're, we're looking into it oh. and we'll provide the committee with further information. Because I, I want children in out-of-home care, A, to be free from abuse, but also where they have been subjected to a criminal act that they're in receipt of, um, in particular, compensation but support. And of those 2.9%, can you, can you give us the, the exact number on notice and how many of them were complaints about care while with an NGO and how many were the complaints about care with the department? Of course, we can take that on notice. Um, did you say there were eight... I, I think I, I remember correctly, 801 children who aged out of care turned 18? Yeah, so um, just to be clear, so obviously 17-year-olds that turn 18, 801 yes. for financial year 2020-21. Yep. Um, it's a pretty brutal 18th birthday present, isn't it, being thrown out of your foster parent, out of your foster care home? But do we know how many young people, when they turned 18 got thrown out of their foster home? I might get my colleague, um, Miss Campbell, to respond to this question, but we do know that children are not necessarily thrown out of foster homes. Many children actually stay with either their real kin carer, relative kin carer, or foster carers. And I know there's been some work in Miss Campbell's area around this issue, so I might ask her to follow on from me, if that's OK. And just in terms, you asked the question around numbers. I might need to take that on notice it, to see if we do have that breakdown of data about where kids that did leave out of home care and didn't remain within their foster care placement or residential placement moved to. Well, their foster care placement ends, doesn't it? Um, Happy birthday, foster care placement not, not ended. Not for all. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. Some children and young people, particularly if they're still... At school, we can we have discretion to um, continue to make that uh, foster care payment if they're over 18. For 10 weeks? Yep. But again, it, it would depend on the individual circumstances. There are leaving care um, payments and aftercare services where we can provide additional funding for education, financial support. Uh, we also have a program called the Premier's Youth Initiative which targets young um, okay. people leaving out of home care, which provides accommodation and wraparound supports to enable to young people to continue education or move into um, employment options. Can you, can you provide on notice what the total collective financial contrib um, contribution was to kids um, in their first year having left care and then to the number of kids that was provided to? OK, I can take that on notice. Um, and can you tell me, do you know how many kids left care into homelessness? Um, we're hoping that no child left care into Not, homelessness, but that wasn't we my can question, look though. at the data um, sure and come back to you on notice. Secret Ms. Ms. Tibble, I would have thought that the department would track kids once they leave care know the number of kids who are potentially in, going into homelessness and know the number of kids who went into homelessness. Um, d do you think that should be a priority from the department to make sure that it when kids turn 18, they don't have their support cut off and, they, and happy would, birthday, find a new home? It would be unacceptable to me that anybody was leaving care and moving into homelessness uh, and that is the position of the department, uh, but the evidence, we need to adduce the evidence um, 
And if there is a problem, um, crystallise it and deal with it. Yeah, and we certainly provide follow-up support up to the age of 25 years um, for children and young people who leave care. We fund a whole range, as you're aware, of services to provide those supports to well, young people to well, ensure that they don't move into um, homelessness. All right. Well, there's about 5,500 kids who are aged, young adults aged between 18 and 25, who have exited out of home care by turning to eight, when they turned 18. How many of those kids got support last year? I would need to take that on notice. It's All of them should have had access to supports. There's a very different answer to the question. That, that, that's answering a different question, Ms Campbell. I thought you were asking how I many... I asked how many had support. You said how many, all of them had access to some support. Yeah. Do you understand Dr. the Shibridge, I, I might be able to provide some clarification yep. on that question, hopefully. Um, in the last financial year, so 2021, there were 2,086 young people uh, in receipt of aftercare assistance. That equated to more than $8 million in expenditure from the department. And it included a range of different supports. As Ms Campbell said, um, children's individual circumstances will vary and, and things are often different from one aftercare plan to the next, but it can include support for accommodation, uh, can include support for education, um, and things like driver's licence, um, you know, can be a myriad of, of different um, initiatives. What what we do know, and I'm not sure if we can extract this data, but we'll certainly try. Um, and it's to your question about the expenditure each year, so 18 to 25. We do know that um, the expenditure and the request for support drops off as children approach uh, 25. So it's more concentrated, as you'd expect, 18, 19. But we'll come back to the committee with some detail on that. Yeah, I mean, just quickly looking at those numbers, that's less than $4,000 per child. We, in Victoria, where they provide support, guaranteed support, full out-of-home care support for those kids who want it up to 21, when those kids leave at 21, they get a guaranteed $10,000 package plus support. Mm. And what you're putting to me is when kids in New South Wales leave care at age 18, they get on average less than $4,000 in total. And that's at 18, not at 22. So that, um, that expenditure is expenditure directly from the department. It doesn't include the programs that Ms Campbell spoke of. So there's a number of programs, aftercare programs, that are funded. So I haven't included that in that figure, but Ms yep. Campbell might like to talk to that in a so bit in more detail. in the la last financial year, aftercare assistance was over $8 million, including accommodation establishment, the aftercare allowance and post-educational finance. We also have specialist aftercare provider that provided services to 450 children and young people, as well as the TILA, which is a transitional to independent living, which was a 1500 allocation to each child leaving out of home care. And they're just a few of the sources. All right, but one of the really good ways of checking if that's working is to know how many kids went into homelessness, but we don't track that data. Is that right, Ms Campbell? Um, I'd need to take that on notice and see if we've got the ability to do that. Ms Tibble, you'd be aware that um, Queensland supports kids in out-of-home care to age 19 um, and every other state and territory supports kids who wish to remain supported in out-of-home care till age 21. Um, uh, are you aware of why it is that New South Wales doesn't provide that level of support? I'm not specifically aware, Mr Shearbridge, but I um, affirm my statement that it's unacceptable that uh, any young person leaving care would be uh, moving into homelessness yep. and that that is a matter which um, I will interrogate. The, the NGO sector has effectively costed what that would mean to the New South Wales government to continue to provide the care to those kids who want it. And it's effectively a rounding error in your departmental budget. It's about $25 million a year. Were you aware just how small the cost is for that positive outcome? I was not. All right. Um, probably to you, Ms Chick. How many um, um, guardianship orders were made last year? And of those, how many of them 
related to First Nations children. Um, so last year, apologies, I'm just looking at my phone for the most current data. So 2020-21 uh, financial year, guardianship um, in total. Um, oh, sorry, their exits. Bear with me. Unless, they're, have you got it handy? Uh, Sorry, maybe Mr. while you're looking for it, I can just come back to you on that last question, Mr. Shoebridge, in Thanks, terms Ms. of the, the data linkage. As a result of, you would have recalled the more than shelter report that was done by the New South Wales Ombudsman. Uh, one of the recommendations from that was data linkages with homelessness and child story. So that came into effect the middle of last year from memory. So we will be able to track that data going forward. Good. Ms. Check, I'm about to run out of time for this round, so I'll just I'll just ask the other questions. Um, of the guardianship orders in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, how many were made in respect of non-Aboriginal <coughs> guardians? Um, if you could provide that. Yeah. And with with that, I'll hand back to the opposition. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Beaver, we might. Um, go back to Together Home, because I just wanted to clarify some of those figures. So um, I think you said that there were a thousand sort of packages available, as it were, and 600 and something sort of that were taken at the moment. Can you just clarify those figures? Yes. Um, it, is, I th it, it is around a thousand. Um, I, I should take that on notice to okay. give you the exact figure, but it's it's there. Around, th yeah, that'd be great. So, six hundred and forty-nine clients have accommodation and support, mm -hmm. and there's a further a hundred and uh, uh, close enough to another two hundred clients who are on support which involves looking for accommodation for them, but they're not actually in accommodation yet. So the total number of people who either have an accommodation or a support place and will have accommodation is 790. And, I mean, to the extent that there are packages available that are unused, um, is that just that appropriate? kind of individuals who meet the eligibility criteria haven't been found or what's the explanation for that? I mean, there just genuinely is no demand. Oh, no, there's yeah. definitely, there's I, definitely I demand. I found that hard to believe, so I was just wondering uh, what that gap was. So it's just as people filter through. Right. Yeah. Uh, also, the, the finance for the program was spread over a couple of years. Um, so um, it, it's a sort of natural flow flow through, but no, there's absolutely no lack of demand. Yes, right. Can it. I figured that that was the case. Um, I mean, to the extent that there is unmet demand, you know, do you have a waiting list? How do you manage? How do you manage that? How do you manage the fact that there is, you know, potentially more individuals who would want support and qualify for it who are unable to be funded from the $122 million. How's that managed? So the accommodation side of that, we would put those people into social housing because uh, they would be a top priority for it. And then we seek to link them with a local homelessness service. So um, it's a sort of negotiated thing, whereas under Together Home it comes as of a right uh, that you know there are support providers there, so it requires a bit of negotiation. I'd be honest; they won't get as much support as they would if they were on the Together Home program. How many people are in that category of people who have the social housing spot and some NGO <coughs> support but are unable to access a Together Home package? Um, so there would be around about a thousand. Right. So since. Sort of since COVID started. Right. So potentially sort of double yes. the number of packages that are available. Yes. And so um, for the people who do have a package, um, you know, obviously mentioned some of the discussions that are going on with community housing providers. Are you able to give any more detail on, I mean, obviously not individuals and if there's thousands, there's hundreds of them, but the status of that overall, I mean, are you, are, are you confident 
that you will be able to exit <coughs> all of those people by the end of this year into more stable accommodation, or are you worried about the progress of some of those conversations? Uh, I am confident that we will be able to get stable long-term housing for those people because they are a priority. Um, do they therefore um, take a place that would otherwise go to someone else? Yes, mm. that's the case yep. with all social housing. And if we had more housing, we'd house more, more people and, and any jurisdiction in Australia would say the same. So, I mean, that's positive just in terms... I mean, I understand what you're saying. It's positive in terms of you're confident that you're not going to be seeing people exiting into rough sleeping. And I understand you would sort of never allow that to happen. What about the support part, then, of the Together Home Package? Because, as you say, it's accommodation and support. Um, presumably, though, you're going to rely a little bit on NGOs to step into the breach and, you know, provide the support that they can? How, I mean, are you in dialogue with them? How is that yes. progressing? So we would mm. expect that, and, and actually know this to be true, not statistically, but from our experience, that as people settle into accommodation and stay there, which a very large proportion of rust sleepers do actually remain in their accommodation, that their needs subside a bit because they're then used to paying rent, paying for electricity, and often have built up some social supports because loneliness, is, as you know, is a really big factor there. Um, so I think overall the total amount of support would be less. But then, yes, the, it is a question of negotiating that locally, um, rather as we do when people who are uh, not homelessness but come into priority housing, they often need some support and we will then link them with a support service. But I, I'd be honest, it's not as guaranteed as it is under the Together mm. Home program. Yeah, and I mean, you know, as I, you, I've been very positive about Together Home. I mean, it's based on international best practice, um, <clears throat> but international best practice would probably say, you know, t two years, which is the full length of that program. It's not even yeah. as though all of those people have been on that program for two years. I no. mean, some of them will have been... For, for long, for a longer period of time, <clears throat> that's not necessarily enough time to transition someone who has a history of rough sleeping and, you know, perhaps some of those long-term issues that might lead you to be a rough sleeper into being able to live independently in, you know, the sort of private housing market. Like, that, that's not necessarily enough time, is it? No, and I, I'm not suggesting that very many rough sleepers would end up in the private market. Yeah. Some, some absolutely do, but I think that's the minority. The thing that gives me a degree of comfort is that since the Martin Place Tent City, uh, which completely changed the way that we approach rough sleeping, um, we track within Sydney, it is true, we track... What has happened mm. to everybody who's been housed uh, since Martin Place every six months? And what we do is we just go through, it's not detail, we say, are they still a tenant? Are they paying their rent? And we assume that that's a broadly stable tenancy. More than 80% of people, including people who are housed following the tent city, are still in their tenancy. In the first few years, it was about 95%. So clearly some people drop off. But 80% is not good enough. But it does suggest that the work that we do with rough sleepers works for just over three quarters of them. And obviously our focus has got to be on well, what goes wrong with the people who do fall out of accommodation. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's, it's obviously extremely positive that you're collecting that data, but in a way that you know, sort of highlights the point that I'm making, which is that it does drop off. So, you know, for, for those individuals who have been in a way lucky enough or fortunate enough to have a together home package, you know, they will be exited into some form of accommodation, probably not the private rental market. NGOs will hopefully step in, but that over time it is more likely that they will run into trouble again. I, and I'm sorry. No, you so, so, you know, uh, obviously that's of concern, that the investment will have been made to try and get people on track, but then, 
you know, the sort of it, it falls away and we're back to where we started. Maybe not with everyone, but over time with an increasing portion of those people. So if, if I go back to 2017, so post uh, Tent City, we've actually housed 1,064 rough sleepers between then and uh, last month. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably less than half of that number would have been on the Together Home package because that only started, I think, and in 2020. Uh, was, 19, yeah, it was 20. a sort of COVID thing yeah. originally, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. then extended, yeah. So, so half of those people have been on the sort of arrangement that I've described where we've sought to negotiate with a non-government service. So I'm totally not pretending it's... It's foolproof, it most clearly isn't, but it works for about 80% of, of people. And um, what we try to do is if it looks like it's going wrong, and, and we do get some warning of that, there's often sort of mental health issues, drug and alcohol, <coughs> or people just stop paying their rent. Um, we do put a, a bit more intense support in with our housing staff to try to link them uh, with with a service, hmm. um, but but as I say, an eighty percent success rate, as far as I can tell, internationally, that's it's not particularly better than anywhere else, but it's kind of on a par with other similar programs, hmm. and, and that's not just together home. Yeah, um, but just to be clear, I mean, it is the department's assessment that together home was a successful program. Hmm. That you know, you feel as though that investment and the work that was done through that program for those people who were able to access it was a good use of money so in an otherwise, you know, in an area where money is contested. It would be Anne's area to evaluate it. I can tell you that from the operational side, it's been an absolutely marvellous <laughs> program to have. Have you done any evaluation, Ms Cam? Well, it's currently, we've actually commenced the evaluation. We did it for um, the first sort of phase of Together Home, but we've actually built on so that we can gather the second and third phases. And who's doing that evaluation? I'd need to take that on notice. There's quite a lot of evaluation happening in the department, but that I would, can come back to you on that. And, and the time frames as well. We're due, I think, for an interim um, evaluation report this year, because obviously, mm -hmm. given the program's still rolling out, we want to learn where we can improve what some of the issues were, given it was a program that was literally stood up overnight and it really worked because of the community housing providers and the specialist homelessness services coming together quickly to both source accommodation. <coughs> we work really closely, particularly with the Homelessness New South Wales, um, because they've got carriage of funding that we were able to get to support a smaller cohort of those people who had really, really seriously complex needs and needed um, significant mental health and drug and alcohol services. We also were able to engage really closely with the NDIS because what we found for a number of those people who had been sleeping rough is that they didn't know anything about the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So one of the, I think it was the state manager from the National Disability Insurance Scheme has been part of that panel assessing that so that they could then get access to additional support through the NDIS. I mean, is there any um, assessment that has been done or evaluations that have been done that are able to inform budget cycles prior to the completion of the program? Because I guess, you know, the, the yep. program does obviously yep. sort of finish at the end of this year, but decisions will need to be made about its future prior to that. So is that time frame built in? Yes, to it is. Some of the and I can let you know that Ahuri are doing the evaluation. Oh, great. Okay. Mm. Excellent. Um, we might talk about public housing a waiting list, a social housing waiting list, Mr Vivas. So I know that the Minister mentioned the figure, but could you just give it to me again? The current number of people on the waiting list, I think it was 40... Was so it? the... Um, the general list... Yeah, the general list to start with, yeah. ..is 44,127. And when's that from? I'm sorry, it is June 2021 because it's only published once a year. Last year, at budget estimates, at the end of last year, we, we asked 
in supplementary questions, Mr. Vivas, um, for a sort of month by month breakdown. And so I, for example, know from information provided by you and your team that in October 2021, it was 53,490. So like, I know that the department has more up-to-date figures than that, <clears throat> which I appreciate is the figure that's publicly available on the dashboard. But are you a... I mean, I can ask it as a supplementary question again, but are you able to provide more up-to-date information? I, I actually don't, don't have it with me. I think one of the issues about mid-year figures is that we go through a process every year of contacting everybody on the waiting list and saying, do you still need social housing? And we tend to do that towards the end of the financial year. So in October, you might well get a significantly higher figure than you would later in the year. Um, so that does that's one reason why we only do this. We only actually publish it once a year. So I think the true figure to me is is the 44,000. That's the general waiting list, not priority. Mm. Although, Mr. Vivas, I'm sure <coughs> you would be familiar from, you know, from feedback from service providers who are working with those individuals that those sort of letters or contacts go out, as you say, but for a lot of those individuals, you know, there's a lot going on in their lives and, uh, you know, the sort of process of confirming their status as still requiring housing takes a little bit of time. Maybe they don't get to it. People sometimes fall off the list and don't realise they have. Um, and so, you know, it's not as though it's not as though you may not see figures later on where people have sort of suddenly realised, oh, I need to get back on that. Yes. Um, it's not a complicated process. The vast majority of people have to type in one letter into an SMS to confirm that they still need it. So we send out an SMS asking quite simply, <coughs> do you, you're on the waiting list, do you still need it? Why for yes, N for no? So we have tried to streamline it. For people who don't respond, we then follow up with, um, I think it's two letters. But what we do allow is people who can explain a, a situation like they've been in prison or they've been homeless and they come back to us. We just put them back on the waiting list and backdate it to whenever we took them off. OK. For the priority waiting list, so what's the most up-to-date figure you have on the priority waiting list? Presumably that's also from June 2021. Yes. Yep. And what is that figure, though? So it's 5,801. I mean, even, even that figure, though is, I think, quite a bit higher than the numbers who the, on the priority waiting list, say, for example, June 2019. I think, I think there's... Yeah, I've got um, the year before. Yeah. Um, Do you have the it, June 2019 figure? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've got the, the 20 figure which is five, five, three, oh eight. Yeah. So it's gone up by 500. My, I think it may even have my recollection of figures is that that was also a bit of a jump from 2019. So we are seeing there, my understanding is a bit of a, you know, creep up, particularly on the priority waiting list. So what's the plan to try and address that? <coughs> because, look, you know, yep, the, 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 the big list... It's, you know, I mean, we've talked before, you know, it's, it's massive, you know, there's yeah. somewhere between 44 and 53,000 people on it. But the priority waiting list, people who are sleeping rough at imminent risk of homelessness, you know, what are you doing? What's the department's plan to try and respond to that? So it, it's twofold. Mm -hmm. um, so for, firstly, there is a program of new supply and additional social housing, which we don't manage, I'm afraid that's a land, and yep, I'm sorry, yep. I'm not trying to pass the buck, but it is a land and housing oh, no, corporation um, question, but that should give us some additional property. Uh, and also we've um, managed to get agreement well, last year and subsequent years, we got agreements that our leasing program would now be funded to take account of increases in private rental costs. So we, we have a leasing program of about 3,000 properties and community housing providers about four times uh, that amount. And so um, that had gradually been dwindling mm. because we didn't keep pace with inflation. Uh, sorry, yeah. we didn't keep pace mm. 
not, not mm -hmm. just with inflation, with private rental costs, and that's been rectified by Treasury, so that will enable us to get some greater supply. So, yes, we're kind of, you know, competing in a market, uh, in a tough market. But the other uh, element of this is our private rental assistance. So that automatically does keep pace with increases in the private market because it's based on benchmark rents. And if the benchmark rents go up, our subsidies go up. And we do take some people off the priority housing list into uh, private rental where they pay the same as if they were in public housing. So that's our, our aim. Obviously, we really want to see that number on a downward trend, of course. So just on, on those two, two of those elements then, in terms of the private rent assistance, obviously you would be aware that in regional areas particularly, it's not just a rent increase issue. That is an issue and it's good that your system benchmarks that. It's an availability issue. Yes. It, it's just literally not the properties available. So is there any kind of particular work that is done in, the re, in regional areas to try and manage that? So some of the Land and Housing Corporation program will be targeted at building in regional areas. Um, and we give our staff in, uh, in uh, difficult housing markets a bit more flexibility to negotiate with the private sector to make us more attractive as a purchaser and that could be price based or it could be security of income based. I don't really want to go into a lot of detail um, about that but they do have some freedoms to give us competition against private renters. In terms of say you know that change that you mentioned um in relation to your direct leasing of properties, do you have a sense of how many additional properties that might make available? Do you have a, an aim there, or I, what, I, what, what, I, you know, is it is it ten or is it two hundred? Oh no, no, no. It's it it would be of the two hundred mark. Could I take? I'm I'm sort of guessing on a precise number. It would be in the small hundreds. Okay. But I'll you... take it on notice. Okay. And if I could right. just add to. Oh, yep. um, Mr Vevers, in terms of new supply that is under the ambit of DCJ, I think I mentioned earlier today there was $35.5 in capital uh, for the Together Home Program for longer term social housing. Uh, in addition to that, there's been $100 million announced to date for what's called the Community Housing Innovation Fund, which is a co-contribution <coughs> with the um, community housing providers to build more um, uh, social and affordable housing in addition to um, Minister Ward's announcement around the 52 uh, 50 million for domestic and family violence in terms of new supply. Mm. Okay, we might come back to that. I think okay. Ms Boyd is yep. here. Yep. Pass Thank the cross bench. Well, thanks very much and hello again. Um, if I could follow up actually just one quick question, um, Mr Vivas, in relation to the um, restrict practices bill you were saying about the you know obviously the consultation slide do we have any indication though as to whether that bill will be brought this term of parliament or is it likely to be next i think it, i mean it would be subject to the minister so i haven't had a detailed discussion on timing i think it's much more likely that it will be the next session okay thank you um i was just over in the other um estimates um in relation to uh, education uh, and asking about children in schools with um, uh, disability and, and other um, conditions um, that are making it you know, more difficult for them to get back to school because of COVID. I was curious as to what the overlap was in terms of responsibilities when it comes to children with disability. Um, again, in my experience, children with disability are always kind of the last thing, the last people that are thought of um, in these circumstances. What role does um, the Minister for Disability have um, in relation to children with disability in schools? Is there any any responsibility at all, or is it completely in education? I'm happy to um, please. Go. Uh, in terms of children with a disability, the programs that DCJ would run, where that minister, the minister has responsibility for, need to be accessible for children with a disability. Mm -hmm. uh, in some of the programs, like the child protection program, um, you would have 
heard the, the Disability Royal Commission had a real focus on not just children with disability but parents with a disability and making sure that our services are accessible and that we put in place the right supports if, if they're not eligible for the National Disability yep. Insurance Scheme and that would happen across disability in terms of disability, um, sorry, across social housing in terms of modifications yep. um, to ensure that properties are accessible for people with a disability. She has carried, the Minister has carriage of the Disability Inclusion Act, which mm -hmm. sets out, um, you know, very specific principles around how to support not only children with a disability, yep. but other people with disabilities. So, for example, um, if there was a, a new, uh, you know, a change in circumstances, there was a new need for funding. So I'm thinking um, specifically of uh, children with a disability returning to school after a period of time of remote learning. Um, there is a need for additional funding uh, in order to make sure that that transition for children with disability is smoother. So this is a, I would argue, there's a need for an additional funding amount um, for our schools to cover that. Is that something that would be covered by the Minister for Disability or for the Minister for Education? Minister for Education, unless... That, pati that particular child was also an NDIS participant that may be eligible for other supports to assist them to come back to school. But then that would be a federal That's funding correct. issue. That's so really then the New South Wales Minister for Disability doesn't have any role in advocating for children's funding within schools, correct? Correct. And the only other thing I should say is there's a thing called under the um, NDIS personal care in schools and that's currently in kind under the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So presently there's quite a bit of discussion happening between the Commonwealth and the state, in particular with education, about what that program will look like going forward. So does that mean that there will be um, an allocation of funding given directly to schools by the federal or is this and something separate? I think it's I think it's up for negotiation. I couldn't I haven't really been part of those discussions other than I'm okay. aware of it. Can I, can I just add to this Please. Campbell's comments, and it's very much in the context of statutory child protection and out-of-home care, but from time to time the department will receive risk of significant harm reports where a child does have a disability and there might be um, some concerns about the capacity of the parents to deliver um, care to that child in the home. And sometimes when we look at those reports, it's clear that there's some inadequacies in the NDIS plan. Mm -hmm. So we've got a small team that's called um, Engagement and Family Support who act as a, both an advice line for the family but also interface with the NDIS. And we've been quite successful uh, through that team in uplifting um, the value of NDIS plans uh, for a number of children who are still living with their families and have successfully kept those children uh, placed in their families and not had to bring them into out-of-home care. The other thing I'd just add is about 21% of children in statutory out-of-home care have, an have a disability that makes them eligible for NDIS packages, and we use that team again to make sure children in out-of-home care are in receipt of mm. what they're entitled to, mm. and we have had quite a bit of success uplifting plans in to the value of a couple hundred thousand dollars in some cases to make sure the children get the disability supports from the Commonwealth that they're entitled to. So, you know, it's not for all children, and I know yep. you're specifically talking about schools, but it is an important function, albeit small, that we carry out inside the department. And that's really promising. I think um, in these estimates, I often talk about the 90% of people with disability who aren't on NDIS, um, and many of them aren't on NDIS because they can't even though they would be eligible, they can't access it, yeah. or they're on NDIS, but their um, their needs aren't really being met to the level. So mm. that's a that's a very positive sounding um, program. Yeah, that you've like got I said, there. it's it's very small, um, but they pack a punch, <laughs> so to speak, um, and have been quite quite successful. And like I said, we've enabled families to get the support they need to continue caring for their child. Often it in very mm. difficult circumstances. I couldn't imagine what it must be like for some parents looking after, particularly a, a very disabled child, it, it must be incredibly challenging and difficult. My, um, my office hears from a lot of parents who 
um, found the beginning of the school year incredibly difficult mm -hmm. for lots of reasons um, and have uh, taken the decision to keep their children at home, either because their children have underlying health conditions or someone else in the family does, or because complying with the restrictions is so very, very difficult um, for uh, some, some children. Um, is there additional support that can be provided or additional funding that can be provided to um, parents who have made that decision to basically pull their kids out of the school system? It's probably a question for the Department of Education rather than uh, DCJ. So we only obviously get involved where children either are um, subject to a risk of significant harm report, so they've got to meet a certain threshold, or are in out-of-home care. I, I do know, and again, it's a question for education, but m I know my colleagues in education um, are proactively contacting parents to offer support where children haven't returned to school. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, any more detail than that, I could not, I couldn't provide it. Okay. Not on their behalf, certainly. Fair enough. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, just a few questions which you may need to take on notice, but I will put it out there and see what happens. Um, so, link to home. Um, is it possible to give us a breakdown of the the sort of caller profile number and proportion by age and gender of the people who are interacting with um, Link to Home? I think so. Okay. <laughs> I can take, both take on notice whether we can and if we can, what that is. Okay, that would be great. Um, in terms of waiting lists... Um, for housing, and apologies if one of my colleagues has already um, covered this, um, are you able to provide a detailed breakdown of the number and proportion by age and gender of the current waiting list? On so, notice. Yes, on notice, not out of your head. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, how many people aged 80 years um, and over in the general waiting list have been added to the priority waiting list in the last five years? Again, perhaps on, on notice. On notice yeah. um, the gender breakdown, uh, again, number and proportion of the people who were added to the priority list um, upon turning 80 years over the last five years. Um, I'm assuming all of these take on notice, but I'll put them on the record now because it's, um, it's easier and you'll, you'll get the notice quicker. Uh, what was the average time of people over 80 years in the priority list getting housing once they're on that priority list? Uh, and what was the average time for people over 55 years in the general waiting list across all geographic areas getting housing? Understood. Thank you. That would be very helpful. Um, in terms of housing <coughs> tenants, I think I will just... That one doesn't make sense to me, so I'm just going to put that one on notice once I work it out. Um, and rent choice. How many people over 55 years received rent choice? Do you have that? I do. I mean, I, ha I have the total figures, but not uh, by age, so we'll have to take that on notice. Thank you. And a gender breakdown by number and proportion um, would, of um, participants over 55 would be very useful as well. Um, Chair, I may come back and have questions in the next round, but I think that's all for me for now. Okay, well, there's another nine minutes of this session. Ms Jackson, did you want to continue that line of questioning you had before? Sure, I can keep going. Um... I think we, yeah, so we were just finishing with you, Mr Vivas, saying that you will take on notice the sort of number of additional properties that you were hopeful of securing with the new um, sort of lease funding arrangements. Yes. I can now tell you it's 339. Right, 339. Excellent. Mm. Um, just in terms of those properties, this may be a question that I'll have to ask... Um, land and housing, but I'll, I'll ask you because sometimes um, it's a little bit unclear uh, who does what. So in terms of if there are issues with that tenancy, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm mainly thinking about potentially sort of damage to the properties or, you know, that, that as you know, can sometimes occur. Um, who is responsible for remediating that property and ensuring that that experience, I suppose, isn't one that makes it more difficult for that, uh, for that individual and others to participate in this program in the future. Um, we are responsible in DCJ for, um, for resolving that situation, although on occasions we do ask Land and Housing Corporation to come mm -hmm. and validate claims from leaseholders. It, it, it is 
a fraught space. I have, we have two or three cases on the go at the moment where we just actually don't agree uh, with the person who's leased the property mm. to us about what the state of the property was. We take photographs of it, so we've got mm. before and after. Um, we, of course, try to be totally fair uh, with, our, with the people we lease properties from, with our property owners, because we, we, you know, we're in the market. There, there just are some occasions where we feel that the claim is quite exaggerated, uh, where we will seek to go to some form of um, dispute resolution, but it, it does happen. Out of 3,000, I'm only aware of, personally, of three or four where we're in some fairly significant dispute mm -hmm. with the owner. What's the What sort of dispute resolution processes do you undertake? Is that through NCAT or do no, you do that sort of uh, in, mean, internally? Uh, yeah. Ultimately, it can go to mm. NCAT, uh, but we, we seek to do it by, by negotiation mm -hmm. with them. Okay. Um, it would be useful perhaps for you, perhaps you need to take it on notice, to know the number of, I guess... Um, complaints or disputes that are current in relation to private property owners who have participated in the scheme who then are seeking um, some support from DCJ in relation to damage to their property? Can, can I say we'll, we'll try and mm -hmm. get that? It's not a number where I can sort of search the entire yep. database and find out it would actually require us to go round to all of our offices, which would be a quite a time-consuming Yeah, process. okay. I understand. Um, well, maybe just see what you can do, but I, I do appreciate that. Um, so we also touched on this with the Minister earlier, and, and she mentioned that the, the time had gone down. So what is the, at, at present, what is the average wait time for someone on the social housing waiting list? Um, New South Wales average. Yeah, so... <clears throat> If I can be absolutely precise in answering that question, it is how long did the last person, the last people housed, wait before they got mm -hmm. housed? That's how we calculate okay, the number. Yep. Um, and it is, for people on the general list, it's 22.1 months. Mm -hmm. I do want to be completely transparent about this and say that is an average across the mm -hmm. state. Um, and if you're in Western New South Wales, you will get housed pretty quickly. If you're really anywhere on the coast, that average will not be real to you. Mm. It, it would be many years mm. in those locations. Yes, I mean, you know, that kind of information is not that to that level of specificity, but the point that you're making is obviously a publicly available on the dashboard. So, you yes. know, you'll be familiar with the fact that you can, you know, look up coastal areas in the regions and it's showing 10 years plus Mr yes. Beavers. Yes to totally uh, absolutely is um, I mean I would say the, pri the priority waiting time average is 2.2 months mm -hmm. but again I want to be transparent because you will come across uh, you know, individual cases where people say, well, I've waited a great deal longer mm. than that. And that is true because an average, of course, hides extremes. And we do have some people who have very particular needs mm, mm, mm. for a particular type of property in a particular suburb where, frankly, we're waiting for a tenant to move out mm. uh, before we can give them a public housing property. And sometimes people will wait, you know, six, seven, eight times mm. longer than that in that situation. Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, there is just a, f a fundamental problem, is there not, Mr Vivas, where there just is not enough stock. Would you accept that? Um, what I would say is that any social housing organisation with a waiting list can self-evidently make really good use of extra stock. Ultimately, it's a matter of funding mm -hmm. for government, but, but could we make good use of extra stock? Yes, of course, we totally could. Mm. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with the research that was recently done um, by the S City Futures Centre at UNSW, where they analysed the, the, the net new stock coming online in New South Wales, so state by state, 
in New South Wales between now and 2024, their research showed that the number of net new properties coming online was, I think, something in the order of 400, maybe 420. I mean, that is not nearly enough, is it, Mr Beavers? Um, I, I, I don't actually know that piece of work, and I think that number would kind of reflect what's going to happen this year. Uh, but my understanding is that that will ramp up through Land and House, Housing Corporation quite significantly. Mm. I will talk to... I, I appreciate that it's in, unfair in a way to ask you about new stock because I know that that's Land and Housing's job. But, you know, there is obviously that problem, Mr Vivas, which we've talked about before, where you manage the individuals, the people, yeah. the list, and they manage the properties. And so presumably you're always saying... We need more, and they're saying they're doing their best, but it's important yeah, that but government works together here. We do work incredibly closely together, and organisational barriers shouldn't be, and actually in this case are not, a barrier to working well together. Uh, so, you know, Deb Brill and I talk constantly. Um, it, I would say it isn't just the quantity of stock. That obviously is massively important. But given the number of people that we have with disabilities, mm. it's also the type of mm -hmm. um, property that you've got. And that's where we have a lot of dialogue with Land and Housing Corporation about well, what can we do to actually adapt this property to make it work. Mm. And, and, and is also a feature of those conversations. Obviously, there's the important issue of people with disabilities, but the mix the mix of housing stock because a lot of the ageing stock is sort of more in the homes, you know, for, for families category and perhaps there is increasing demand for smaller properties as we, you know, we'll, I'll ask some questions about this later, but we know that single older individuals, particularly women, um, are an increasing number of people who are waiting so is that also part of that conversation with yes, land and housing very much for, for for two reasons one is we would like to free up some larger properties by encouraging mm. tenants who are under occupying to move to smaller properties but you've got to have the smaller properties to move them into but also yes uh, the biggest single group of people on our waiting list now is single people mm, mm, mm. all right we might get onto that um in a little bit. Um, I just wanted to quickly um, just follow up again about the the street count. Yes. So the, the, the 2022 street count is is underway at present. Mm -hmm. Can you just give me an update? Because I think it, it's occurred in Sydney, but the, the northern New South Wales element's been delayed. So where is that up to? So uh, Sydney has taken place. Yep, Sydney We taken don't place. actually control the publication of Sydney's results. The city of Sydney yes, it, does yep. that. Um, but I don't imagine that will be very far away. Uh, and then northern New South, or part of northern New South Wales, was due to happen last week and... Uh, uh, and, and we just have to call it off because mm -hmm. not not only is there a physical difficulty of doing it, it'll give you a distorted result if we yep. do it now. And, and, at I, the, I, and, and at present, there's... I mean, you're going to try and do it as soon as possible. I guess I'm just, you know, I'm keen to have some sense of when we might have the 2022 kind of street count figure available. I... I I just can't commit okay. to that right now. We'll do it, obviously, as quickly as possible, but it does depend what happens on the flooding situation. Yes, OK. I mean, I'm just going to keep going. Adam, did you want to jump in at this point, or...? Well, unless you want, you want to take over now. Oh, sorry, Is that all right? Just... You take over now yeah. and go till 3.30 and then we'll take a break. OK. I think my colleague, Mr Shoebridge, is going to jump in. <laughs> yes, if I can find my papers, I will do exactly that. Um... You were going to provide some data on guardianship orders? Yes. Um, apologies about that earlier. I did have the right figures, so I could have given Ms. you... You have been data rich today. You don't need to apologise. Yep. <laughs> There's a lot of paper, that's all I'll say. <laughs> um, so... Um, Mr Shoebridge, um, there's two sets of figures that I'll provide you if it's helpful. One is um, the number of new guardianship orders, and I can do a breakdown of non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal children this financial year. If you want the previous three, I can provide that. And then I can give you the total number of children on guardianship orders by Aboriginality um, and non-Aboriginal. So for 2021, there are a total of 451 new guardianship orders. 
179 of those were Aboriginal children, 272 were non-Aboriginal children. Did you want me to do the previous years? If you wouldn't mind, sure. so we get a sense of where it's yep. going. So 1920, a total of 419, 172 for Aboriginal children, 247 for non-Aboriginal children. 2018-19, 349 guardianship orders, 127 orders for Aboriginal children, 222 non-Aboriginal. And then uh, for 17-18, a total number of guardianship orders, 287, 84 for um, Aboriginal children, 203 um, yep. for non-Aboriginal children in that year. So you can see an increasing trend. Yeah, close close to doubling in the last four years or so. Correct. Um, and um, more than doubling in terms of the number of Aboriginal children going into guardianship orders. Yeah, from four years ago, yes. Yep. Um, and of those um, guardianship orders made in respect of Aboriginal children, how many of them were made to non-Aboriginal uh, that's, that's a question we'll need to take on notice, um, but we'll come back to the committee on that. And did you, when you were doing that, did you get the adoption numbers? Uh, I do have the adoption numbers. Um, can, I just, can I just check if you wanted the overall guardianship numbers? They were new. The, the number currently? Yeah, so the total number of children yes, on that guardianship. Would be... um, so if I start at, at June uh, 30, 21, uh, total number of children on a guardianship order, 3415. 1210 is the number of Aboriginal children, and then 2205 for non Aboriginal children. All right. Um, so, yes, do you have the adoption numbers? Yes, I do. So, for 2021, there were a total of 91 adoptions of children from out of home care. 90 of those adoption orders were non Aboriginal children, and there was one child who was Aboriginal who was adopted. Yep. All right. Um, there are a, a number of concerns have been raised with my office and I, they may have been raised through to the department as well about the rising number of guardianship orders being made in relation to Aboriginal children in particular. Um, and on one view, well, sorry, are you aware of concerns about the numbers? I'm aware of concerns, um, particularly from ABSEC and from time to time Aboriginal NGOs individually um, have come to me, albeit not for a few years. They may have come to my colleague directly, Ms Campbell. Um, but I think their concerns that have re been relayed to me over the years have been about children transitioning to guardianship orders and then... Um, a perception that there's no support available once that guardianship order well, well, is the... made or that they lose contact with culture and community and, and family. And they're, they're the two concerns that have been raised with my office. One is once a child goes into guardianship, it's basically outsourced from the department, um, removed from the out-of-home care supports. Yeah under, the legis uh, yeah, under the legislation, children on a guardianship order, as you'll know, are no longer considered to be in statutory care. They are in receipt of a an allowance as if um, they were still in statutory out of home care. I do know, um, and I'll have to get my colleague to talk to it, but there has been for some time some work underway around a guardianship support model in collaboration with ABSEC. And I understand that was re recently um, launched, but I'll, I'll need Miss Campbell to provide further detail on that. Yes, that, that is the case. It was recently launched, so it's still pretty early days in terms of testing um, a much better way of supporting um, yep. the Aboriginal guardianship placements. But there's no structured system in place through ABSEC to have that additional support and outreach for those 179 um, children who are put on a guardian, Aboriginal children who were put on a guardianship order last year. Some of them might get into a pilot project at some point, but there's none of there's, there's no structural additional support? Not through ABSEC. A, a guardian or children, if they're old enough, can come back via either the NGO, though, or case managed 
um, from all the department and request any assistance that m they might need. And I'm, I'm aware of some particular examples where representations have been made to me there's some additional support and we have provided that in those cases. I think the other thing just to highlight these um, two permanency options being guardianship and adoption are two of um, four in particular, so obviously uh, restoration and remaining in long-term care. And there is a thorough assessment that takes pl place to consider guardianship and adoption. And where there is a need for ongoing support and children should be better placed because they'll get the support in the statutory system, they should absolutely stay but, there. But the difficulty is um, that sometimes it, it is in the best interest of a child to be taken out of the out-of-home care mm. system and put in guardianship, but it comes at a financial impact sometimes to that family. Um, well, and that shouldn't be the kind mm. of balancing... Um, decisions based upon money, should it? No, I, I totally agree with you, Mr Shubridge. And the decision to progress a guardianship order should never, yeah. ever be about money. It is about what is in the best interest but, of a child. But because as of I, the way funding sorry, is structured... Sorry, can I just finish? Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, the carer allowance continues to be paid to the guardian until the child's 18. And we actually put that in the legislation to make sure that that was protected. I, I acknowledge they don't get the casework support as they would if they were in statutory out of home care, but that's what the support system has been set up for. Could, could I ask you a specific question on the numbers um, in the budget? The, um, the, there's a, the, the most recent report on government services had New South Wales government expenditure on intensive family support services decreasing from $189 million in 2019-20 to $129 million in 2020, 2021. Can you explain why that went down so dramatically? I might just refer that to my colleague, uh, Ms Campbell, to respond to, if that's OK. I can. I might just go back. I've got a bit more detail in terms of the guardianship model that you talked about earlier. So in May 2019, um, the department allocated about 870-odd thousand to ABSEC to develop an Aboriginal guardianship support model through a co-design process to test the provision of post-order support to better assist guardians manage the lasting impact of trauma and, abu and abuse. So the phase one of that model has been complete, completed and we've just had approval to provide to do a trial in Hunter and southwestern Sydney. Um, so that's progressing and I'm happy to provide more detailed information. Right. If you could put that any more information on notice yep. and did you have an answer about the um, about the $60 million reduction in intensive family support services. I'd need to take that on notice and All I'm right. happy to come back well, to you. The good news is we've hit the afternoon tea break, so we'll be back in 15 minutes. We'll come back a little bit after quarter two.
Welcome back to the final to the final session of this budget estimates inquiry. That it hit a new low in the break when I threw fruit at the secretary. So um, I just wanted to apologise for that on the record. Wow. Um, uh, I of getting that heated. It was quite tough um, to the opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, just returning to the issue of, of um, the support given uh, to young persons after they reach the age of 18. Um, what is the median amount of aftercare support provided to each young person uh, as they as they exit care? Oh, I do not want to take that on notice, Mr. Searle, um, but I will need some support on that one. That's okay. If that's all right. And none of these are trick questions. If you can answer no, no, it, great. No, no, no. If you can't, obviously yep. you take it on notice. Uh, Mr. Searle, I'm almost 100% confident we don't have a, a medium, and that's because um, each individual's aftercare plan will vary quite wildly. OK. You're, you're talking your dollar... Whitney's so I think we oh, might yeah. all need to move the microphones a little closer. Uh, yes, I, uh, I'm Sorry, talking dollar so figures. Financial yes. support. Yeah. yeah, financial support. OK, so I think your, your answer is there is no well, medium. Well, no, the, the answer is we will certainly see if we can reduce a figure. OK, that's fine. I'll move on to uh, the next question then while you're thinking about that. Are you able to provide a breakdown of aftercare support expenses by type? For example, is there an aftercare allowance? Uh, are there one-off payments, yeah, there, uh, accommodation support, whatever there, that is? There are, and I can indi indicate, Mr Searle, I know that we can because I'm taking... I wanted to learn about aftercare. I've been reading about uh, the expenditure and the breakdown, and we, we certainly are able to do that if we can have some indication... Uh, as to what the breakdown is, we're happy to provide that. Yeah, well, I guess it, I mean, because this, this reveals my ignorance, I don't know yeah. what kind of aftercare supports there are. Um, I, mean, I am hand. very happy to undertake to provide to you yep. the, uh, the line items that I've seen in yep. the funding and that I've reviewed. Down by and dollar, my, by and my interest in it has been the correlation between the items and the case planning. OK. Um, just, just to add to the Secretary's comments, Mr Sill, we can definitely provide um, the type. There's a range of different categories. You actually mentioned some of them just now. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll give you that list and we can give you the expenditure against each of those categories. And I think we can give you the number of children against each category okay. as well. And if you could, like, I guess for financial year to date, like insofar as you have, and maybe for the previous financial year of course, too. We, so yeah, we can do that. What I, what I do know, and I haven't got the figures in front of me, but the expenditure in aftercare has been increasing year on year, but you'll see that when you get the figures come through. Okay. Next question is, how many young persons um, received no practical aftercare support after they turned 18? I mean, are, that, are there people who don't have aftercare support plan? Yeah. So, um, are you right for me yeah, to yeah. answer? <laughs> um, so, the policy is that every child that leaves care is to have a, first of all, a leaving care plan from the age of 15. So, that plan is from 15 to 18. Mm -hmm. Once that child or young person, when they turn 18, turns 18, um, it turns into an aftercare plan. So from a policy perspective, that number should be 100%. Mm -hmm. Again, like I said, the, um, the contents of each of those plans will vary depending on the circumstances of, of each individual young person. Mm -hmm. The compliance around the policy position does vary. And recently, the Office of the Children's Guardian conducted a review into leaving and aftercare and made a series of recommendations to improve our compliance, both to leaving care when kids are still in care, but aftercare. There's been a working group set up between the department, ACWA, the OCG, and a number of um, both DCJ and NGO representatives to actually work on the recommendations out of that report. We Is that do... report available? Sorry to, to Yeah, it's publicly available Good. on the Office of the Children's mm. Guardian's website. Yep. Um, and um, we do have the figure of uh, leaving care plans that's publicly reported. I'll just have to find that in my data unless Ms Campbell's got that. Well, just while Ms Campbell is flicking me, I just, I just want to understand your evidence was that every child over 18 or every person over 18 has an aftercare plan or should have an aftercare plan. They should. So that figure should be 100%. That, that's right. Can I, can I just ask you to just check that on notice and just come back to us in due course? I don't need to check it. It's okay. correct. Okay, that's that's great. Uh, Ms. Campbell. Yeah, I'm just trying to locate the data. Seventeen. 
doesn't it? Not been my quick read of this, so I'm happy to take that on notice okay. and come back to you. Um, has the department modelled extending care to 21, age 21? Um, the department has been looking at that, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I've got nothing really to report on at this stage, but we certainly have been looking at um, other jurisdictions who have a, a, a over 21 um, policy in terms of extending leaving care. But at this stage, we're still looking at that. OK. Um, can you tell uh, the committee, um, have you worked out if it was if care was to be extended to age 21, what the you know, average cost per person would be? For you? I don't have that with me today. I understand you may not have it with you, but can you, if the department has modelled that, I would ask that it be provided on notice. OK. Um, and also any modelling that the department may have done about uh, benefits as well as costs. You know, whatever work you've done, um, if you could provide that on notice to the committee, uh, if you can, that would be that'd be good. Um, apart from the issue of of cost, because obviously extending care to age twenty one would have a financial impact. Um, does the department have any concerns or any any views against ex that extension apart from the issue of cost? I, I mean, are there any policy downsides to extending care to twenty one from the department's perspective? I think one of the things is just to remember that we do have in place financial guidelines that um, go up to the age of um, 25 years of age, but mm -hmm. I don't know, Simone, or if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, I can. Um, it's a really good question, uh, Mr Searle. The extension of leaving care in other states, as I understand it, most benefits those children who are in stable foster or real kin placements. One of our concerns, and I understand Ms Campbell's error in the department is looking at this, as she mentioned, is if you were to extend the living care age for children that weren't in those arrangements, so particularly children who might have more complex needs or in, or in residential care, how does an extension of care program or policy impact or look like for, for those children and that's probably our biggest concern mm -hmm. as well as um, rather than a one-size-fits-all extension of care it's probably got to be um, well the consideration needs to be about how do you target support according to need um, it's as we mentioned earlier as much as um, I think Miss Campbell said she'd take it on on notice but we know many children actually remain <coughs> excuse me with their foster carers or relative kin carers. Now, it's not to say they don't need support in those arrangements post-18, but our view, and my view in particular, is that there's sufficient uh, legislation that enables us to do that now without extending the leaving care age. But it is something that we, we do need to consider and just work through some of those things that I just mentioned. OK. So, Ms Check, you said that uh, every post-18-year-old has an aftercare plan. No, I didn't say that. I said every um, one should have. One. Okay, should have. Okay, so can you tell? My next round of questions. I was going to say. <laughs> well, sorry about that. Um, so, do you have? Can you tell us how many do and how many don't? Yeah, we were just looking for that number. I do have it, so um, I might just see if I can find that. Uh, while you're finding it, um, does everyone who has a plan? have dollars attached to it? Like, is there a budget that goes with each plan or some sort of yeah, budget Yeah, so there's, for there's two components to a uh, leaving or aftercare plan. One will uh, outline as a descriptor what the activity might be um, or the need. And then attached to that will be a financial component. And that will then get bundled up as a total. And there's particular approval processes that need to be gone through um, to approve the totality of that plan for each individual child. OK. Um, all right, well, while we're waiting for you to find that other uh, information, I might move back to the issue of um, the insurance indemnity scheme. And I think the cap is $5 million. What happens if the claims exceed the liability cap? What happens to those those um, bodies that have that liability. Could you just, sorry, repeat that again? Deputy? What happens to the service providers if the claims made against them exceed the liability cap provided by the government indemnity? Um, I would encourage them to come back and talk to us if it was going to be a problem in terms of their viability. 
certainly we haven't had that to date. Um, and I think, uh, Mr Shoebridge, you asked me in an earlier session, so I did check around any provider that had contacted us in terms of being struggling with that area, particularly in terms of historical um, claims. And to date, no individual service has come. Obviously, at a, there's been a broad uh, communication in terms of concerns about that, but to date, no specific NGO has come to us or to me to raise concerns about that. But I would encourage them if they were finding themselves, um, you know, in a situation where their viability was at risk, um, to come and talk with us and we'd look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. OK, but there isn't a sort of a policy formulation in place yet systemically to deal with this problem? Um, that's right. So that's what we're working through, um, as I think the Minister said this morning, and looking at including the consideration around historical claims in that um, discussion occurring with states and territories. OK. So does the liability cap apply to um, service providers irrespective of... Uh, size, you know, whether they've got five kids or a hundred kids, is it the same cap? That's my understanding, five million. Yep. Okay, um, all right. And so it just applies through across the state, it's not by district or region, it's just no. for how many contracts they might have with you or for w what services? No, it'd be their total amount of funding, and there are 82 providers that fit into that cohort. Um, that, that which make up the sort of out of home care providers and the youth homelessness sector. OK. Um, can you tell the committee what is the largest, what is the uh, largest number of children being cared for by a single uh, out-of-home uh, provider? I probably need to take that on notice unless Ms. I, I don't have the actual figure, but I understand the biggest provider of statutory out-of-home care is actually the department. OK, um, but apart from the department... Sorry? Yeah, OK, well, that's, that would be good to know and, and the yeah, figures you can provide. We can provide the details. I, I understand the biggest non-government organisation is Life Without Barriers. OK. So if you could, and I'm happy for this to be on notice, if you could provide a list of the top, say, 10... Or could you provide a list of all the out-of-home yeah, care? Yeah, absolutely. I don't by, think there's any issue. By a number of children them. in their care? I mean, it may fluctuate, obviously, but... Yeah, uh, we can provide that at a point in time, I think, for you. OK. That, that would be good. Um... So in relation to the insurance, uh, you said there's a working party that's going to uh, report in, in December, is that right? Uh, by December. By December. By December we would have hoped to have had a decision, so um, we're estimating that working party should have certainly a position by middle of the year. Right. Um, and so what you hope by December to actually have a, a new solution in place, is Correct. that right? Okay. Um, but going back to the issue of the cap, you don't have any contingency plans already formulated to deal with uh, service providers that get into that sort of financial difficulty if they have to provide, if they have to cover more than the indemnity. We would obviously look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. OK. Um, how much is the current indemnity uh, uh, policy uh, going to cost, like, for this current financial year, for the previous, for each of the financial years it's been in place, how much is it costing? Yeah, it only started in December um, of last year, so mm -hmm. December 21. Okay. Um, I'd probably need to take that on notice because as yet no one's drawn down on that fund, okay. um, but happy to take that on notice. Okay, so no one's drawn down on it, but are you aware of liabilities accruing, like are service providers telling you they've got claims or they've settled claims or claims are ending up in court? Do you have um, any visibility of what... I can, level might be coming? I could have a look at that and, again, uh, respond on notice. OK, thank you. Um, all righty. Just turn, moving back to... Sorry, did you have something else to say? I was just going to say, you asked about the data in terms of what percentage of children and young people had a leaving care plan yes. earlier. It's 76.4% had a leaving care plan. OK, so, that, so about 24% don't. Um, can you inform us, like, why that would be the case? Why wouldn't someone have an out of uh, an aftercare plan? Um, I'm not. I mean, sure obviously, presumably, that there'd be some people who don't need it. They are perfectly self sufficient. No, um, everyone's. Everyone needs a plan. It's okay. as I mentioned earlier. It's an area of practice that needs significant improvement, which is why. Uh, the Guardian and the report that I mentioned uh, was commissioned by the Children's Guardian. Mm -hmm. And a working group between our sector colleagues has been set up to improve practice. We have increased um, 
which is scary um, given the number is so low, but we've got significant work uh, to get to that 100%. There are a very small number of children from time to time that won't engage in the case planning process, so they then won't have a plan, but that wouldn't be more than a couple percent of, of that number. So I certainly acknowledge that number's not OK and we need to work with our casework staff, both in DCJ and NGOs, to improve that significantly. OK, apart from the small number that don't engage in the process, what would be some of the reasons for the rest not having a plan? Uh, it, look, it'll be wide and varied. It comes down to caseworker capability, understanding of the need for a leaving and aftercare plan. Mm -hmm. And that's where our focus is, is building people's understanding about the importance of that and making sure that they have one. And then one of my jobs is to actually monitor the performance on this point and others um, to make sure that we're increasing uh, the number of children that do leave care with a plan. OK. Now, this reflects on my lack of technical knowledge. Is a leaving care plan the same as an aftercare plan or are they so different things? Leaving care is probably in layman's terms best described as a case plan that a child in statutory out of home care has between the ages of 15 and 17. Once they turn 18 that leaving care plan mm -hmm. becomes the aftercare plan and that aftercare plan is in place from 18 to 25. As I mentioned earlier, a young person um, between 18 and 25 can come back to the department or the NGO that was supervising them at any point in time to make a change to that plan or request any assistance that might be either contained in that plan or outside of that plan. Right, OK. OK, well, I might have to come back to that. Um, returning to alternative uh, care arrangements, um, on notice, uh, on the last occasion, we got uh, some figures about what happens to children who exit alternative care arrangements, and nearly 49% of them exited to a different arrangement, uh, including supported independent living, other funded placements, etc. So that's nearly half of all the kids leaving uh, alternative care arrangements. Do you have a breakdown as to where they actually go? We'd have to take that on notice. We do have a breakdown. Um, and invariably, um, you mentioned many of the categories. The other um, exit is sometimes a restoration back to mum or dad mm -hmm. or a placement with a family member aside from any foster care or residential care arrangements. Well, just again, the figures that were given was 18% went to foster care, 18% mm -hmm. to intensive therapeutic care, nearly 11% to relative or kinship, nearly 4% restored to parents, and then 49% were to different arrangements. You know, and there was a couple of examples given. Do you have a breakdown of that 49%? Yeah, that's a lot, yeah, that's a yeah, big... Yeah, sorry, I, I misunderstood the question, Mr. So Yes, we do. Um, I don't have it with me, but we can certainly provide it on notice. It, it invariably includes children um, in arrangements that we call special care arrangements, where children have quite significant disabilities, and it's an arrangement that... Uh, we consult with the Office of the Children's Guardian, the Children's Guardian on in order for me to take their advice about whether that's suitable for the child and I'm the delegated officer to approve that placement. There's also a, a range of other placements that we call individual placement arrangements and they are with our funded providers but they're quite bespoke models to meet particular needs of children. One really simple example is we from time to time have some quite large sibling groups and we do everything in our power to keep those sibling groups together. And we might work with one of our funded NGOs to actually um, have a bespoke arrangement around the care of those children. So that's, that's where some of those children will go, but more than happy to provide a further breakdown for the committee in response to that question. OK. Are you suggesting that half of the people in alternative care arrangements have significant disabilities? Is that what you are touching uh, the, on? The number is um, currently. Mm -hmm. uh, so of the 70 children at the 31st of December, 28 have a disability that would mean that they're eligible for an NDIS package. OK. Do they, in fact, have an NDIS they package? Do. OK. That's fine. And I, I'm not sure if you were in the room earlier, Mr Sell, but I, I answered a question um, around um, 
children in out-of-home care and what sort of support we give them in respect of their disability. We have a small team that, that brokers those NDIS plans, um, both where they, they're not in place when children come into care, but also where we think plans might be inadequate um, and children are entitled to more support. And we've had quite a bit of success uplifting those plans in terms of a financial dollar amount. Who identifies whether those plans are inadequate? And uh, usually casework staff um, will identify whether they're inadequate or not. We also, as part of the monitoring process for alternate care arrangements, I think I've mentioned this at previous committees, but each week I go through, every Tuesday morning, go through every one of the children in an alternate care arrangement and I often pick up if there's any inadequacies in any of the planning, but particularly disability, and make sure that a referral goes off to our uh, family engagement team to initiate the process of a review for those children. OK, I think it's Mr Shoebridge's turn. I believe it is. Um, in terms of the leaving care plans, uh, I know your position is, and I endorse it, that one in four kids not having a leaving home care plan is... A failing, a very substantial failing. Do you have an explanation for it, though? What's the primary explanation? Is it resourcing? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's a, an easy explanation, Mr Shoebridge. I, I do think it's about skilling up caseworkers to understand the need for that leaving care plan. There is a small element of how those plans get recorded so some in our system. So sometimes they can get recorded as a general case plan as opposed to labelled as a case as a leaving care plan. But it is really increasing caseworker capability and manager capability to lift those numbers to 100%. You see, I have trouble understanding that answer, Ms Chick. I, like, I don't do this full time. This oh, is course. a thing that I slip in between other work yeah. and I fully understand that every kid leaving care needs a living care plan, living care plan, yet full-time caseworkers don't. That I can't comprehend it. I, it's certainly difficult to understand, but it, like I said, it is about building caseworkers' knowledge and capability. So they might have a case plan, they just haven't addressed the leaving care components, and that's the work that we're focusing on at the moment with the sector. But why isn't there some kind of system in place? that as a child's ageing out of care, about to leave care, that a whole series of warning lights go off, that this can't happen until a leaving care plan is in place. I say again, I know it has to be done, yet there are full-time paid caseworkers who don't. And what? surely so, if you're having that, the system needs to respond. So within, within DCJ, we certainly have a performance monitoring framework where leaving care planning is one of the elements. And we work with individual districts to improve the practice and actually lift those numbers. And over the last few years, we have had significant increases in the percentage of completion, acknowledging it's nowhere near it where it needs to be. Um, in respect of NGOs, they are responsible as the designated agency for monitoring the completion of those plans. We do have our contract managers that are following up with individual NGOs because it is a requirement in the contract that children have case plans in particular. And finally, the Office of the Children's Guardian is overseeing um, the completion of those plans right. as an additional so, safeguard. Um, for children that are in the care of the department, um, the responsibility lies with departmental case managers to do the leaving care plans. That's right. For children that have been, whose out of home care has been oversighted by NGOs, the responsibility lies with the NGOs, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Well, do you have any data, NGO by NGO, in terms of their completion rates? I would have to take that on notice and provide that to the committee. And are, are there contractual penalties for the NGOs for failing to, failing to um, um, ensure that children have leaving care plans? I might get Ms Campbell to answer this, but I understand certainly um, case planning is a component within the contract, but I might just, in terms of penalties, I might just... Leaving, home, leaving care plans is a, a, a discrete subset of case planning, so I'm asking I, about leaving I, care I plans. I will need to double-check. I think it's it's case plan in the contract, but um, Ms Campbell may know the actual wording of it. I probably don't know the exact wording, <laughs> but it's pretty close to that, and there are... 
um, processes we have in place if the performance is low. So within the contractual arrangements there are things like um, quality improvement plans if we identify an issue. If there are significant issues we'd obviously work with that provider. But if at the end of the day there were serious performance issues, we would obviously need to look at other arrangements. Um, the other bit that we've been doing, particularly since the OCG has reviewed um, th this particular area, is we've been um, doing a learning hub with the providers to really improve a focus on leaving care plans. Um, we agree that every young person's Every young person is extremely important who's in care. Do we agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So, so how many young people can be failed by an agency before it becomes sufficiently important that the contract or the department um, gets triggered and they're held to account? Do we say that it's OK to have five kids age out of care without a leaving home, um, leaving care plan? Is it 10 kids? What's the... <coughs> What's the pain threshold for the department? How many kids can leave care without a leaving care plan before it becomes sufficiently important to do something about it? I think we would be doing something pretty immediately if children and young people didn't have a, a leaving care plan. I just don't have with me today the data in terms of the breakdown between the department and, and NGOs, but certainly we would be having discussions immediately with those providers well, if the data for that particular NGO showed that there wasn't a leaving <coughs> care plan in place for a child. Well, sorry, but 20, a quarter of kids are leaving care without a leaving care plan. Um, what you're telling me, Ms Campbell, does not square with the data. Uh, it just does not scare, square with the data. Ms, Ms. Sheck, is, this, is what Ms Campbell says right? That every time a child leaves care, um, um, who was in the care of a... Uh, who has been oversighted by an NGO and there's no leaving care plan, every time that triggers uh, uh, a response from the department to speak to the NGO and say, why didn't this happen? is what Ms Campbell says, what actually happens on the ground. Yeah, if I could just add some further detail to that. So we have in each district contract managers that look after individual NGO contracts. One of their responsibilities is to make sure that NGOs are adhering to their actual contract. And, and in this case, we're talking about the permanency support provider contract. They invariably meet with providers on a monthly basis at a minimum, sometimes more frequently if there's some concerns to raise. Through those meetings, they'll raise concerns. Typically, what will happen is they'll um, highlight a concern, obviously allow the agency to provide a response to that concern. If there is sufficient concern um, that hasn't been addressed through the response of the provider, we typically, the next step is a service improvement plan. We also notify the guardian if we're particularly concerned about a um, provider, and then we go through that process. Um, usually people turn things around, but you can, you know, dem it's demonstrated through the figures in leaving care. There's still significant concerns. Well, like you say, there's a quarter of children that leave care without a plan currently. Well, see, Ms Chick, what I was trying to understand from Ms mm. Campbell is what... At what level of non-compliance, how many kids are allowed to age out of care without a leaving care plan before it becomes a matter of concern and is raised in those meetings and there's some compliance put in place? Is it five? Is it 10? Is it 100? Uh, not, yeah, look, I'm not aware of a trigger point in terms of a number of children. I would suggest that um, one would be your trigger point if they don't have a, oh, a You and I, plan. in this meeting, are on a unity ticket on that. We are. But I'm quite certain that's not how it works in practice. If, if one in four kids leave care without a leaving care plan, if you've got a zero tolerance ap approach to it, well, I, I, you cannot have a zero tolerance approach to it if one in four kids are leaving without it. No, that cannot look, be the case. I, I absolutely agree. And, and it, it is um, absolutely a practice and a, and a monitoring issue that we, both as a department and the NGO sector, need to significantly improve on, which is in part, like both Ms Campbell and I have spoken to, spoken about, why we've set up that working group to improve practice. Mr Tibble, what, what, what this strikes me as, and these data, this has been persistent failure to hit, hit the legislative requirement now for years, is that there's a kind of resigned, complacent acceptance in the department 
that around one in four kids will leave without a living care plan and it's bad and it's terrible, but what can you do? That, that, that is very much the flavour that I get from the evidence we've had today and from the persistent evidence in this regard for the last three years. Um, um, it, could, could I ask you to direct attention to this and, and to see what can be done to shift the figures to 100% compliance? Yes, Mr Shoebridge. Um, I've heard the evidence, I've absorbed it, um, and I'm very happy to take... I'm not happy. Um, I will take the issue away and work with the team to um, seek to address it um, in the most practical way as soon as possible so those figures move. Yeah, because at the end of the day, we talk about 24% or 76%. We're talking about 200 of the most vulnerable young adults turning 18, being spat out into the big bad world with no plan on how to keep them safe, give them a home, get them into <coughs> TAFE. No plan at all. 200 kids a year, some of the most vulnerable. And, and I think we could all agree that that is just woefully yeah, inadequate. I hear you and I understand. Um... What proportion, it may be to you, Ms. Jack, it might be to you, Mr. Thomas, I'm not sure. What proportion of um, um, First Nations kids in care, are, um, in out-of-home care, are having their out-of-home care oversighted by an Aboriginal-controlled organisation? It's just over 20%. And what was the target for the end of 20... What is the target for the end of this calendar year? I'd have to come back to you with the actual figures unless Ms Campbell's got them. But back in 2012, the government committed to the transition of 100% of Aboriginal children and young people across to the Aboriginal NGO sector within 10 years. So that's this year. Correct. Um, yeah, now... I'm sorry. I should have just said plainly, you had a target to get to 100%. Yeah. It's at 20%. What the <laughs> Sorry, hell's gone wrong? I, so we should cut all of that. Yeah, yeah. The so target was 100%. It's at 20%. What's gone wrong? Can I, can I just add, um, Mr Shoebridge, the target was based on 2010 figures, and I don't have those in front of me. So given that the number of Aboriginal children has grown, um, it, it it's a bit... It's probably grown. not important, it's grown. It's but it's, it's a different grown, number to the number of kids that are in care now. Sorry, got went off on a tangent. So I was going to say, 20% are with, just over 20% are with Aboriginal community controlled organisations. About 24% <clears throat> are with non Aboriginal NGOs, which leaves 55%, I think it's 55%, are case managed by the department. Um, I've been meeting with ABSEC and ACWA about how we can fast track that transition. There's a, there's a number of things to manage in that transition. Um, a number of those children in non-Aboriginal NGOs, for instance, are in stable good placements and we don't want to transition and break that stability. There's also uh, a financial investment question. So the capacity of the current ACO sector isn't big enough to take the transition of children across. And if we, if we progress that in a way that's kind of a drip feed child by child kind of way, it doesn't give the ACO sector the ability to prepare for that transition and grow. And so we need to manage that transition in a way that one, maintains the stability of good placements and doesn't break that. But secondly, transitions the resources with the children in a way that allows ACOs to grow and be properly prepared for that. Uh, so the discussions have, I've only recently just commenced with ACWA and ABSEC is about how we plan that and so that we can start to do that properly this year. We won't meet that target this year clearly, but we can set together a clear target and a clear plan to meet that target in the future. I can't tell you what that time frame will be, but we will work that out in the next couple of months. And um, is it the intention to, 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 to actually publish and publicly hold yourself to hold the department to account for those fresh targets? We'll talk to the minister about that once we do set the fresh targets. But you see, Everything you've said today, Mr Thomas, could have been said 10 years ago to explain why such a small proportion of Aboriginal kid, kids in out-of-home care were under the care of Aboriginal-controlled organisations 10 years ago. This exact same conversation could have happened when that initial target was set. Do you agree with that? Uh, I do agree with that. 
So, does can anybody explain the lost decade? I, I can't explain it, but I can give you um, the commitment that we are committed to having a very clear plan this year and to work to that transition this year. Mr Shubers, I, I wasn't directly involved um, for the majority of the 10-year program, but I understand there were targets set for each year of the 10-year period, but as Mr Thomas described, the challenge has been the capacity, I suppose is the best way to describe it, of the ACO um, sector to take on those kids. Um, and and that has, that's been challenging to move those kids across. It's not an excuse, but it, it's just been a, a challenging situation um, in the last few years in particular. But like I said, I, I haven't been involved the entire time. Let's be clear. The resources for the Aboriginal controlled sector are going to, in this space, come from the department and it's the department's obligation to free up those resources to create the space, and that's been the missing link. Do you agree with that, Ms Chip? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I do think it has been more about the capacity of the Aboriginal sector to take those children on. Um, as an example, at one stage, a number of the Aboriginal um, NGOs had some challenges around meeting um, standards as set by the Office of the Children's Guardian. So we were actually unable to transfer children across to a number of agencies at the time. Um, is, um, in terms of accreditation from the Children's Guardian for out-of-home care, um, how many different um, regional parts of the department get accredited? It's a really good question, Mr Shoebridge. So um, we have a number of entities within the department that um, are required to be accredited by the Office of the Children's Guardian. So um, what that consists of is each of our individual districts being accredited. Um, so they're all accredited as, accredited as separate designated agencies. We then also have the Sherwood Program, which is a secure residential facility out in southwestern Sydney that has separate accreditation. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I've got, I've got them all. Um, oh, and the other one, sorry, is we have a team, which is our Metro Intensive Support Services team, uh, that looks after quite complex young people, typically older teenagers, and they also have their own separate accreditation. So how many regions are there? 16. There's 16 regions. There's Sherwood House. District, si sorry. 16. Um, districts. Um, there's Sherwood House, did you say? That's right, yeah. And then there's the Metro Intensive Support Unit. Correct. Um, are they, do any of them have provisional accreditation? No. Um, when was the last time a part of the department had provisional accreditation? Oh, I'd have to get the actual date for you, but it, it was more than five years ago now. Um, do any of the NGOs that currently provide out-of-home care have a provisional accreditation? Uh, again, I'd have to take that on notice. I, I do know all of the um, accreditation status of any designated agency is listed on the Office of the Children's Guardian website, um, but we can easily get that for the committee. Um, all right. Um, in terms of children in alternative care, do you track the educational... I do. Engagement. I do. Um, so, for example, that young young woman, the 17-year-old yep. woman, um, who's been 300 days in alternative care, has that also been hundreds of days out of school? No, she is um, uh, in school full-time and she also um, holds down a part-time job, I think, at McDonald's from memory. What about the of that cohort of children in alternative care. Do you have data on how often they are or are not at school? I do. Um, just bear with me for a second. I've only got it for the current um, cohort up to the end of um, December. Um, and there's a couple of different categories, so if I could just indulge in those categories, they'll make sense when I, when I, go, when I go through them. So the percentage of children 
and young people who are attending school full time in these arrangements is 70% of children. The percentage of children and young people who are attending school part time is 16%. So in total, 86% are attending school at least part of the time. A further 3% of children are completing distance education. And 11% of children in ACAs are disconnected from school and not attending. There's a couple categories within that last one. Um, one is school refusal, typically older children that just point blank are refusing to go to school or looking for employment opportunities. And there's a small category within that 11% where children have been expelled or suspended from school. All right. Do you have any suspension data for, and, and or attendance data for the, for the broader cohort of kids in out-of-home care? Um, I'm, I don't have that with me today, but we can certainly provide that um, to the committee on notice. All right. That will be appreciated. Um, I think at that point I'll hand back to the opposition. Okay. Thank you. Um, just um, returning to the answers that were given on notice uh, at page 13, um, the department said that nearly 20% of children um, in alternative care arrangements are then placed or subsequently placed into intensive therapeutic care. What is intensive therapeutic care? The intensive therapeutic care is a service model typically for children aged 12 to 17 who have incredibly high and complex support needs. They are children that typically are unable to live in a family type arrangement. They um, are children, unfortunately, who have experienced quite significant trauma and abuse in their <coughs> short lives um, and need quite a deal of therapeutic intervention to support their wellbeing and help them recover from the trauma that they've experienced. So you said they can't live in family type arrangements. So what are their living arrangements? What do they look like? Uh, typically they're four bed um, houses. So they're co-located with uh, up to three other young people mm. and there's a matching exercise or assessment that NGOs and the department undertake on a collaborative basis. Because what we want to do is make sure that there's, I suppose, like children in those arrangements. So, for example, uh, similar ages or similar needs. Um, sometimes location is a factor. We don't want to be moving children, particularly Aboriginal children, off country where we can avoid it. So there's a, there is an assessment process that is undertaken, but they are up to four um, children models and they have 24-7 rostered staff or a care team, as well as a therapeutic team that provides the therapeutic response. Okay, so they're not necessarily living with other children with the same care needs. There are other factors that might determine yeah, there, with whom they're co-located. Okay. Um, the figures you provided on notice after the last estimates was 18.3% went from ACA to intensive therapeutic care. Are those roughly the same figures today? Because that was um, up until yeah, 30 June, I, I think. Look, I haven't got those in front of me. And again, we can provide them to the committee. If you could provide them on um, notice. I understand within the current cohort of children... Um, so of the 70, 36 have high needs and would be eligible for ITC. I think my colleague earlier this morning talked about some of the challenges the sector is experiencing at the moment as a result of COVID and just the workforce uh, challenges that I know they've experienced. So moving some of those children from ACAs that meet that criteria is taking a little longer than we would ordinarily um, like to happen, um, but we're working quite closely with those providers to help them with that issue. Okay, so of those children who go uh, into intensive therapeutic care, how long on average were they in uh, alternative care arrangements before they were transferred? Uh, I, haven't, I haven't got that information with me. I, we it can provide it, yep. um, and we will. Um, it'll vary depending on the needs of sure. children and where placements are available. Okay, and could you also provide the median figure? Of course. Yeah. And how long, on average, do they stay in intensive therapeutic care? Is it kind of open-ended based on progress and need, or are there benchmarks? Yeah, look, we, um, 
We don't like children to stay there indefinitely, but the reality is for some children that is the safest and most appropriate placement for them because of their needs. We do um, like to see the therapeutic response result in a lesser level of need of children where you might then be able to consider either a professional carer model, so a professional carer model or general foster care. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, um, and, you know, just being really frank, it's difficult to find foster carers who might like to care for children that are older and have some more complex needs. It's not that we don't try, but it is it is challenging for both uh, the sector who predominantly recruits foster carers and the small amount of recruitment that DCJ does. OK, what's the... I mean... Given all the caveats you've, you've outlined, what is the sort of uh, longest period of time a young person stays in intensive therapeutic care, or is it really just based on...? It's based you know, on individual need. Um, some children will stay through to their 18th birthday. There are a number of children, as I highlighted, that do have disabilities, and one of the things we endeavour to do and have, have had quite a bit of success is... Um, NDIS providing the accommodation once those children turn 18 and rather than the young person move, they stay in situ mm -hmm. and NDIS takes over um, well, the funding of the accommodation arrangement and it prevents the child from moving. OK. Over the last 12 months, what's the longest period of time a young person stayed in alternative care arrangements before being transferred into intensive therapeutic care? I'd have to take that on notice, Mr Sewell. OK. That is fine. Um, now, I think according to um, according to the answers given uh, to estimates last time, um, alternative care arrangements are paid by invoices in arrears. Can you tell us what has been the total cost of alternative care arrangements for each of the 16 districts in New South Wales over the last 12 months? We'd have to take that on notice. OK. Um, how many individual nights of alternative care arrangements were charged to each district over that same period? I'd also need to take that on notice. That's OK. How many unique children were in alternative care arrangements for each district over the last 12 months? I knew you were going to ask me that, you know, and I, I've got the Seems individual obvious, numbers. Doesn't it? If I can just whip out my calculator and add it up. Really? <laughs> um, which I will do because I have it in front of me, but I wasn't flush at maths at school, albeit that was a long time ago now. Um, but just give me 30 seconds. That's okay. That's okay. 457. Okay. That's... So that, sorry, that's the 12 months to December, 31st of December 21. Okay, that's that's good, and that's the most recent information you've got. That's right. Uh, if you, on reflection, f find you've got anything more recent than that, that would be useful as well. Um, and how many? And that's the number of unique children in alternative care arrangements overall. As yeah, for that twelve-month period. That's do right. Do you have that same information by district? I don't have it with me, but no, we no, can no, certainly provide notice. it. Okay. Now, in terms of the staff who supervise young people in alternative care arrangements, uh, how many are departmental staff and how many are employed by NGOs, uh, by the, number or by percentage? Yeah, the bulk, and again, I'd have to provide the exact numbers on notice, the bulk of the staff are NGO staff that deliver the direct care to children. It, on the very rare occasion, we do need to use um, DCJ caseworkers to look after those kids. It's invariably for a night or two while we organise... Um, an NGO to deliver that service. Um, and like I said, it, it's rare, but again, we can provide the information on notice. Could I just quickly interrupt to say um, I'd like to note my appreciation for the, um, the assistance from all the officials today. I think it's been a genuine attempt to assist the committee. And I'm about to go to another estimates where I, I wouldn't make the same acknowledgement. Um, but I, um, I just do want to indicate my gratitude before I leave. Thank you. Mr Shoebridge. Thank you. Um, in relation to the costs of alternative care arrangements, um, again, going back to the answers that were given on notice, um, I had an exchange with the Minister, I think it was page 23 of the transcript, uh, and we asked what was the overall cost, and the answer was, and I'm quoting here from the answer provided, 
alternative care arrangements are arranged on an emergency basis and paid on an invoice in arrears. DCJ systems do not allow for accurately relating placement length and payments made to calculate an average cost per night of an ACA. So that was what the uh, answer was, but you must have a, a total cost over the last year or since 30 June and the number of nights that that cost has covered to date. So can you provide those? The, the number, of, sorry, the cost of ACAs varies significantly from one child to the next. So there's no, there's no set cost. And, and that's about um, sometimes children, depending on their need, will need a, a greater number of care staff looking after them. So where you have more care staff, that's obviously going to cost more because you've got to pay for those, those salaries. Okay, okay. well, maybe um, we can just break this down. And I'm, what I'd like to know is... Um, since 30 June last year, what has been the total amount you've spent on ACA? How many children have benefited? And how many nights has that purchased, if I can use that terminology? Yeah, I'd like to take that on notice if I no, could no, of and course, provide that is, to the committee. No, no, I'm happy for to take all of this on notice. Um, and if you could provide that same information for the previous financial year as well, that would be yep, very good. Yeah, we'll take that on notice. Now, again, bearing in mind uh, your earlier evidence about the costs varying, um, could you give us, uh, if you like, the, the highest cost per, you know, for a child and then the lowest cost, just so we can sort of see what the spread is? Yeah, we'll certainly take that on notice. OK, that's, that's fine. And obviously, um, any information you've got uh, about you know, what drives those cost differentials? As, as you said, it's the number of care workers, presumably it's the number of uh, other supports they might need. Yeah, if I, if I could just add, because I think that's an important point, Mr Searle, the, um, the, the majority of the costs are staff costs, but the other thing we are very focused on is therapeutic costs. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, <coughs> depending on each individual's child, individual child's needs, there will be a therapeutic plan wrapped around that child and we will pay for that. Um, so that's an incredibly important component and can drive some of the costs up quite significantly um, to make sure that children are in receipt of that therapeutic support. OK, thank you. Um, again, uh, last uh, estimates round with the previous minister, um, we were asked for a breakdown of median length of stay and I think uh, the information given by the department was... As at 30 June 2020, the median length of stay was 84.5 days and the longest was 833. And as at 30 June 21, the median length of stay was 55 days and the longest stay was 303. Now, I know we're not quite at the end of the, of the year, but insofar as you have information for the year to date, can you provide those figures? That is the median length of stay and the longest stay I since can. 30 June 2021? Um, so, I think I might have given this in evidence this morning, but I, I'll just repeat In which repeat case, it. I apologise. No, that's OK. I'll, I'll, it's, it's quick. Um, so, there has been a decrease in the median length of stay between uh, end of September 21 and 31st of December 21, and that has gone down from a medium of 42 days to 32 days. Mm -hmm. uh, then um, the other breakdown we have is... 75.9 children stay less than three months, 15.5% of children stay three to six, 8.3% stay six to 12, and 0.2% stay more than 12 months. In response to your question about longest stay, um, that's the young lass we were referring to earlier. She's been in a placement, um, sorry, in an alternate care arrangement for 307 days. Is she still in? Care yeah, she, she was the young lady we were talking about earlier. Um, yeah, and that is at 30 December, was it? Uh, oh, sorry, that's that's a now, um, that's an up-to-date figure for her. Um, so it would have been less back on 31st of December. So let me take that on notice and I'll make sure um, it wasn't a different child um, being the longest stay on that day. Yeah, of course. I'm happy for you to take that uh, on notice. Um, in relation to risks of significant harm, mm -hmm. I think we uh, we were dealing with the 90,000 
that weren't seen by the department. Yeah. Um, and I drew your attention to the fact that the minister at the time said that they were seen by somebody. Um, but again, when I was asking the minister earlier today, uh, no one seemed to know how many of those 90,000 were actually seen, whether it was by a public or, pr pu public or private service provider. Um, when the department can't deal with a case, and is there some process when they refer it to an NGO that it gets sort of tagged so the department can sort of see where it's gone? Yeah, um, Mr Searle, can I, can I just backtrack a little bit to sure. the question this morning because I think um, I did the committee a, a disservice in terms of the response I provided, so I <coughs> apologise for that. Um, so we can't currently capture um, in our systems, and I'll explain why, um, the other services outside of the funded services that are provided uh, through services like multi-systemic therapy, functioning family mm. therapy, there's a brighter futures, there's a range of other services. But what does happen is when someone reports concerns to the Child Protection Helpline, we screen those concerns and one of the questions we ask is who's involved? And that'll be who's involved from the family, who's in involved from the service system, and that could be education, health, it might be the local family support service. That information is captured in the record, but it's in, it's recorded in a, in a free text part of the system, which means we're unable to easily extract that information in order to run a report. There is a further triaging process that happens once that report, assuming it meets the threshold of risk of significant harm, it gets transferred out to the local office, wherever that might be, so the community services centre. There's a further triaging process that happens at that point where they may collect further information about services and, again, they record it in the same manner. So we need to prioritise all of the work that's coming in because demand um, outstrips supply. So our caseworkers can do a certain amount and we're working really hard, like I mentioned this morning, to free up uh, caseworker time so that they can get to more children and in fact year on year for the last five or six years each year they have seen a record number of children last year an increase again of 3.2 percent up to 36 and a half thousand children seen at risk of significant harm but I note the concerns about those children that are not seen. We are currently building into our child story system a new referral function that work is underway and that goes to your question, Mr Searle, about how can we capture accurately mm -hmm. where children go. That work will be completed, um, well, the first stage of that work will be completed later this year, and that will capture internal referrals. The second phase of that work will capture all other referrals. Now, the nature of our child story system is um, there is quite a list of things to... Um, work through as far as enhancements goes. This is one of our priorities, but it does take some time to make some adjustments to that system. Mm -hmm. But we are absolutely committed to that, and I hope early next year. We've got the second phase completed, which is being able to capture referrals to other agencies and, and like I said, extract that data that we've got um, in the free text field that we can't currently extract from the system. But like I said, our caseworkers and managers go through a process of prioritisation based on the information that um, they have available. And finally, and I know I'm talking a lot, but um, there are 17,000 children that we can capture currently that are serviced by the NGO sector, and that's through our family preservation services that we fund. Sorry, you, you can track them? We can track those ones, yes. OK, so of the roughly 90,000 that we were talking about before, you can track about 17,000? Yeah, that's correct. OK. And... Uh, so of those that were referred to an NGO, will the NGO report back to you about how many they've actually then seen or dealt with? Yeah, if it's one of our funded programs, there's um, a range of service levels they've got to reach. Um, and um, we make sure inside the department we're sending the referrals over, over um, to make sure that they reach that capacity. And I think and um, Miss Campbell might be able to respond to this as well. The majority, if not all of them, reach their service level uh, agreements. I yeah. think that's correct. If not, they're probably over. Feeding it, yeah. Feeding, yeah. So I was, going to, I was going to ask, how do you quantify the cost of referring 
risk of serious harm reports to NGOs for follow-up? Is it part of their existing contracts with you? That is, you know, they have a contract with the department and so they're obligated to take, you know, a certain number of referrals from you or is, a, is it like billed as a sort of an extra case? Um, how, how so, a couple things. Um, first Always of all, it's risk of significant harm, not serious harm. I've right. noticed a few times today. It gets, so, it, it is important because it's a threshold um, point. Yeah, we're, yeah the uh, Rosh we, Rosh. we have within our family preservation program, as I mentioned, a range of services that are all evidence based and um, at varying level, uh, varying stages of implementation. Some are much newer than others. We then have uh, contracts and service level agreements with each of those providers that stipulates who they're going to take, what types of cases and um, what service they're providing. Now, they all vary in length in terms of the intervention, but there is a requirement for them to report back to the department on um, who they're taking, the numbers... And, and you might like to add any further information on other items that they report back on. I don't think I can add anything material to what you've said, um, Mr Chick. I mean, the other program that I think is important, it used to be called the Family Referral Services. It's now called the Family Connect and Support Service, which really um, came about many years ago to try and prevent escalation of children at risk of significant harm who'd been reported to the department. Typically, um, it, it's set up within... Um, there's also child wellbeing units within the various government agencies to try and ensure that there is a response where a response can't be made by the department. All right. Well, that's technically brought us back to crossbench time, but there doesn't seem to be any crossbenchers. Um, Ms Moriarty, did you have some further issues you wanted to raise? All right. Well, I will... I think I've got a couple to ask about the Office of the Children's Guardian. I know it might be unusual in budget estimates to actually resort to a budget paper, <laughs> but, you know, there has to be... There has to be one... <laughs> so I'll just look at budget paper number four, page 7-41, and... If you look at the the expenditure for the Office of the Children's Guardian, the amount that was budgeted for 2021 was about 56 million, but only 50 million was actually spent, and that's largely a decrease in what were called other operating expenses. That's nearly a five million decline. Do you know what those expenses in decline were? No, we don't know what those things are. No, no, I'm, I have no I, idea. I don't know Mr. Either. Bill, I know you're sort of relatively new. Well, can you yep. tell us what that is at some point? Yep. On notice? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Sill. Okay, that would be good because just the other operating, operating expenses, they were meant to be nearly 24 million. They went and they were actually only about 19 million, so that, that's, that's a big gap. But they're projected to be over 23 million again right. this year, so it would be interesting to know what they are. Also, when you look at the employee-related expenses, they're meant to jump from nearly 27 million to nearly 30 million. Now, given the wage cap, I'm assuming that means you're going to the, the children's guardian is actually going to employ more people. Is that a correct assumption by me, or is there some other driver of those employee-related expenses? I have to take it on notice. Yeah. We, we no, no, no that's okay. These are, these are not trick questions. I'm just trying to understand because we've had reports from. <laughs> the Office of the Children's Guardian, and when there were some legislative changes in sort of in 2019, mm. uh, resulted in, apart from working with children's checks and risk assessments, uh, the Office of the Children's Guardian had an, a range of additional functions conferred on them, but report from the coalface, as it were, was that there weren't additional resources in terms of people to do that work, and that has led to, you know, underfunding of those functions and and sort of work intensification and stress on those others who were there. So I was just wanting to understand whether this was... Uh, that, that increase in employee-related expenses was, um, uh, was uh, a, an increase in resources for those functions or what the explanation uh, may be. Um, OK, if you could take that on us, that would be very good. Um, and I think this is probably going to be my penultimate question. Uh, it's to you, Mr Thomas. 
Uh, you'd be well aware of Professor Megan Davis's family as culture recommendations. You'd be only too aware of that. Very well aware of them, yes. And in fact, I saw you sitting uh, avidly in the chamber while we were debating Mr Shoebridge's private member's bill. Uh, one of those recommendations is for the children's court to presume that removing a child from their parents generally causes harm, and that presumption would not override any safety concerns in terms of keeping children with their parents, would it, in your view? The, the recommendation, as it's stated, um, recommends that uh, the legislation be amended to ask courts to consider the harm done to a child. Um, the, the minister earlier rec uh, spoke about consulting on those 25 legislative recommendations from the FIP report. That is one of those. And certainly, um, I don't believe the intention of the FIC report would be that that um, understanding of long-term harm would override a decision about the immediate safety of the child. The recommendation in the report, however, doesn't specifically say that, but I don't believe the intent of the recommendation would be to do that. And part of the consultation we will do um, on those recommendations will be to elicit that. OK. Is the advice of the department that such a presumption would result in any children being kept in a situation where they were facing physical or sexual abuse? The, the department's position on those legislative recommendations was to hold them over until this 2024 bigger legislative review. The work that we're doing now is to bring that forward so that we can properly um, understand the impacts of these recommendations and if they do proceed to any kind of legislative proposal, how that legislative proposal will be crafted. And I'd suggest that one of the key factors that we would be looking at in providing advice to the Minister would be how that doesn't put anybody in a less safe position than they otherwise would be. Right. So, but you're not, you haven't reached any presumptions that that would necessarily be the case? Not yet. And you haven't provided the Minister with any such advice? We haven't, no. OK. Um, all right. Um, I guess some of that sort of legislative reform possibility has been brought forward by the Legislative Council. Um, uh, what advice are you preparing in relation to those legislative changes? Um, my understanding is the advice that was provided um, to the Minister is Cabinet in confidence. It was a yep. Cabinet decision around that. Um, but the Minister is consulting on all of those 25 legislative recommendations in the FIC review, which do cover off on um, all of and then some other issues beyond what are currently in the bill before Parliament. OK. All righty. I'm just checking to see if I've got any last questions. Well, I think those are my questions. Ms Morati, you don't have any further questions? I'm good. Well, belatedly, it's over to the government. You've got your 15 minutes if you want it. I don't think we'll be using our 15 minutes. After you don't think you'll be using it? It's all been amply covered. Well, in that case... That's all she wrote. All righty. Well, um, I would like to thank the Secretary and all of the departmental officials for um, coming here today and obviously sharing your insights. You've taken a lot of questions on notice and we will look forward to those responses um, and, uh, and no doubt we'll follow them up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.